Are we ready to go? I believe I'm ready if you guys are. Okay. Let's, it's uh, five o'clock. Let's can call to order our meeting for Monday, February 22nd, 2021. Um, can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Silverstein? Here. Councilmember Yuri? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Here. Mayor Pearson? Here. You have a quorum. Okay. Do we have public comment on the closed session item? You do have two speakers. They're okay. Pamela Van Ireland and Howard Rudsky. I don't see Pamela in the meeting quite yet, so we'll start with Howard. Okay. Are you there, Howard? Can you hear me now? I can hear you, Howard. All right, sorry, I think I was muted. Um, good evening. I wanted to set the record straight. The MRCA put an op-ed or editorial into the Malibu Times last week stating that the Sycamore Park neighbors we're looking for a defense fund from the city of Malibu to bail them out. This is the exact reason we need for you guys to put this on the agenda to talk about it. Because all they do is misinform. That's totally incorrect. What we and people from Western Malibu to Eastern Malibu are asking for is a watchdog agency or a watchdog person or however we're going to call it that make sure that all government agencies as well as the citizens are following the rules and we as citizens can't keep up with a paid institution like MRCA with unlimited budgets to keep doing this stuff so we need your help and this is the exact reason they also did this in the February coastal meeting, they presented the gate argument in public comments and they had the facts wrong. So, you know, we, we please need your help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. I don't see Pamela Van Ireland in the meeting. So that concludes public comment on this item. And uh, let's recess to uh, the closed session now. And we'll be back in a while. Back at 
Okay, we are back. Is are we ready to go, Alex? Yes, I'm ready. If you guys are. Okay, I would like to call to order the Malibu City regular okay. meeting, which was supposed to be February 22nd, but was pushed to February 24th tonight due to technical difficulties. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations, and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At the screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or sign up to speak on particular items. You'll only be able to speak during the meeting if you follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Once the item is called, no further speak ups, uh, speaker signups will be allowed, so please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom app if necessary. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during this meeting, please raise your hand. I'll call on you in turn so we can try and make our discussion clear for the record and for the public. Can I have roll call, please? Council member Fair? Here. Council member Silverstein? Here. Council member Uring? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Here. Mayor Pearson? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Um, I'll now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Cotty, can we have a uh, closed session report, please? Mayor Pearson, members of the council, good evening. The council did convene a closed session tonight at 5 p.m. to discuss the three items listed on your closed session agenda, conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.92, and personnel matters pursuant to government code section 54957. Uh, after a lengthy discussion in closed session, which ended at about 6.10, the council took no reportable actions. That concludes my reports. Thank you very much. Can I have a motion on approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Uh, Bruce? Yeah, I'll second that, but could I, could I ask that we adjourn in a moment, have a moment of silence and adjourn in honor of the half a million people who've died from COVID-19 in our country? as well as their families and friends who probably constitute a majority of our population. I would agree with that. I agree to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we have a, a motion and a second on approval of the agenda. Do we need to do roll call on that? Yes, if you're ready for roll call. Yes, we're ready. Council member Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Yurin? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we are on to item 2A. Uh, Mayor or, Pearson, oh, if yes. I could give a brief report on the posting of the agenda first. Oh, I apologize. Absolutely, that would be wonderful. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on February 11th, 2021, with the amended agenda posted on February 19th, 2021, and the notice of adjournment posted on February 22nd, 2021. Thank you very much. Um, now we are on to item 2A, um, oral communications from the public. Do we have some public speakers? Yes, you have eight speakers. They are Terry Davis, Doug Stewart, Dana Grawlick, Mark Bowdy, Chris Frost, Howard Rudsky, Lloyd Ahern, and Marissa Coughlin. Our first speaker is Terry Davis. Okay, thank you. Good evening, uh, council, staff, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Terry. 
Because my comments address the length and comportment in the last several council meetings, I will not take precious time in public comment. I have submitted my statement by email to the entire council for public record. And I just wanna thank you all for your service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. Our next speaker is Doug Stewart. Okay. Are you there, Doug? I'm here. It took I me a moment to get all the right buttons. Thank you. No problem. Good evening, council members. First of all, I want to speak as one of the public safety commissioners about our appreciation of the work that's been done on the offensive parking of primarily oversized vehicles. Nearly two years ago, the Public Safety Commission began to work on how to improve parking in Malibu. One of the first actions we addressed was the oversized vehicles and what I call home study along our best beaches. Out of this came Ordinance 460 and 469 to require all vehicles to move from the land side to the beach side between midnight and 4 a.m. Now we have Ordinance 427 now in effect, which prohibits all oversized vehicles, commercial and non-commercial, to park no longer than two hours in any one location between midnight and 5 a.m. We could not have achieved this without the diligent efforts of our city manager, Reva Feldman, our public safety director, uh, probably public works director, Rob DuBois, and planning director, Richard Malika, who worked on this even before his promotion. The entire city owes these three people a big thank you for all they've done for the betterment of our city. Now, as a private citizen, I want to speak to be sure everyone knows how well stated Arnold York of the Malibu Times described the current level of turmoil in the City Hall and with its staff. To quote the editorial, I've never seen anything like these constant attacks on the city and city manager and the city staff. These constant accusations of corruption without any evidence, these constant personal attacks on anyone who disagrees with him, meaning Councilman Silverstein, it's unprecedented in the history of Malibu and it's dangerous. And that's the end of the quote. I urge the city council to realize that this is a threat to the culture and basic operation of our city that has taken nearly 30 years to develop. I've never seen anything like it either in my 20 plus years as a resident it's myself. Please do what any thinking business or other government agency would do when presented with real and credible allegations about harassment and hostile work environment. First thing they do is an independent investigation of the facts. Then they determine the merits of the allegations. They take corrective actions as necessary to fix the problem, and especially with those who have caused the problem and have been affected by the problem. And finally, they show the staff, and in this case, our city, that harassment and hostile work environment is not what we as a city government will tolerate now and going forward. With that, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dana Grolick. Good evening, council members and staff. Uh, I'm calling in also um, to echo Doug's comments and speak in revisiting the topic of the investigation into the allegations of corruption within City Hall. Um, I would strongly uh, encourage the council to agendize an item to pursue an outside firm, preferably outside of Malibu, to investigate the claims by former City Council member Jefferson Wagner and current council member uh, Silverstein so that we may have some closure and start fresh and heal the rifts in our community. Uh, there's still quite a bit of social media chatter that's dividing and hurting our community and we need to independently evaluate it so that we can either address the problems if they're there or close down the innuendo and conspiracy theories for good. It pains my heart to see the passionate attacks from both sides and I feel that it's the responsibility of the council to take action to resolve this issue. I think that it's also an excellent opportunity to investigate investigate the claims of the city manager of harassment and hostile work environment so that we can ensure ensure our city staff that their workplace is a safe one. Kill two birds with one stone so that we can either expose what needs exposing or all move on and focus on being productive and bringing the community together. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Our next speaker would be Mark Bowdy, but I don't see him in the meeting yet. So we'll try circling back and okay. we can hear from Chris Frost now. Okay. Good evening, Council and staff. Um, I'm going to be short to the point here. I just I want to thank everybody in the city for putting together and carrying through on this ordinance 427. It's uh, it's a game changer for us out on the highway. And uh, I personally want to thank Reva 
Feldman, Rob DeBow, Richard Mullica, and Trevor Russin, who put in an awful lot of time, and Susan Duenas. We all put in time on this. And I also want to shout out our unheralded heroes out there, the VOPs, who have been out there enforcing our parking schedules on PCH literally night and day. And especially staying out all night on some occasions to uh, to cite the offenders that we have on the highway and try to clean up the problems that we've had out there. And I can tell you personally that they are looking forward to enforcing our new ordinance. And um, I think it's great. Thank you. And uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker is Howard Redsky. Good evening. Hi, Howard. I just wanted to uh, give my thanks to Reva, Rob, Richard, and everybody that's made the new ordinance on the highway possible. I know it took a while, but we got something that's enforceable, defendable, and it just shows that the city's working. It's getting things done, and I think all of us are happy about that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lloyd Aiken. Oh, can you guys hear me? I can hear you, Lloyd. Okay. This is about Bruce and his transparency. And there's a series of questions and some things to fit, find some things out. Uh, Bruce, did your law firm pay $13,500,000 to settle a suit against it for its its involvement in a fake discovery of emeralds from a centuries-old treasure ship. Now, this is a question. The very month that the lawsuit was settled is exactly the month that Silver Bruce left the firm. Were you the point man for the firm with this fraud? Now, that's a question for you. Were you? Um, we'd like Bruce to uh, release his colleagues at the law firm and himself from uh, any non-disclosure agreement he may have with them, so he can talk to them. So we can talk to them and take a transparent look at his involvement with his former colleague's point of view. Also, in the interest of transparency, that's your favorite word, Bruce, we'd like you to sit for a recorded interview with a few citizens, some of whom will be lawyers. That, that'll make you happy. To better understand certain facts about that fraud and your involvement with it. For, now, that's a question also. For instance, he gave to the perpetrator of the fraud. Did he give to the perpetrator of the fraud eighty thousand dollars? That's the exact amount the perpetrator spent buying the emeralds from a Florida uh, jewelry store that uh, he claimed were found from a centuries-old shipwreck. People are wondering about that. There are lots of other questions in a lot of other people's minds too about your involvement with the fraudster with whom you you work closely, or did you not work closely? We'll we'll find that all out. We'd love to ask the fraudster as well but he committed suicide conveniently. What exactly was your relationship with him? Was his suicide timely so that it happened before you were brought before a judge to decide if you should be sanctioned? We have lots of other questions. So Bruce, to be transparent, will you agree to release the law firm and yourself from any and all non-disclosure agreements you may have with it and any of his members so that they can be transparent and unrestricted conversations with them <clears throat> about you. And will you participate in a recorded interview with some Malibu citizens about your past involvement with the Emerald Frauds? And just this is what happens when you have a campaign during COVID. A lot of things don't get vetted. You've got to set an example now. You've got to come forward to the citizens and clear the air because you can't accuse people and not be uh, subjects of your own actions. And your actions are accuse, 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 while you've got a big cloud over you. So we wanna get an answer from you tonight on that dais. Yes or no, will you agree to this? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Marissa Coughlin. Okay. You there, Marissa? Marissa, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute if you're there. Yeah, thank you. I couldn't get it to unmute. <laughs> thank you, you so much for sending that. Um, hi, Marissa Coughlin, good evening, council members. Um, I agree with the previous public speakers and they're, so I'll try not to repeat. 
But something that's been bothering me since the new council took effect, and this has to do with Mr. Silverstein, who I, have, I haven't formed a, a true opinion about yet as I deal with facts. But I'm wondering, in affirmation of the oath that you took, Mr. Silverstein, to uphold the laws of the state and the United States and the constitutions thereof, why is it that you will not even say the Pledge of Allegiance? I'd like to know that. That's very disturbing to me. Having had relatives, I'm a Christian, my family's Christian, and the Nazis killed my family. And I hear what you say about other people in this community, including city employees and such, and it's all extremely disturbing to me. I wish you would look at me, Mr. Silverstein, and not right at the moment, please. Thank you. I find it extremely disturbing, the inquisition and the content of what's going on. There are other people that said that they think outside counselors should be come in, come in. I think we need to do what we need to do to let this business of the city move forward. There are pressing issues that have gone on since way before you were ever around. I have never seen you in City Hall, and not once, and I'm in there every single day and even times during COVID per appointment. Uh, we have an excellent city staff, and through this troubling time, they're doing their best to fulfill the many inquiries and stuff and keep the business of the city funded by the taxpayers of this community going. And I think it's we need to pay attention to the business of the business, and that's the city. Uh, anything that any person has should be do done professionally, discreetly, and when you have facts, and only when you have facts, as we're asked to pre present to the city when we apply for things in the city, we expect the same from every council member. We expect facts, not gossip, not innuendo, not the hatred. I don't even participate in social media, but I get that patch thing, whatever it is. I have never seen, heard so much vitriol from people that I've known for decades. It's very disturbing. So please, uh, if you would, respond to me why you don't affirm your oath of office, because I don't know how I can trust you. If you don't say the pledge, how can I trust you? you're going to stick to your oath? Answer that question, and please take into consideration my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. I still don't see Mark Bowdy in the meeting, so that concludes public comment for this item. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, city manager update. Mayor Pearson, we do have one commissioner update if you wanted oh, to hear that first. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. It's Suzanne Gildeman. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Suzanne. Thank you. I wanted to share an update on some of the projects and programs our department is currently involved in. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Uh, the city of Malibu's Charmley Wilderness Park is almost completely reopened. Just a few trail segments are still being restored. This has been a monumental undertaking and city staff and our contractors have done a stellar job restoring and improving the trails, which are in better condition now than they were before the disaster. The park is clean, safe, well-maintained. Nature's making a strong comeback. I hope you'll take an opportunity to, uh, to visit if you haven't. Uh, the Malibu Senior Center is offering Malibu residents 65 and over phone assistance to navigate the unfortunately insanely complex process of booking a COVID-19 vaccine appointment. Seniors who need help can call the Malibu Senior Center phone number on weekdays and staff will walk them through the online process. Uh, the city's dial-a-ride service uh, will also help to transport seniors to and from vaccine appointments. I think this is a really important and helpful program, uh, and I'm so grateful we can offer that to our seniors. Our department continues to work to keep our parks and facilities open and programs up and running while complying with COVID safety guidelines. And our temporary skate park is going well. We're making good progress with the permanent park. But at our February meeting, we regretfully decided not to recommend to you a dog park proposal for Las Flores Park. The space there is too small and there are too many environmental issues. And if the 
Comments from the public are a reliable guide. There's a need for a dog park on the east end of town. We were discussing in our meeting how our new Civic Center properties, including La Paz, could potentially be a home for a dog park. Uh, but at this point, we're not in a position to discuss that. I know there's no budget at this time for big ticket items like a pool or a community center. But there may be some lower cost activities and facilities like a dog park or the drive-in movies that our city has hosted over the summer that might be possible at some of our new properties. The Parks and Rec Commission would like to have the opportunity to start the discussion with our community. And I'm asking the council to consider budgeting a modest amount of money to open that dialogue so we can begin discussing what we want, what we need, and what might be realistic for the city to consider in this difficult time. This is a discussion that could give our community something to plan for, to look forward to. I realize final plans will require extensive input from city officials, commissioners, consultants, and the public but it would be great if we could begin to come together to create an initial roadmap. Nothing fancy, no consultants, just in-house scoping, but a start, a first step as our community- Suzanne, that's your time. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent report, Suzanne. Okay, no more commissioner reports, I gather? Correct. Okay, uh, Reba? Thank you so much, Mayor, um, and thank you, Suzanne. Um, you actually covered quite a few things that I was going to touch on, so I really greatly appreciate the the help there. Um, I want to start with our um, COVID-19 report. Um, as of this afternoon, the number of new cases in Los Angeles County stands at 2,157, um, and the testing positivity rate has now dropped to 4.4%. So um, definitely are seeing progress in terms of the number of people who are uh, positive. And um, here in Malibu, we stand at 345 positive cases. Um, and as Suzanne said, we are doing everything we can to assist um, our residents uh, in getting appointments. Uh, I know that's a very challenging process. And, um, we are not alone in our community of, of people who are struggling to get those appointments. Um, but if you are having trouble, please call and we will assist you. We also do have uh, transportation if that is necessary. Um, I understand from both the county and the state that on March 15th, uh, assuming there are sufficient uh, vaccine supplies available, they will be opening up the next tier um, of vaccines. So certainly keep your eye on that. Um, there are places that you can go uh, locally that do have vaccines in the Calabasas Agora area, um, and they do have vaccines left over at the end of the day. Um, but I do understand that if you go in as a walk-in for your first dose, you're not guaranteed a second dose. So just a little tip out there for that. Um, and we will continue to provide information out as we get it. Um, in terms of our Woolsey Fire rebuild numbers, uh, we currently have 295 single family homes approved through planning. We've issued 169 building permits and just today we finished our 22nd home. So um, well, welcome home to that family. I'm glad you were able to finish your house. Uh, we are expecting hot and windy dry weather uh, the last a few days of this week. So just a reminder uh, that we are still in fire season all year round. Um, and just a reminder to everybody to please sign up for city alerts for that information. And uh, we also have a special city council meeting tomorrow starting at five o'clock uh, to discuss issues surrounding our homeless community. And I also wanted to echo the thanks that go out to our volunteers on patrol. Um, they truly do an amazing job for our community. So that concludes my report. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Reva. Um, city councilor um, comments. Um, start with uh, Paul. Hold your hand up. Yeah, I just want to give everybody a little bit of an update on what's going on with District 29. Their EIR for the work that was originally supposed to happen back in 2016. The new EIR is set to be approved at the April, April 20th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. I assume that if it is approved there, we will have a series of meetings, which will include at least one in Malibu and one in Topanga, where we'll have an opportunity to urge them on. And I'd like to get us all ready to think 
start thinking of ways that we could help them get permitted more smoothly. Uh, I would love to see the city pour some resources into speeding their permits through quicker than they imagined they could be. Thank you. Okay. Um, Bruce, comments? Thank you. <clears throat> so first, first of all, last week we heard a lot of comments from um, Sycamore Park residents. And um, I was speaking to Jefferson Wagner this week, and he reminded me that the city pays $10,000 a month to California Strategies, which is a, uh, <clears throat> a lobbyist firm. Um, and it occurred to both of us, and it makes sense to me, that maybe we could, um, I'd like to, I don't know if we could have to agendize this or if we can get consensus tonight to give direction to the staff to investigate whether we could ask California Strategies to see what it could do, if anything, to help out with the constant um, disputes that are occurring involving the MRCA. Um, so that, that's, I don't know how that gets, whether that needs to be agendized, whether we can actually have some kind of discussion of giving direction without it being on the agenda. That's one thing. Um, I have some generalized comments I'm going to make, but I, I do want to respond to um, two of the residents. Mr. Ahern, uh, no, my firm didn't pay anything like what you described. Um, it's not correct that the case was settled and then I left at the same time. It, that's just a false fact. Um, I wasn't the point man for any fraud. Um, there was no, there's no non-disclosure agreement of any sort that I'm bound to with respect or my firm is bound to. So if you want to give them a call, the um, switchboard number is 302-571-6600. You can ask for Robert Brady, who I believe is the chairman of the firm these days. And uh, I don't know what he'll say to you or won't say to you, but there's no non-disclosure agreement of any sort. I'm happy to, and I talk about this matter with anyone who wants to talk to me about it, except for people who actually have agendas and are just trying to spin facts incorrectly. Um, $80,000 payment, which you and others laughably talk about, um, if you do your homework, what you'll find is that the alleged fraud occurred in 2010 and my firm and I were not involved in any way, shape or form, didn't know these people, were across the country and were retained a year later and any money that I or my firm or anyone else invested after that fat, that time was well after the money that you're mentioning had been spent allegedly on emeralds. So no, there's no relationship there. What was my relationship with Jay Miskovich? He was my client. Interview, I'd be happy to give an interview to anyone who is a disinterested, genuine, neutral party that wants to ask me questions, but you might want to just get the transcript from the court proceedings. I was interviewed under oath for a number of days, and you can read all about it, and you probably should have done your homework before you started asking your question. Marissa, thank you for your comments. Um, I, too, had family who um, perished in the Holocaust. I, too, have family who fled Nazi Germany and other areas in Europe to avoid discrimination and, um, and worse. Um, the reason, now, first of all, I gave a um, oath of office when I was sworn in to protect and defend the U.S. Constitution and California Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I take that oath very seriously. I've taken it very, I've taken that very seriously my entire life and certainly my entire career as a lawyer, where I've defended the Constitution of the United States multiple times and stood up for it multiple times. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has held that the Pledge of Allegiance is not something that ought to be required, that it cannot be required of students in, in school. It's not required of citizens of this country. In fact, it's one of our most profound constitutional rights to give or not give the Pledge of Allegiance. And there are good reasons you can read the Supreme Court decisions for that. There are religious-based reasons and there are other-based reasons, but I do protect pledge to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, and I regularly pledge allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, which I hold very sacred. So thank you for asking that question. I appreciate it. Now, I ran for city council because I witnessed what I believe to be a ceremonial government that was, not, that was being manipulated and handled by a city employee and city attorney who consistently provided inadequate and troubling legal advice and guidance. I also believe there was a need for a city council member who's a lawyer. 
I had hoped to be able to help turn things around so the city council did the job of governing. The city manager did the job of managing, which means following the lead of the city council and not manipulating and directing the city council. And the city attorney did the job of providing nuanced and well-supported legal advice. More than 2,400 residents with my, agreed with my assessment and my objectives. Yet, since being elected, the majority of the city council have purposefully disregarded and denigrated my legal experience that I bring to the table, seemingly out of spite, fear, and an unhealthy dose of disdain by city council members who make no effort to hide it, and a number of residents who come here repeatedly complaining about vitriol but do nothing but spew it. Additionally, we've had to deal with a parade, uh, that's right, those people. So, since being seated on city council, I've come to understand that the deceit and duplicity with which the city is handled is worse than I had understood from, look, from the outside looking in. And I'm still largely from the outside looking in because I've been deliberately shut out of city council subcommittees, including the mysterious ad hoc committees that do their work behind closed doors that shut out the light of public scrutiny. Since being seated on city council, I've also continued to witness elected officials who care more about expedience than substance, who have no shame about conducting themselves and making their decisions in a lawless manner, and who are more than happy to have the city manager do the hard work of governing while they sit back and take the credit for what little goes on around here. Listen carefully. This is, this is not for the naysayers who parade and speak, but everyone out there. Listen carefully to the analysis or lack of analysis that's brought to bear on complicated matters by the city council. Listen carefully when Steve Uring asks for a concrete timeline and a specific work product for the secretive ad hoc committees, and he gets irritated and non-responsive replies from the ad hoc committee members. Listen carefully when I ask the city manager targeted and specific questions, and I get generalized double talk as a response. Keep in mind that deflection and avoidance are the tools of inept and dishonest people. Finally, the Brown Act was designed to bring the deliberations of elected officials into the public eye so the community could witness the deliberations and understand the bases for legislation and quasi-judicial decisions. Yet, the way governing is handled in Malibu, not even I am able to understand how or why the city council decisions are made the way they are. I don't receive the same information that is provided to other city council members, even though I've asked for that information multiple times. Most recently, I've experienced this phenomenon with the search for a law firm to conduct an investigation respecting the Wagner affidavit, which apparently is proceeding behind a black curtain behind which even I have been unable to peer. That brings me to my final point, which is the city manager. The issue has dragged on too long. More than a month has passed since the city manager concluded that there's no reasonable path by which she will be able to fully perform her duties as city manager for the duration of her current contract. The city manager already has one foot out the door. We need to take the second step for her by providing her with 10 days notice under her contract and then slam that door shut. Closed sessions are too secretive. The public is deserving of, a, of more transparency, which demands an explanation of what the city council is in fact doing in closed sessions. At a minimum, the public deserves to know something beyond the formulaic and Delphic statement, the city council took no reportable action. It also appears that someone has been talking out of school and disclosing the discussions occurring in closed door sessions to one or more members of the public. I have my suspicions as to who that may be, but I'm not going to speculate in public. It should suffice to say that whatever city council members are unlawfully violating the legal sanctity of the closed sessions has cost the city time and money and is acting in his or her own self-interest and not in the best interest of the city and its residents. It's making our lawyer's job much more difficult. If I didn't answer any questions that were posed to me, I apologize, it wasn't intentional. I tried to take notes. And if anybody has further questions of me, I'm happy to speak to them, but not to lawyers who have agendas. I'm happy to speak to residents. I had a very good conversation at one point with, um, Mr. with Dean Gralick, who at one time was going around telling people about my being a fraudster, as Mr. Ahern is now wrongly continuing to say. And I think he came away from that conversation understanding that he was wrong, but maybe, he, he, maybe he'll tell you otherwise. I don't think so. Thanks for the time to speak. Karen. Excuse me. 
Um, just to give an update on uh, my activities, uh, there was a school district separation ad hoc committee meeting. Um, there was a planning meeting for the homeless special meeting tomorrow night. Uh, I received an introduction to Supervisor Kuehl's new homeless deputy. Uh, I attended the COG meeting. I attended a uh, library commission meeting. Uh, I had a policies ad hoc committee meeting. Uh, and this afternoon, I had a uh, LA County Division legislative committee meeting. Um, I would like to thank our public speakers. Uh, Terry Davis, you didn't read your letter, but we all received it. Uh, on the council and it is part of the public record if anybody would like to look into it. But a couple of things caught my eye. Uh, one thing she said is, and I'm quoting, council member Silverstein, I believe you ran on a platform to basically clean the swamp and yet it appears that you have filled it with quicksand and everyone is getting swallowed up in the deadly morass. Council, staff, city manager, city attorney, as well as the residents of Malibu. In another part of her letter, she says, and I quote, it is wrong to use the council dais or social media platforms as a bully pulpit and then claim victimization. And in another part of her email, she says, these last few council meetings have been tedious, never ending and painful. And I think most people would agree, unnecessarily tedious and painful. Um, so I, th I thank Terry for those articulate comments. Uh, I wanna acknowledge everybody that uh, made our ordinance 427 regarding oversized vehicles happen. That's a huge, huge victory. Um, and along with everybody else uh, who spoke, I would like to thank City Manager Reva Feldman, Rob DeBow, who is our Public Works Director, and Richard Mollica, our Planning Director. Just bit by bit, these are, these are long, hard-fought victories, uh, but they all add up. Uh, and I want to thank our Public Safety Commission, uh, certainly Doug Stewart, Chris Frost, and all of the other commissioners. Um, Dana Growlick, perhaps you and your husband see things differently, I don't know. Uh, but I agree with uh, your statement that we should have an investigation of the uh, claims made in the city manager's attorney's letter. Uh, Chris Frost, you mentioned the VOPs and I agree. Thanks to them, they put in so many hours, more often than not in the middle of the night. And we really all owe them a debt of gratitude for those volunteer hours uh, for making our city safer. Um, Lloyd, I think you spoke for yourself. Marissa, thank you. And Suzanne Gildeman, I wanna thank you so much uh, for your comments on Charmley Park. The city put a lot of time and effort and a huge amount of money into restoring the park, excuse me. Um, yeah, Charmley is better than it was before the fire. I fully agree. Um, and the senior center services are helping everybody uh, I, I hope people take advantage of those services and if they haven't yet, uh, please inquire into doing so. If you need help with that, anybody is welcome to contact any of us on the council or at the city. Um, I think that's it for my comments. Uh, I hope anybody watching uh, this meeting or uh, tuned in here on Zoom can join us tomorrow night for our discussion on um, working on our homeless solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, Steve? Uh, thank you, Mikey. 
a couple of things. Suzanne, thank you very much for your comments. If you would give me a call sometime over the next couple of days, uh, let's talk about how much money you guys need to try to get that process cooked up, and let's at least talk about that. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time this last week uh, talking to people about this homeless meeting that's coming up tomorrow night. Uh, and across the board, I think universally, they have hoped that when we finish this meeting, we will have some vision of what kind of a solution we're going to be trying, we're going to be putting in place. Uh, you know, I, and, and I, I agree with them. Uh, I think we have been pushing this thing for a long time. Uh, my concern is that all the reports that I read say that when this rental moratorium gets lifted, it's going to significantly increase the homeless population across the country and also here in Malibu. And I don't think we want to get caught behind that curve. Uh, so I'm hoping we can get ahead of that and make some progress in figuring out what the right solution would be. Uh, and I read Terry Davis's email. Uh, and, I, you know, look, I, I don't want to have long, tedious meetings as, as more than anybody else does. But I think it's it's important to recognize that before Bruce and I got on the council, city council meetings went to 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. So this is not a new phenomenon uh, that is somehow attributable to the stuff that we're doing on the city council. And then the final thing is, and you know, the speakers who come to the city council can sort of say whatever they want, uh, but, but I hope that the city council members will not, in the city council meeting, spend their time dumping on each other. I just don't think that makes us a better working group or helps us become, helps us get together on making some decisions that will make the city better. That's just, you know, just, I just don't think it's the right thing for us to be doing. So Mikey, back to you. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, okay, wow. A lot going on, huh? Thank you to all the public speakers. Um, I don't want to echo what else, what's already been said. Uh, I probably will a little bit. Anyhow, I do want to focus on what Suzanne said about Charmley. It so happens I've been going up there, I think three times in the last week, because it is absolutely mind blowing. I believe I uh, took some pictures. I, I sent one to Reva the other day saying, wow, I, I'd forgotten how beautiful it was up there. It's absolutely stunning. Um, I really recommend everyone goes for a walk. If you walk down the property towards where it drops off um, towards the ocean, that view is amazing. It's absolutely stunning. Um, so yes, the trails are great. It's better than I remembered. And Suzanne, you nailed it. Absolutely incredible. And I just want to echo the thoughts on our Public Safety Commission, our VOPs and our staff related to not only Ordinance 427, but everyone working so hard. Uh, I think we've seen quite a big change already in the amount of uh, vehicles living on the highway and um, really outstanding work. It's super noticeable. I know we have a lot of other issues that we're gonna have to deal with going forward um, in this area, but uh, fantastic work and not easy. This has been hard. Um, the one thing I will say for myself is every single day I'm on the phone on these issues. Every single day, seven days a week, at least seven of them with Chris Frost, um, constant communication. Um, same with city manager, same with staff. Right now, everything involved in the city is a huge amount of work. I personally have never, never in my, what is it now? Nine years of being at the city, maybe close to 10, worked anything like I have lately. There's so much going on. And a lot of it's, it's, it's challenging. It's really challenging. It's a challenging time, particularly with the pandemic. That makes it challenging. Um, I had my first Santa Monica Bay Restoration Committee meeting. Um, that was very interesting. Um, really, um, what, a, what a group of people, great group of people, very passionate group of people. 
uh, and a huge mission. And I learned something in my first meeting that I did not know and I might have missed. I did not know that that commission, um, and it seems like in conjunction potentially with MRCA, is looking at a 91-acre parcel up Carbon Canyon potentially to purchase um, and retire in some way. I did not know that. I if I had missed that if that was public information before. Um, so very interesting there. Um, Anyhow, in the goal of moving forward, I think the rest of my comments can wait, but I uh, feel like I missed something I needed to say. Just can't figure out what it is right at the moment. So, okay. So moving forward to the consent calendar. Do we have members of the public that wish to pull anything on the consent calendar? There are two items that, been pull, that have been pulled by the public. They are 3A1 and 3B4. 3A1, and my pen just snapped in half on me. Hang on one second. Jeez Louise, that's not good. 3A1 and 3B4? Correct. Okay, do we have council members that wish to pull anything else? Bruce? Oh, I can't hear you. Wait, our, let's go Steve while we get- I hit, I hit the wrong button, Steve. sorry. Oh. I, I turn the camera. Steve can go first. Go ahead. Uh, 3B6, Mikey. 3B6. Okay. Bruce. Sorry about that. I, I turned off the camera instead of turning on the microphone. It's okay. um, 3B2 and 3B5, please. Okay. Okay. Go. 3B2. Okay. So, doesn't leave much. So, do I have a motion on the to bring forward 3B1 and 3B3? I'll make that motion. Okay, um, do I have a second? Do, um, can we have a roll call on that? Paul, you were muted, but I saw your hand. Thank you. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. So the first item that was pulled was 3A1. Do we have public speaker on this item? I'm sorry, I was muted. We have Mar Marissa Coughlin speaking on this item. Okay, great. Hello. Hi, Marissa. Um, I just want, the only comment I wanted to have, I, I re, I've read the ordinance again. I do read everything, including Supreme Court decisions. Um, and I just want to uh, comment regarding the uh, uh, impacts of, of the ordinance. I want to make sure of the understanding regarding uh, the variances. Being complicated and luckily dealing with public works a lot, I want to make sure that the planning commissioners understand the purpose of variances and stuff in this in this ordinance and that they have a clear understanding and it doesn't go by the wayside like many of our planning commission hearings do where personal preferences and stuff sort of fight in the way of the actual functioning of the ordinance uh, because this is relevant to both the coastal act public resource code sea level rise funding, all kinds of stuff. So I just want to make sure that I'm understanding the operation of it correctly and that the council direct their planning commissioners to understand it uh, so that it can be correctly applied and used. Uh, that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Marissa. Um, do we have any other speakers? That concludes public comment on this item. Okay, thank you. We're back here for comments or a motion. I'll move 3A1. Okay. I'll second it. Okay. May have roll call on that, please? Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Councilmember Silverstein, you're muted. Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. And Marissa, I'll make sure my uh, planning commissioner understands that. Thank you. Um, and now we have, hang on, oh, 3B2. Do we have a public speaker on that? 
We don't have any public speakers on this item. I think Bruce, did you pull that? Yes. Okay. I just have a brief comment, which is um, last week I raised some issues about the propriety of the warrant. The city attorney has now confirmed to me that the city manager has not followed the proper procedure for presenting the warrant, that the unexecuted certification that set forth, it, the, the unexecuted certification actually sets forth inaccurate information. Um, city attorney and I are still working through the affidavit requirement. We, we're, we're trying to get to the bottom of that. We have differing views, but I don't think either of us has reached a conclusion yet. Okay, so is that- so He uh, wants to comment. Okay, John, do you have a comment? I think uh, Mayor Pearson and members of the council, good evening. There might be a touch of mischarac uh, mischaracterization in, in the advice I gave, but nonetheless, I think, uh, that for non-budgeted budgeted items, your municipal code requires that city manager execute an affidavit. Um, so um, Council Member Silverstein has requested that repeatedly, and I've given advice that I think that's the procedure that's called for in the code. But Mayor, if I might jump in, there's nothing that's ever paid in the warrant that's not included in the adopted city budget. And in that case, the, the budgeted items can be sent to the city council for certification. The question then becomes, should that certification be pay, uh, signed in advance, which is um, probably the appropriate procedure, and I'll work with city staff to make sure that it gets accomplished. Uh, Councilmember Silverstein and I are working through some other issues with regard to warrants, as you mentioned, and we'll have those ironed out shortly. Okay, uh, Paul? Is there a particular payment that you think we should not be making, or is this primarily just a, an issue of uh, form? As best I can tell from the payments that I've sought to audit, they have all looked fine so far from what I can tell. Okay. Is there any reason we shouldn't go ahead and pay these these bills? They've already been paid. All right, well, I look forward to hearing back when um, we sort out how we can, if we can do this more effectively. Do I have a motion to move forward yet? I'll move 3B2. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay, roll call, please. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Abstain. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Next item we have pulled is 3B4. Um, do we have public speaker on this? You do have one public speaker on this item. It's Howard Rudsky. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, um, I mischecked it. I don't have a comment, sorry. Oh, okay, no problem, Howard, thank you. That concludes public comment on this item. <laughs> okay. Can I make a motion that we pass 3B4? Is there a second? Uh, I'll second it. And discussion, Bruce? Yes, I, I have a, a couple questions. I'll, I'll do them one at a time so as not to be confusing. Um, what does it mean to receive and file this? What, what, are the, what are the legal consequences beyond it just going into a file, if any? It's reflected in the minutes, Councilmember Silverstein, that it's been approved, that it's been heard by the council and received. The information has been received. Does it in any way reflect an approval of the document or is it simply that we've received it and we've read it? Just that you've received it and read it. There, okay. is, no, there is no action being taken. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I understand that the auditors confirm the revenue and payments. Do they audit the individual payments to confirm that they're made in accordance with the contracts in other words, that the invoices are per the contract, or do they simply confirm that money went out as as stated and money came in as stated? The the auditors test um, selected items throughout uh, all of the financial transactions of the city. They don't test every single payment that is made. They do a random sampling of timesheets and payroll of um, payments under and contracts. Um, and we don't, we never know what they're going to ask for um, every year. They come in with 
um, looking over the general ledger and they pull things that they want to look into further. So they actually, they, they'll select their own um, transactions and they'll ask to look at the contracts and then they'll decide whether the payment was consistent with the contract? Correct. Okay. And um, do, they, do they in any way confirm the quality of the work product beyond the contract itself? Do they kick the tires at all? Um, how, how do you mean? That's not part of their role to, to ensure it. that's the role of staff when they process an invoice. Okay, so, so the auditors don't kick the tires. They just, they, they're simply looking at the legalese of the contract and making sure the payment is consistent with the contract. They're making sure that we followed um, the municipal code or the public works code on anything to make sure that we have a proper agreement in place um, and that the invoices uh, to match up with the amount in the contract and that we have an invoice that has been properly processed through all of the city processes. Okay, thank you. Um, do they audit um, completely any department of the city or is it just the random audit of various transactions across departments? The city's independent auditor's role is to audit the financial areas of the city. Um, they have in the past done uh, individual audits of different things and we've also had other types of companies come in and do uh, audits of departments. But our independent auditors, um, as in any municipality, their role is to oversee the financial um, area of the city and provide the city's comprehensive annual financial report. Okay, so just to be clear, that, that's, that's a no, they don't completely audit any specific department? That's not their role. They're, they're independent financial auditors. So they don't do that? Not as part of this audit. We do have okay. other audits done of the departments differently, but not thank by you. the Lancel and Longhart. Okay, thank you. I, pre I appreciate That's helpful information to me. I was told I could speak to the auditor. That was about a week or so ago, but that was never arranged. I'll just note that. Uh, I did get a response from them, and I will connect you with them to set up something. Okay, thank you. And just to add on, as part of the annual audit every year, um, the auditors also select a random group of employees to interview, and they also do a random group uh, or one or two of the city council members and do interviews uh, with them as well. We never know who that's going to be, but they do conduct those interviews. Okay. Do we have a motion and a second on that? Yes, you do. It was a motion from okay. uh, Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti and That's a right. second from you. That's right. Are we ready for roll call? Okay. Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, 3B5 um, was pulled also. Do we have uh, public speakers on that? You don't have any speakers on this item. It was pulled by the council. Okay. I'm not sure who pulled it. It was me again. Okay. And we have a small presentation if you want to go that route or if you just want me to answer questions. We are prepared for uh, doing a small presentation. So I don't need a presentation if no one else does. I just have some questions. Okay. Is that a, does anyone else want a presentation? Let's have your questions and then if necessary, we'll have a presentation. Okay. So if, if I understand this item correctly, our city's allocable share of the potential maximum $576,000 is 112,000 and change. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. How was the allocation between the city and the county determined? Is, al is allocated by the amount of acres that the city is in charge of. And that's that presentation. Uh, if you allow me to just show you a few graphics. Well, I'll, I'll accept that representation. That's all I need to understand. But if, if others want to. We are responsible for 27% of that. Out of the 27%, you're talking about um, 12,659 acres. Uh, the county owes 42 thousand four hundred and six and forty two acres so that's about twenty seven percent and that's how that gets to a conclusion um we are part of the santa monica bay coastal watershed and that's how it was delineated thank you uh, now 
as I understand it also, Malibu is going to be the project administrator, and we receive a 10 percent fee, it says, for doing that, which ought to be a maximum of $57,000. I didn't see the payment of that fee reflected anywhere in the documentation. Am I missing it, or is it not there? Um, it's possibly not dead, uh, there. I have a spreadsheet that shows the agency's contribution, and I can share that with you, send you that information. Yeah, well, I, I actually, I saw the, so we're, may, we're are we contributing our pro rata share of our own, to ourselves as our own fee? Uh, we are contributing 112494 uh, that is our contribution. The, all, the other parties that are contributing to this is the L L County of Los Angeles, uh, also the County of Los Angeles um, um, CFCD uh, is contributing 40, 53,000. So I can show, I can forward you that information. No, I, I actually, I saw that in the documentation, but what, what, what was confusing to me was I didn't see where we were then being paid the 57,000 or up to 57,000. It looked like we were being paid only a proportion, only a portion of that. And I didn't know if that was the way the contract was supposed to work. It looked like we might be, the, the way it's written might be depriving us of something like $20,000, but I might be incorrect. Um, I have Mark Johnson also on the on this conversation because he uh, helped me put the contract together. Mark, are you able to answer this question for Council Member Silverstein? I'm not sure I understand the question, but we are not paying ourselves to manage um, this program. Only that we get the, a portion from the flood control district and the county. They are the only ones that are paying us to manage this program. Okay, well, maybe someone else understood it better than I did. I, what I saw was we were getting paid, there was a line item for what the, what the various parties were paying towards the um, administration fee, and it added up to something like $30,000, $35,000, but it should add up to over $50,000. So that was confusing to me. But if you don't have further information, I, I get it. Um, why are we the administrator and how have we determined how our actual costs of being the administrator compares to what we're being paid to be the administrator? Um, I've actually got a slide that has a breakdown of the costs. If we could, if you'd like, we could provide that with, for you and we can, uh, it'd be easier to discuss that. Okay, sure. That's slide number five. Okay, so here's our cost breakdown. And basically the way it was uh, negotiated out is initially only, so the, the flood control district does not own any acreage. So they are only paying um, a 10% share of the total project costs. And that actually includes uh, the administrative piece. So, so they're not just paying the 10% of the consultant fee, they're paying 10% of on top of that, their um, administrative fee and the county's administrative fee that we received for managing the contract. Um, the way it was negotiated out originally is because the city is more populated, more dense than the unincorporated county. The city pays 10% of the initial project cost. The county pays 10% of the initial project cost. You can see that in the first slide here for the base fee, that's 21,912. And then from that, uh, the city has 23% of the acreage. And so then that's how it was calculated out that the contributions would be paid. So that, so basically the contribution that we're paying based on land area is 9,582 and the county is paying 303 Eight three nine. That's why you see that there's no contribution for based on land area for the flood control district. Right. This is actually the the, the the chart I was looking at when I was that confused me. You see where it says zero contract administration fee for Malibu? Yes, that would and be. It says, a, and, it, well. and it says total total to be paid to Malibu is thirty seven thousand four hundred and forty four dollars. At the bottom, we get that contract oh. administration fee, right? Yes. Okay. 
But the contract administration fee, according to the contract, is is 10 percent of the five hundred and something thousand dollars. So we're not receiving a 10 percent administration fee. We're receiving something substantially less than that, as I read it. So the way it breaks down is the contract is uh, eight thousand or the the estimated contract amount for the consultant to do the work is four thousand eight eight hundred four four thousand four hundred eighty six thousand dollars, and then on top of that, that's where we get the administration fee. So we take that number, multiply it by ten percent, and okay. then that's and that's four hundred that's forty eight thousand dollars. I'm not following you. So the total contract towards the consultant fee is the $48,000 that the flood control district is paying towards um, that amount. Paul, you seem to be able to you yeah. shed some light on that. Yeah, let me shed a little bit of light on that. I, here's how I look at it, Bruce. If we could, we could draw a separate chart that shows us paying our contract administration fee and then show us getting our contract administration fee back. But it's a lot simpler to just show the, the amount that we're getting from others. I, I, I agree. I, that's what my question was, whether we were paying a share of our own fee or not. And the answer was we're, no. We're, we're paying not. our own share and then we're getting it back for, okay. for administrating it. Okay. That's the clarification I was looking for. The, the, so the, and the other question I'd ask, which this chart doesn't answer, is how was it determined by us what our actual cost of doing the administration is to justify our agreement to do to be the administrator in exchange for payment of whatever the amount is that was actually determined during the um when the EWIMP was developed initially so we just carried over that the original formula from when this program was developed so that was uh, before I started working for the, the city. So I can't answer that question for you. So, so we, we don't know whether we're paying, whether it's costing us more to be the administrator or we're breaking even or we're making some money on it. Is that correct? I don't think we're supposed to make money on it. Uh, we administrated a requirement for a permitting that is to facilitate permit compliance and water quality. Uh, we, um, if you go through, and I know you didn't wanna see the presentation, but it's slide number two, which has all the mapping. It clearly, um, sorry, uh, it clearly shows the North South, uh, North Santa Monica Bay coastal watershed. All of that is included you will see the city of Malibu is a lower portion, and that is only constitute the 12,659 acres. Uh, so, and that's a reason why those areas are more populated by uh, city, um, the community of Malibu. That's a reason why we did it uh, in the past, since 2013, there was an agreement in an MOU with the uh, Los Angeles uh, County Public Works. And I think one of the things, if I can just jump in, is that we're mandated by law to address water quality issues, and it's not something that we're ever going to recoup our costs on. And this is a, a way of us partnering with other agencies to address some of these issues. So it, this is not, this is part of what we are required and mandated to do. So it's, it's not supposed to be something where we're getting our fair share for everything. We have to pay out and do certain things. Um, Paul? I, I think the best way to, to look at this is if somebody has to be the lead, has to be in a position to monitor the person who has the contract to take the TDML uh, samples and do all of that. And our city is not nearly all of the coastline where these samples are going to be being taken. And if the county were to do it, then the county would have to send somebody in to Malibu and they would, it would be more expensive for them to do it than it is for us to do it. And it's, it makes a lot of sense for us to be the ones who 
are in a position to call up the people who are doing the work and going, I don't, I don't believe which, what's what I'm seeing as far as the reports come in. So the, the stuff up in the hills, I mean, once their view is probably once the water flows downhill, they don't want to even have anything to do with it ever again. So that's my point. Well, maybe, maybe my question isn't as clear as I think it is, but um, I haven't heard an answer to what I have asked, but I, I, I get that I've got the answer I've got. Okay, any more questions or a motion? No motion? No I'd question. like to make a motion that we uh, accept the report. Okay, do we have a second? I will second. Okay. Oh, wait, this is, we're not accepting a report, we're approving a contract, aren't we? Can you, I, I'd like to make it, a motion that we approve the contract. It says, so. yeah, authorize the mayor to execute a professional services agreement with Larry Walker and Associates. That's what I said, that's what I thought. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. We have a motion and a second. Can we have roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti. Thank you, Karen. Yes. Councilmember Fair. You're welcome. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein. Yes. Councilmember Uring. Yes. Mayor Pearson. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We're to 3B6, uh, Amendment to Professional Services Agreement for School District Separation Consulting Services. Um, do we have public speakers on this? You don't have any speakers on this item. It was pulled by the council. I pulled it, Mikey. Okay. Okay. Uh, and this, Karen, I just got a couple questions. This may be better directed toward you. Uh, we've allocated just about $179,000 that has been allocated to this project. Uh, it, does all of that take us up to the April 17th meeting? Or does some of that roll over to cover some of the other things that they mentioned here about community meetings and that kind of stuff, you know? We have, we have uh, additional services that we feel are going to be necessary to take us through the next two meetings, including the April 17th meeting. Um, just as we brought in additional financial team members, which in my opinion made all the difference in the world to uh, charting this path uh, with all due respect to everybody else already on the team. Um, we now are, are seeing the need for uh, additional services like communication uh, and. Is that, is that covered under the 179,000 or is there more required to get us through all the communication pieces they got to do, you know? We have Christine Wood, our uh, deputy city attorney, who's handling the school district matter, and perhaps she could address some of these for you, Steve. Yeah, I thought this was sort of the ad hoc committee's looking at this stuff, so I was just wondering. We are, absolutely. Okay. So, is it this, what, what does the 179,000 get us up to? Uh, good evening, um, Mayor Pearson and, and Council. Um, again, my name is Christine um, and have um, been operating as deputy city attorney and counsel for the ad hoc committee. Um, Council Member Uring, to, to answer your question, the um, amendment, I think, is what you're asking. The amendments that you're looking at, what do those cover and what does it take us up to? Is that your question? Well, I'm just, I mean, I, we approved the $60,000 as part of our Administrative Finance Committee budget meeting, right? So, I got, oh, look, I'm in favor of, of the school district separation. I got no problem with that. I'm just trying, here, here's my concern. What I'm just trying to understand is, We've been at this thing for like 12 years, not the city, but members of the city, right? We've been chasing this thing for 12 years, and I don't know buckus about school district separations. I mean, I don't know the rules, I don't, but what I do know is how to, how to manage long-term projects and how to sort of get a sense that says, yeah, I'm on track, I'm not on track, and that's all I'm trying to do with this, to sort of say, you know, I'm spending 100, 180000 bucks or whatever it is, where does that take me up to? That's all I want to know. Yes, um, and, and I believe the number that you're looking at is the number of the amendment, which is why I was asking if that's what you were asking about. It definitely takes you through um, the prelim the hearing that's currently scheduled to take place 
um, April 17th. And the amendments right now take you through the rest of the fiscal year for whatever additional support the um, financial consultants would, would have to provide us through the rest of the fiscal year. Okay, so the, the 60 grand gets us focused on the meeting, the additional money carries us through the end of the year. Yes. Okay, cool, that's good to know. April 17th meeting, what do we expect to happen at that meeting? What do, what do we what do we look, I'm trying, what is gonna be the benchmark that tells us we're going down the right path? What are we gonna hear? So I, I used an analogy today and I'll use it again. Um, I'm starting to look at the school separation process. It's a full reorganization process. This could take several years. If you look at it as, as um, just taking a bite out of an elephant, one bite at a time, um, this first bite, we really have a, a preliminary step to take, and that's even getting to the April 17th meeting. It's not guaranteed we will have the April 17th meeting. So we're prepping to make sure or to, to request that LACO honor its, um, its calendaring of the April 17th meeting. Once we get past that, we will prepare for the April 17th meeting, at which time LACO has decided that they, they will um, evaluate the full merits of the petition. Um, at that point, they will hear from us, they will hear from the district, they will hear from the public. Um, and at that time, LACO staff will also make a recommendation. LACO's County Committee on Reorganization at that point will make a decision um, on the merits of the petition. Um, and that's what we anticipate will happen at the April 17th meeting or whenever that meeting happens, if it's not April 17th. Well, let's assume it's April 17th. So the end re the result that we're hoping to get is, is LACO says, yeah, we want to move this forward. Is, is that going to be? Yes. So after this initial meeting, if LACO um, approves the petition, then there is still additional work that has to take place. Um, there, there will still be additional community um, public hearings. They will hold public hearings in Malibu. They will hold public hearings in Santa Monica. They will continue to have public hearings, and then they will have a second public hearing. This particular education code provides for a second public hearing um, for the um, for the county committee to decide again on the petition after it's heard from the public. So if, after the April 17th meeting, if they schedule additional public hearings, we'll know we're headed in the right direction. Yes, so, that is that is our best case scenario. Yes, cool. Councilman. Okay, that's good. I, that's all I'm just trying to get my hand, head around that. It, and if I could jump in, um, we discussed with the ad hoc that we're going to be adding a standing item to upcoming city council meetings so that if there's any new developments, the ad hoc can provide that information to the council as a whole. Um, obviously, we're starting to get into the place in the negotiation of, of separating uh, where there's a lot of new things happening. Yeah, frequently. I'm, so we'll be giving just, regular updates. I'm just trying to get some background. I've not, I mean, I've not chased this sure. that closely. I've, I've been in contact with the people building the school, but not in this this component of it. Sure. Uh, we we did, Council Member Uring, we did anticipate that there may be some additional questions. And so after the um, the March meeting of LACO, which is just next Wednesday, we were hoping to brief the council um, with a full explanation of whether or not April 17th will happen okay. um, at your next meeting, I think is um, March 8th. That's cool. The, the, I got two last things. I remember I sat through the original meeting you guys did with the city council and I don't, I'm, I'm getting old, so I can't remember all this stuff, but there was a list of steps we're going to have to go through. Uh, and I, you said meetings in Santa Monica, meetings in Malibu. I, there was some vote that had to take place. I thought somebody mentioned I'm, in, in the future when you do this, if you could just one liners of what next, what the overall steps have got to be just so I get a perspective of where I am versus where the hell I think we got to go. Fair enough. Um, that's okay. Last question is when I read the staff report or the 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 agreement here, uh, I assume the ad hoc committee is in charge of this project. Is that a fair statement? Because when I read this, uh, they're taking we got, I guess the people who are doing this work, they're taking direction from the city attorney, they're taking direction from the city staff, they're taking direction from the city council. Uh, I, who the hell else knows? All I'm saying is typically in my experience. You want a fairly straight line between who's given direction and who's doing the work, because otherwise, so I'm, is, is ad hoc committee is in charge. Making as always, as always, we, are. we set the as policy. Always. The staff is in charge of executing it. Okay, I'm just saying, John. I, I don't know how much you know about this stuff, but. Good luck. So if I could jump in, I would definitely say that the school district separation process is definitely a 
collaboration between uh, my office and the city attorney's office, and uh, we're getting uh, input from the ad hoc committee anytime there's a decision that has to be made that's coming to the council as a whole. So, um, you know, certainly I understand where you're trying to go, but it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a whole team effort. Yeah, no, I'm just, uh, my only thing is, you know, I don't want, we, again, I don't want to wait 12 years to be disappointed. If that, as this thing moves along, you'd like to see little benchmarks along the way that says we're moving in the right direction. So I got what I need for this evening. Thank you very much. Paul or, or Bruce, I'm not sure who's first. first. Okay. Paul, Bruce? I didn't see your hand. If you want to go first. Uh, no, no, go ahead, Bruce. Okay. okay. So how much have, has the city spent so far in total to it toward the end of achieving separation? Lisa, are you there? Do you have a number on that? I don't have a total number um, in front of me. And I don't know, um, I did not prepare this report. I don't have that off the top of my head, but we can certainly get that information. For Does you. anyone have a ballpark? I mean, originally the council had allocated $100,000 to this effort and we just added 60 at the mid-year. So 160. If you add those two together, it's 160. That was that. That's in the eight to 12 year effort altogether. The, the city didn't start contributing towards the school district separation process till about, I want to say, three or four years ago. Um, yeah. Until after the the monk um, uh, uh, finished the work that they were doing, so we were not contributing financially or with staff or, or in any way um, um, until that time uh, when we decided to submit a petition from the city to the to Lake Up. Okay, so at this point, it's it's something in the neighborhood of 150 to 200,000. If you know, add the, I, I that, don't have that exact number, but we can certainly get that for you. Okay. And do we keep track of how much staff time is devoted to this project? We're not tracking staff time on that. We don't track staff by projects. Okay. How much do we anticipate we're going to spend in order to completely wrap this up and achieve victory? We don't know because we don't know that the, the hurdles that are going to be put in front of us. If you had asked us two years ago, we would have laid out a plan for you, which has obviously not taken the course due to some of the uh, issues that have come up with the school district. Uh, originally, we were trying to submit the petition uh, as the city, and we decided to withdraw that petition and uh, work with the school district and, and their leadership on negotiating a separation and uh, going to lay code together hand in hand. And those negotiations disintegrated. And so now we've uh, reinstated our petition and are trying to move that forward. It's a so very it lengthy, complicated process that even once we get through the county portion of it, we're going to have to go forward on the state level. Um, and that could take uh, maybe two years to get a hearing in front of the State Board of Education. Um, but I'll be more than happy to forward to the council all of the different reports that we've done uh, over time with the school district, a separation process that lays out a timeline and the steps. So, so do we have any kind of ballpark estimate whatsoever of how much this is going to cost from beginning from soup to nuts? Um, what I what I can say is that the money we're spending on school district separation, once we achieve separation and a Malibu Unified School District is established, we'll be able to recoup the funds that the city did spend on this process. So um, I'll, I'll let Christine speak in terms of, of her experience with other separation experiences. Okay, if you could, Christine, I'd appreciate that, but if you could focus on the question I asked, which is, do we have a ballpark on soup to nuts what this is going to cost? So, Councilmember Silverstein, I, I don't think there's any way to know um, even a ballpark um, because this could take, I think I've reported before, this could take at best case scenario four to five years. Some school separations have taken as many as 20 years. I think people have really, um, you know, been disheartened, disenchanted by the, the idea of that, but that is a reality. So, you know, from four to 20 years, I have no idea what the, a ballpark figure would even be. Okay, what is the anticipated cost of the separation itself once it's achieved? Do we have any idea of that? I don't know that I understand your question, Council Member. Could you, could you ask me maybe a, a different way? Yeah, we're, we're going to spend some unknown amount of money to get to the point where we have a separation occurring 
what does it then cost the city of Malibu to maintain its own school district going forward from that point Nothing. forward? The city so doesn't no. pay for the school district. Yeah, so what we're, 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 we're trying to do, um, there's a couple of steps. So once LACO, if LACO approves school separation, as Reva stated, then you would go to um, the State Board of Education for their consideration. And there's some, um, there's a variety of procedures you have to go through there. But if, if ultimate school separation is approved by the um, State Board of Education, at that point, once there is um, uh, an establishment of the Malibu Unified School District and Independent School District, it will operate with its, with its own budget as, as all other school districts do. There will be no um, investment by the city to operate the school district at that point. And as Reva mentioned, there is an opportunity for the city to then put forth to this independent legislative body what resources it expended to, um, to help it form. And there is a possibility of a reimbursement back to the city. Okay, I just want to make sure I asked the question. I didn't just use the wrong words. So it doesn't, it not only doesn't cost the city anything if we're separated to operate the school district, but it also doesn't cost the taxpayers of Malibu anything. Only well, it doesn't money cost, you're already paying. It, right. it, it, it's part of a larger tax that goes elsewhere and we just get some portion back. Is that? So um, I think this really speaks to uh, if the something the ad hoc committee and, and we talked about, there probably is some, um, some, some work that we can do as an ad hoc committee and as, a, as consultants to maybe help some of the, um, some of the council understand better about um, kind of school district finances this is something you're, you're working towards as a council. But um, council member Silverstein, what, what would happen at that point is all of the, the, the tax, the property tax and the parcel taxes that the residents of Malibu are already paying to the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District for very little representation and very little support. All of those resources would then be governed by um, the residents of Malibu through their um, independent school board. Okay, uh, what, so I, I'm sorry I'm fumbling through this. I'm, That's I'm trying okay. to understand. I, where I used to live, I actually paid a separate school tax. Um, I'm understanding that doesn't occur here. It's part, it comes out of our property tax. Um, but are we limited then in the way that we can operate the school district or the school district can operate itself to our allocable percentage of the tax money? Or does the, does the state or county determine how much money we need to operate an effective school district and just give us that amount of money that we need? If I, if that was, uh, is hang on one my second, question? one second answer, but then I think we, sh we need where we've left the agenda here a little bit. And so maybe we can find another way to get all this information well, so we can get back to this agenda. I, I, Frank, I, I think it's relevant to approving a payment of $60,000 and future payments to understand why we're doing it, where it's headed, what it's going to cost us in the long run. So that's why I'm asking these questions. I'm trying to understand that. So the the way the way school districts are are, are funded very briefly is that um, within the state of California, property taxes go to fund school districts. When a school district is funded at a certain level through its property taxes, um, you know the state identifies actually a minimum amount of money each school district should get, um, and once um, a school district's um, property tax exceeds that amount of money, that minimum amount, then that that proper that school district is funded completely by its property taxes. That at that point you become what they're what they call a basic aid district. It is anticipated that Malibu Unified School District will be a basic aid district because its property taxes will exceed the minimum amount of funding that the state requires. Um, in that case, then the, the state will not provide any additional support because all of the minimum amount of funding that you're required um, to have as a school district is covered through your property taxes. I hope that's a very brief answer to your question. Yep, I just wanna make sure I understand it. Are, are, so are you, are you saying, cause maybe not, that that means that there'll come a point where it starts cutting into the tax base that we get from the county to fund it or you're saying the opposite of that? I'm saying, um, I don't know if I'm saying the opposite of that, but no, I'm not saying that. Right now, all of the property tax money that the Malibu residents give to the 
city or the district of Santa Monica. We're not asking at this point for any additional funds from the residents or the taxpayers in the city of Malibu. At this point, we're just asking for the property taxes and the, pro the parcel taxes that you provide to the district that they be given to an independent Malibu Unified School District for local governance. And, and do we have, and how, how do we know that that's going to approximately cover the cost of our own school district and, and that we won't need to dip into further funds to do that? Um, we well because of the the the, uh, the financial consultants that whose contracts you're looking at have looked at um, per pupil spending and budgets and right now we have um, a sufficient amount of per pupil spending to support a school district. Okay, and has that taken into account the impact of the Woolsey fire and COVID nineteen? Um, as, as it would be impacted by, I mean, the school districts are impacted by a variety of things and a variety of changes. So, um, but the, the, the budgets um, and the per pupil spending are significant and significant, um, especially when compared to other school districts across the state. It would be more than enough to, um, to support a independent um, school district. Okay, I just have two last questions. One is, is, does, is there a point at which this becomes not economically feasible that we're aware of? Call a question. Excuse me? I'd like to call the question. And, and Councilman Bishop, remember, remember the Brown Act prohibits discussion on items that aren't on your agenda. Yes, this tangentially relates to school you know, the school separation issue, but we're going well beyond what the actual agenda item is, which is the approval of an agreement for consultant services. Okay, so, um, I'll, I'll take your guidance on that. Uh, I just want to say that the, the this is the first time I'm hearing, maybe it's been said before multiple times, that this, could, that this is going to take a minimum of multiple years and could take as much as decades. Again, I don't understand how we can have an ad hoc committee that is formed for the purpose of overseeing this indefinite project. But I guess maybe the, I'd like to agendize having that question decided and, and um, offered up by the city attorney. Uh, Paul? For starters, it was already agendized and discussed and a previous city council authorized the formation of the ad hoc committee. Uh, the other thing that uh, seems to be missing from your dis your understanding of this is every, every dollar that goes to from Malibu's uh, property taxes to education, the city of Malibu's residents only get the about what is it 70 cents 75 cents of benefit from that now so we're talking about a, a third again as much money will be available to run the city of malibu's school district and i'm sure karen has a much better handle on the actual numbers than i do but this has been something that was obvious as long ago as 1991 to me when my youngest daughter was in sixth grade here and it and i got frustrated with the the way that the finances were going out and then not coming back from santa monica and how we were constantly treated poorly and i think it's 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 wonderful that we are now in a much better position than we have been anywhere in the past 30 years and i think that there is a path forward and it's definitely worth doing and the finances are not going to be anything to worry about, Bruce. And I invite you to, in, to investigate and learn a little bit about what's going on. And Karen, I'm sure you have something much better to say than that. Well, um, I could talk about this for hours, which I promise I won't do. Um, and I can appreciate the questions. Um, I, I, I'll try to make this quick. Two really important things have happened since Advocates for Malibu Public Schools formed and uh, began to uh, not only gain awareness, but, but uh, disseminate information to the community and uh, make requ requests to the school district. Um, it's not been an easy thing to do, partly because we're outvoted seven to one. Malibu versus Santa Monica. That's part of the reason we only have one school board member. Uh, the geographical distance and the fact that we have another school district in between Santa Monica and Malibu uh, 
is another factor, and, and I won't talk about this all night, but two things. Um, prior to 2018, the school district had one uh, bond assessment district, and that was for both Santa Monica and Malibu. Now we have two separate bond districts, which was created by the pressure put upon the district by Advocates for Malibu Public Schools, or AMPS. Um, we now have a Malibu-only bond district and a Santa Monica-only bond district. The reason for that is $91 million that Malibu taxpayers have given to Santa Monica for their schools with the passage of bonds in, I'm trying to remember the years, 2008, I think, no, 2006 and 2012. The, the actual ballot language, and you'll probably find this hard to believe, but the ballot language on both of those bonds, which was, I think, Measure ES and Measure X, it said, Malibu will pay 30% of the bond and receive not more than 20%. That was on the ballot. And people ask me, how could that pass? How could that pass? Santa Monica outvotes Malibu seven to one. How could it not pass? Um, another thing that we got separately uh, was our facilities me, Sarah, oversight committee. I know this is a passionate topic. For, Sorry, you know, I really, like I said, we're, I could talk we're about way this off, We're way off agenda. But we're, again, this is a specific agenda item on the consent calendar. Um, it's a, typically said to be routine. There's been a lot of questions asked. I apologize. The, no, I'm not asking for apology. It just goes well beyond where we are on this particular item, which the focus should be on. We, we can find a way to do a... a, a a history and future looking session. Um, yeah, it seems like um, uh, some some history and background is in order just to catch up the it, whole it, community. It's and a long, there's complicated very, story. There's I very just, robust information and a timeline on the city's website. If I, if I could, I just want to, Karen, thank you so much. That was, a, that was actually very helpful to me. I appreciate it. Paul? I'd like to make a motion that we approve item three Six. Six. I'll second. Okay. Um, can we have roll call on that, please? Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. And I'm, Thank you. And I want to thank uh, Christine for her help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we are on to... 4B, approval and uh, approval of use of community development block grant funds for fiscal year 2021-22. Can we have a report, please? Sure. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we do this every year. This is the public hearing um, for authorizing and approving the fiscal year 2021-2022 um, community Development Block Grant, or CDBG, funds. Um, and annually, the city receives about $68,000. That's sort of our new number. It, it goes, it's never exact. We don't get the exact number until a little bit later in the year. Um, and there are very few um, items that the city can actually spend spend this money on. It has to be allocated for uh, low income and uh, senior projects, and the bulk of the money needs to be used for capital projects. So uh, historically, we've given an allotment to the Malibu Community Labor Exchange, um, and we are recommending that again this year, uh, $20,000, which includes the services and the rental of their temporary trailer. And because um, there is an obligation that the city has to draw down money, we are recommending that the remainder be uh, 48, uh, roughly $48,000 be uh, transferred to the CDBG revolving grant fund, um, which allows the city to, allows other cities to use it right now. It fulfills our drawdown requirement but it makes those funds available to us when we need them. Um, and 
in the past, the city had hoped to use the capital funds for uh, securing a permanent trailer for the labor exchange that will be sited um, behind the Santa Monica College satellite campus. Um, but because delays in that project have happened and we've sort of had to move that capital work down the road a little bit, um, it makes the most sense for us to bank these dollars now and we'll be able to draw them down later. Um, that's sort of a brief outline. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, do we have any public speakers on this item? You don't have any speakers on this item. Okay, thank you. Any uh, comments or a motion? Rob Roos? I, I, have, I have a question or two. Um, it sounds like from your description, the answers could be no, but is there any way that we could legitimately use any of these funds for either of the two items we have at the end of our agenda, um, namely the farmer's market or the um, young actors program? I, I suspect it's no, but I just want to nail that down. Correct. The answer is no. Those would not be eligible. Okay. And we're having this homelessness meeting tomorrow, and at some point in the year, we're going to, well, we, we already spend a lot of money in that endeavor. That sounded like it did fit within what you were describing. It, are there ways in which we could be tapping into this grant fund for purposes of the things we're already doing and or maybe doing with respect to the homelessness in, issue in uh, Malibu? Um, there may be some, uh, not necessarily, services are a very difficult thing to pay for and, and what they really want us to pay for is um, capital. Uh, that's, that's the push and we've kind of stretched as far as we could um, how much we can pay for services. Um, but uh, over, you know, over the course of the years, sometimes the CDBG makes exceptions, you know, they, they had a, we were allowed in the last year to spend some money on COVID um, related um, services because there was a need, I think, regionally that, and, and they allowed, uh, they, they added money to the pot and they allowed us to use some of our existing funds for that. So there are things that we can explore and um, it, it does note in the staff report that there, there is money we have already banked in these revolving funds that we could draw down later. Um, so this is making a decision now um, because there is a time deadline for us to make a decision. There are other funds that we can um, look at drawing down later and we can certainly explore what other options are available for the uses of them. Thank you, Lisa. Hey, Mike, Mikey, just one procedural issue. Did we need to have a roll call to agree to continue item 4A, or that's something we just skip over? I don't think so. It was already, uh, it was uh, agendized as continued. Or did, did we, we need to? That's I think we question. approved the agenda, right? We approved the agenda. Yes, it says recommended notes. action, continue it. I will turn to staff for an answer on that then. It's already noted on the agenda that's been continued. No further action is required. Okay, thank you. I'll make a motion um, to move this item. Okay. Second, second motion. Okay, I think Bruce seconded it. Um, okay. Can we have roll call, please? Councilmember Urine? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. We're on to 5A. I just want to check if any city councilors need a break yet. Can we go another item. We good? Yeah. It looks good. Okay. Item 5A, Woolsey Fire Fee Waiver Program. Can we have a report, please? Um, there's not much of a report beyond what we have in the staff report. I think what we're really here tonight is to give the council an opportunity to discuss the status of the fee waivers and to let staff know um, what you would like to do in terms of um, extending the dead, you know, the deadlines, whatever you can. We kind of worked up po different possibilities. Um, certainly you could extend the time as one option or 
again, that we, we leave that to you to give us direction. I think the direction in, in the past um, had been to help where we could. Um, so I, I, I kind of send it back to you. I'm, I don't know whether they're speakers, um, but we're, we're here to answer questions. I think um, other staff too, um, including um, Richard Malika, um, are available because again, they're dealing on the ground with the people who are um, coming in and, and looking to do these rebuilds. Okay, I know council will have questions, but let's see, uh, let's hear from public speakers first. Do we have any public speakers? Yes, you have three speakers signed up for this item. They are Dana Grolick, Howard Rudsky, and Marissa Coughlin. We don't see Dana in the meeting right now, so we'll start with Howard. Okay. Hello again. All right. I, I just want to say I'm strongly in favor of extending it as one of the people that fought the fire to, and lucky enough to save our home. It's a harrowing experience. And then afterwards, the horror stories I've heard from people dealing with their insurance companies and other different consultants, et cetera. So I'm in favor of extending it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Our next speaker is Marissa Coughlin. Hello. Hello, oh, Council. I, um, I have a couple of thoughts on this, and and thank you, uh, uh, Councilwoman Ferrar, about the school thing. And everything is on the website, as the city manager indicated. So possibly um, uh, Council Member Silverstein can go more to our website, because we got to get some of this stuff done. Um, the, the three deadlines, I'm, I've worked on numerous fire rebuilds and our city staff and our city consultants and our city management have been superb in dealing with the homeowners and the uh, 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 extenuating circumstances. Our building official is off the charts with the, her department's involvement and assistance in, in helping to uh, uh, move these things along. My concern is twofold. Uh, extensions, I don't really have a problem with, but this may address part of the school board issue. Unless we get some of these properties built, we're not going to have that tax space to generate, even if we don't have our own district, which we should. And uh, my son, my youngest son is 39, and this started when the school district separation when he was at Malibu High School. So it's there's a whole history there, which uh, unfamiliar uh uh, councilman can go and read. Uh, but as far as the different uh, issues on this, I'm I'm just concerned about how we're going to make up what we waive. I want the people to have the benefit because I'm I just had a meeting last Monday with one of the insurance companies that still has not paid the homeowner except for debris removal. And and it's on point doom and it, it was a horrible experience. Uh, to watch them go through this. They've had cancer, they've had COVID, they've lost their home, everything since this. What these people are experiencing is critical. So if there's some way you could evaluate, um, I know that the staff's been fabulous in expediting the process, Carlos and Richard and everybody expediting the process for it, but we have to tie it in somewhere and maybe post a deadline for application. Maybe that would be good public noticing for people that are interested, give them advance notice, both in the print and uh, email and everything you want to do, to say, if you are interested, you must submit like you did the last time where you extended it. It was going to be December 30th and you extended it because I had three I had I brought in by the 30th. So it may be some noticing. I, I'm a little bit flummoxed. I really don't know how to address this correctly, but uh, we need the money for the school. We need a separate school district, and we need to get the people back in their homes. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, was there a third speaker that wasn't there? Dana, I think you said. Dana Grolick was signed up to speak, but she's no longer in the meeting, so that concludes public comment on this item. Okay, we're back here to the council then. Um, Steve, I know you have some questions, so maybe I'll I'll turn to you. Um, if yeah, you it's want. more, and, and I'm not opposed to helping people get their houses rebuilt. So the waiver program we've had in place, I mean, it's costing us some money, but I think it's money well spent. Uh, the, the question I do have 
as a result of looking at last couple of days in the planning commission, I took a look at some notice of decisions and because I had nothing to do that, they looked underneath it and came up with, I just learned that one of the things we were doing is allowing people to do serial development and giving them waivers for that. Explain that a little more. Basically, my understanding was the waiver was supposed to be given for a primary residence if the person was building like for like or like plus 10%. When I read the resolution, that's exactly what it says. What I found was what they were doing is you could come in on a Monday and I guess present your house as a like plus 10% and they would waive the fees for that rebuild. And then you could come in five days later and add another 1,500 square feet to the top of your house, which puts you way over that like plus 10%. They charge fees for the addition, but you get your fees waived for the primary residence or the initial project. And my concern is a couple of things. One, that's not what the council voted on, at least not that I could find. Mikey, if you think that was what you guys voted on, let me know. But I couldn't find that any place. But my bigger issue, the other issue is I'm not sure how people found out about that. I've scoured the city's website. There's nothing on there that says, if you want to do that, here's how you work that program. And so there are some people who got that break. There are 100 plus homes that were not like for like or like plus 10% who did not get that break. I'm just wondering how people found out and how do we, if we're going to do this, we ought to do it for everybody. One of my big problems has always been, I want everybody to be treated equally. So if I'm going to give you a break over here, I want to make sure everybody's got an opportunity for that same break. And that's not what we're doing right now. So if you want to do it this way, I think we got to formalize that as part of your motion and put some instruction in place so people understand it's available and take advantage of it. Can we have Richard sort of maybe respond and give us some education? Certainly. Well, there are two issues at play here. So one is fee waivers and one, as Council Member Yearing brought up, are serial development. And serial development is not something that appears in the code. There is no code section in our municipal code that precludes somebody from opening up multiple projects on the same property. We do our best to try to get folks to condense things. And there's language in the city's LCP that says whenever feasible, a project shall be a single application. But we run into, there's not a tool basically in the code that forces folks into one application. And to get to Council Yearing's second point, we published a menu, if you will, when this fire rebuild program started. And in that menu, we outlined the different options for folks. And there were, I think, about four of them, if I'm not mistaken. And in there, we explained the process if somebody wanted to apply for a just putting the house back plus 10%, we explained what it was. It was actually at a flow chart. And then it went into, do you want to do an addition? If you want to do an addition, what does that trigger? And we explained what types of additional permitting were needed. And this went so far and was so detailed as to explain if that addition that they wanted to do would trigger either a public hearing or just kept it at a ministerial level. And I believe those forms are actually still on the city's fire rebuild webpage. It's a flow chart and like I said, a menu type. Okay. I think Paul, you had your hand up too. Yeah. I think Steve is pretty clear that he doesn't think it's appropriate for an additional project to come in five days later. And what I'd like to know is five weeks later, acceptable, five months later, a year later. Okay. I don't care what, look, whatever the rule is, I'm happy with the rule. My concern is I don't, I couldn't find this anywhere on the website. It seems to me that again, that what you voted on, what the council voted on was like for like or like plus 10%. It seems to me when someone does a project on a Monday and brings in another 1500 square feet addition on a Friday, that they were not planning to do a like for like or like plus 10%. 
right? I mean, and look, again, all I'm saying, I want everybody to be treated equally. If that's what we want to do, let's go back to those 100 people that built their house already and see, could they have qualified for that? I mean, or do we exclude them? And moving forward, just make sure everybody knows that that's available and can take advantage of it. That's all I want. Whatever the rules are, I'm happy with the rules. Richard, is it is it possible to bring that website up so we can take a look at it? I remember it, but I haven't looked at it in quite a while. Um, I Let me, what I can do is I think I can uh, perhaps screenshot it. Let, let me figure out how to do it and send it over to uh, Alex and see if we can get it up for you. Okay, and Bruce had a question in the meantime. Oh, you're muted, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, one, two things, one on the extension question and one on what Steve is raising. Uh, first of all, extension, I was a major advocate of the fee waiver program in the first place. I, I felt then and I feel now that anyone who had their home taken from them by the Woolsey Fire shouldn't have to pay to get a permission to put their house back where it was. Uh, and that's consistent with the fee waiver that exists now. The people who still haven't applied are actually the ones who most need the waiver. Um, the people, ironically, I mean, the people that already got their permits are the people who were well situated financially to be able to rebuild quickly because they either had money beyond the insurance, they were just, they don't need the insurance, it's good to have afterwards, or they had great insurance and their insurance company paid them. The people who still haven't rebuilt aren't, the decision as to whether they're going to get a free permit or have to pay for permit is not driving the boat. What's driving it is whether they're going to have the money to build their house. So they need this money. Um, so I fully support a, a, a further waiver. I would make it an indefinite waiver. I mean, it's not going to go to anyone who buys the property and builds. It's only for people whose primary residence is being rebuilt. And it's only if they're rebuilding the primary residence that they used to live in. So I never understood why there was a deadline in the first place. I think that it ought to be extended. I, um, I, I Steve, believe there was a, I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think there was a deadline because that was a negotiator originally um, with the Coastal Commission okay. to allow for us to do that, if I remember correctly. Okay, well, so to the extent that we're- I used to say no, but that was, maybe I'm to wrong. To the extent that we've yeah. got the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the reasons was is that we were um, not trying to bind future councils. Oh. So we didn't want to create a financial mm -hmm. provision that spread from budget year to budget year and then bind future councils. Um, so uh, that's the reason it just continue, you know, we have to keep renewing at this point. That makes it, that makes it. So the, the other point I want to make is Steve, I think what Steve's identifying is what I think of as a loophole. Um, it was intended that this fee waiver would be for anyone who's rebuilding the home they lost, give or take 10%. Um, but some smart developers or, or architects or, or, or builders have figured out that you can game that system and apply for your like for like rebuild, get the fee waived, and then afterwards apply for something more and it costs you less in, in permit fees. And it was never intended that if somebody decided they wanted to, I, I hate to use the word take advantage because no one's taking advantage of the fire, but someone who wants to build something completely different that wouldn't be like for like, we never intended, you never intended to waive the fees for them. Some people were smart enough to figure out how to do that in a serial manner. Others weren't smart enough to figure that out. I would suggest that if it, 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 council may want to say, fine, we don't have any objection to that because everybody's out at least the ability to put their house back. But if we did want to close that loophole, we could do that by simply saying you you have to pay back the you have to pay the fee if you ever ask to make your house more than 10 percent larger. I'm not advocating that, but I'm just saying that that would be a way to address what Steve is suggesting. OK, um, somebody else had their hand up, I thought. Was it you, Paul? Yeah, uh, I think that. I, I haven't looked at these and I don't know what the people are asking for, but I would imagine in most of these cases, it's somebody who's decided this is the right time to build a guest house. This is the right time to do something to their house, to the property that they've always wanted to do, and they're going to bite the bullet and do it now. And if, whether they bite it, the bullet and do it right now or do it six months from now, 
it shouldn't have any effect on whether or not they're they're able to build their house and and have the uh, get the waiver of the fees. And as far as the time limits go, the two, the two year time limit was ensconced in the language about fire rebuilds that we inherited from the county back when we incorporated. And it's been two years ever since. Thank you, uh, Steve. Yeah, again, I am not arguing whether we should do it or we shouldn't do it. I'll, I'll, my only point was when I looked it up, I didn't see that identified in the resolution. And this thing cost us, could be 600,000, 700,000, who the hell knows? And you know, and if if we w didn't intend to do that, some of that money would be nice to have next year. We want to do dark sky ordinances or look at the new skate park. I, so that money's gone. I'm, I'm, you can't go back and get it. But my only point is, if that's what we want to do, let's make sure everybody understands that's available to them and let them go do it. Treat everybody equally. That's all I want. Richard, what's your experience on that? When people come in, are is there two groups of people? Some that are trying to work it and some don't care. How, how does that go down in, in your world? There, there of course are some folks that are, are clever uh, as council member Silverstein brought up and they do try to game the system. Uh, we have roughly about 20 of these out of the little over 200 that we have seen so far. But a lot of it is exactly what council member Grisanti brought up, which is I've always wanted my pool over here, uh, a second unit. Uh, could I make my bedroom larger? Uh, these folks have gone through a horrible situation and you know they're trying to find something, a silver lining out of it. And the other thing that I also see that makes it a bit hard for us in the planning department is that we've done a lot of revisions because a lot of times, just like when you sit down to dinner, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. And what ends up happening is uh, there are a good number of these that come back, and perhaps Yolanda can help with this, that folks get under construction and realize they just don't have the funds to, to do that a wish list. And I should also say that in some cases uh, we found there were some folks who bought homes and they brought in proof to us in the form of the, uh, the home inspections when they bought the home. And these folks had paid for things that we could not find any approvals for. And in some cases, there were people who went beyond the 10%, but they're putting back exactly the same home. Uh, they're trying to obtain additional approvals. Uh, like there was one uh, woman that approached us who bought a house in Latigo that she paid for a basement. <laughs> it was part of the real estate ad. It was part of what the bank, of, uh, when they did the appraisal through the house and if they gave her the loan on her home. Uh, we could not find a permit for that basement. And so she's going beyond the 10% to put that basement back. But at the end of the day, it's going to look exactly the same to all the surrounding neighbors. And we also understand that was part of what the council was looking to do was put back the city the way it looked. So let, let me ask a question there because um, I have a great respect for how you're running the department, you and Alanda and then over uh, both of you. And do you, I know it's our decision, but do you see where you sit of oh, the way that we could fine tune this moving forward at this point without knowing, like, and I agree with Bruce that now are the people that really need help coming in because they've just, they've just suffered for so long. So I'm just, you're on the ground, you're, you're there every day seeing what's coming along. Is there, is there anything that you would have to say about that you and or Alanda? For us in our department, oh, I'm sorry, Yolanda, I'll let you speak. So let me uh, let me just speak to this because I am there every day, the families. And this is still a very, I know it has been more than two years, but this is a devastation that the families are never going to forget. I get emotional about this because I get to see it. I get to see that this inspiration um, that has been almost more than two years and they're still going through a process. And we have only issued 169 permits and I wish we had 488 and a lot more complete. I am just gonna be honest with you. We are not there yet. We're on the middle, we're in the middle of a rebuilding Malibu. It has been two and a half years, but this is pretty much very present and 
I don't think and no one can ever forgive what what they went through. Uh, I still meet with families that come in with a lot of emotions, frustrations because they haven't received the permits but also frustrations that they're having now to deal with an insurance company that are not able to get their funding back. Uh, there's all kinds of people and all kinds of families, right? There's uh, families that come in and they just want 400 square feet for a new uh, music studio that they are, that's gonna be their livelihood on the, when they retire. And that, that's what they're asking for. And there are some of them that they ha their family has grown and they want to have an extra room. Like in any circumstances and in any situation, you have two different perspectives. I think what I have seen is that, please, let's not forget what the community is going through. This is pretty much still, even though COVID just happened and we had a pandemic, but is, this is pretty much still a lot of what we're working on and making this our priority. Whatever decision is taken, please not, don't forget about the families. They, they, need, they need all of us. And I think that is just what I want to express to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alonda. I really appreciate that. Um, I would, wow, that was powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I was the one who brought forward the fee waiver originally, and I agree with you entirely. Um, one of the things I've noticed, and it, it came up today, is just because your house burned down doesn't mean the rest of your life doesn't happen. And um, the rest of your life can include insurance issues, illness, it, it goes on and on and on. Very painful journey, um, absolutely. Um, by the way, very excited to see a house in my neighborhood Looks like they're about ready to get their CEO of a CFO um, at the end of Paseo Canyon. So that they're they are so excited. I talked to them yesterday. They were literally beaming. They were so excited, and that house won't burn down. So um, personally, at this point, I'm inclined to continue the program as is um, and try and help people get back in their homes as best we can. But that's just my thought, and I'll listen to the other counselors and. See if we can head towards a motion or where we're going. Karen? Um, I, I want to start by saying I agree with parts of what everybody has said tonight. Um, and Yolanda, thank you. I, I know you deal with it personally every single day. Just from people I know, I've heard stories of things I could have never imagined about quotes they got, about their insurance, about somehow... Um, their lot size being in question, which doesn't seem possible, but you know, I've heard that too. So many things, um, and along with, like we said, death, illness, pandemic, th this, is, this is just one compound and complex problem after another. And Steve, I understand what you're saying about the trade-off with revenue. Um, but I think as a community, I, I don't think it's wrong to put people who've lost their homes to the Woolsey fire uh, as a priority. I know we have a lot of things the city wants to accomplish and they take money, um, but we're not through this yet at all. Like Yolanda said, we're not nearly through it. Um, so I, you know, I appreciate the fact that this was laid out to us with three options, you know, and I don't know if we want to get into a discussion of the merits of the three options in this staff report, but I too feel it's important to continue this. And, and again, I fully understand that there will be revenue not coming in. There will be programs that get delayed or decreased but I feel this is important. And, and I think we all pretty much feel the same way on this. Maybe, maybe I don't need to keep talking. So that's all I wanted to say. You're muted, Mikey. 
just wonder why no one's answering. I think Paul had his hand up, then Steve, as I remember. Sorry. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt option number one and extend the existing guidelines to deadlines to June the 30th, 2021 and December 31st, 2021, respectively. I'll second that. I'd like to offer a friendly amendment if I could. Sure. sure. Because of where the insurance rebuilds are right now, I'd like to uh, make that extension actually for a year. Um, okay. Because I think just from talking to a lot of the people in this situation now, it's getting there, but they're not there. And I think we're six months, we're just gonna come back and deal with the same situation again, is, is my feeling. I accept the amendment. Okay, and Steve, sorry. Your no, Mikey, I just, are we gonna put something out to let people know that this serial process is something they should really take a look at because it can save a lot of money. And I would recommend because we're going to come back to you with the resolution, right? We're going to draft this resolution. If there's anything else along those lines that you would like us to include, um, we could certainly do that, but now would be a, a great time to let us know um, if we're simply extending what we had, or if, count, as Council Member Uring has said, um, you would like us to include something else. I I, I would say yes, in the sense because the ones I've encountered are older homes that burn down. That it's it's sort of what I think Yolanda said. They're rebuilding and going well. You know what? Now maybe we can we can get it right, and that doesn't bother me because these been just through so much. I ordinarily I understand what you're saying, Steve, and, and you said it to me in a way when we had a conversation that I, it really resonated what you were saying. So I appreciate what you're saying, um, but I, yeah, I would I I just think these are the people that really need the help most, and if they want to build a little bit more, I'm not. It's not bothering me. Personally. Mike, I'm not arguing. I, I, and I like no, I'm just. I, no, my, you brought up a good point there. You brought up a great point. My concern is make sure everybody put it as part of the resolution so people know it's available. So okay. that's all my concern is. Okay, um, Bruce. Well, may I wonder if maybe we could bring back at another at a future meeting and, and the concept of applying a credit of a certain amount of money towards whatever your permit is. Like you know, the, it, it would be equivalent to what it would have cost you to get a permit to do a like for like rebuild. But if you're doing something more extraordinary, you still get that base credit. Now, I don't know how that would impact what's already occurred. I don't know how many non like for likes have already been approved and how much that would set us back if we did that retroactively. And it kind of is unfair to do it going forward for people and other people didn't get it. But maybe we can have a discussion of that and find out what the financial consequences are. Is that is that is that possible, Richard? Is or Yolanda? Or I'm sure you didn't exactly put together stats that way. Is my, what I'm thinking. So I'm not. No, but I, I just to be clear, if I may, uh, to ask uh, Councilmember uh, Silverstein, if I could just be clear, was his question to say credit the like for like plus ten and then charge them for the addition? Yeah. Or was, That's okay. What we're doing. Okay. We would charge. No, no, no. But I mean, I mean, if, if you came in with a double the size house initial proposal, there still would have been a certain fee you would have had to pay if you did a like for like, which is less than the fee you're going to be charged to do your larger home remodel. So you'd get a credit of the like for like base fee towards the ultimate fee that you have to pay for the larger home. Okay. So well, what if they're what if they're separate structures? How does that work? Same. Same. Yeah. So basically we're saying, that, again, that everybody coming in would get a discount for the like for like portion of whatever they're building, and then they pay on top of that. That, that would be the program, I think, right? Is that what we're talking about? Well, I'm uh, just saying maybe we should have that discussion at a future date, but we shouldn't lose track of it. Okay, Paul? I think, I think if they're in the, in the situation where they haven't been able to rebuild yet, it's unlikely that when they finally do get money, they're going to have enough extra money to make their house much bigger. I don't think that's I don't think that's the case, Paul. There are people that are fighting over millions of dollars. They, they have nothing by way of recovery yet from SCE, and they're fighting over millions of dollars. And once they get the recovery, they're going to be in a good position. But right now, they've got nothing. They can't do any rebuilding of any sort. 
Yeah, it's hard for us to know all those yeah. details on each property. Um, and uh, Steve, I think your hand was up. I'm just saying, I, I, you know, I'd like to make a friendly amendment then that we include this process of being able to do the serial development piece for everybody. Right? Just make it, if that's what we're going to do, you, everybody knows it's there, can take advantage of it. So are you also recommending that that be retroactive? Uh, um, that's something you guys got to think about. You, gotta, uh, you know, you got people that didn't get a chance to do that. And whether that's fair or not, I don't know. I'm not recommending we go back because I have no idea what that's going to cost you. And I don't, I wouldn't hazard a guess at this point. Right. That's not something we looked at at all. No idea. Uh, Paul? I think that the council that voted for the original program was pretty clear that they wanted the limitation. And I think it's uh, if we want to do something else going forward, it's it's our right to do that. We have the capability to do that. But uh, I think and, and maybe there's a great reason why we should go back and to those people, but I think that the only reason this program got approved in the first place was because it was limited. If it hadn't been limited in square footage, it never would have been approved by the council two years ago, right yeah. after the fire. So. Or what do you recommend? I'm not sure I know where you're going with that. Yeah, I mean, I'm with, I'm with you. I'm, I'm recommending we continue this, this uh, program the same as it's been. And I'm recommending that we accept it, that we're going to do it for another year, which was Mikey's alteration. And if you want to add something that lets people know that there is an option out there, that if you want to build your, your house so that you can add another bedroom onto it with a separate permit that you apply for a week later, that's okay with us as long as you pay for the separate permit. Karen? That option has always been available. Not everybody has either identified it or chosen to take it. Or been capable um, of taking it. Any of those. Um, I, I, I don't, I can't see how we could legally limit anybody in the future uh, if, uh, if they want to build on in the future and, and that property uh, allows for that um you know look at we made it clear that this was for original owners only um i would never refer to them as developers so uh i i think our intent has been i think in the right place and and like richard said that option has always been there so i agree with paul i think it's okay to to uh to have it remain as is and and extend it for a year, I, I, and I don't have a problem. As so you you just want a notification of I just want people to know that if they want to, if this is available to them. spell it out. That's yeah. all. So maybe more clarity on the flow chart we saw earlier, yeah, and something in the resolution that says if you do it that way, you'll get your 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 like for like fees waived. Bruce? Well, I think I think we can. I mean, if, to accomplish what Steve's asking for, and it makes sense. I think we can trust the staff if we just give them direction to let people know that this is the way they ought to do it. Because it's like when you go to a diner and you order something, and the waitress says to you, or the server says to you, "You can do it a different way, and it'll cost you less money, and get the same thing." I think that that's just something the staff can explain to people when they come in with their permit. And yeah. maybe it's maybe it ends up for a few people being a little bit of a a perk for what they've been through, um, that they're able to, you know, I don't know what they're able to, I'm not sure what it is, but you know, glad, be glad to be any part of helping them rebuild their home. All right. So have we clarified the motion and the second? So are we going to do anything in the resolution dealing with an explanation of this serial development piece? That's the only question I have. I'm not against it. I'm not sure how we want to word it exactly. Do you have a Do you have a proposal in the wording? No, I mean it's got the resolution's got to come back to us, and maybe Richard and Lisa can put together some language in there that does that. Because I'd like go. to see him come back with that, and and probably some numbers around what this is going to cost us. So at least we've got some idea of that, right? We can do that. That's what I would recommend. Okay. 
Okay, we have a motion and a second, and uh, can we have roll call then? Yes, uh, Councilmember Ferrer, I don't t totally recall you seconded the motion. Did you approve the friendly amendment from Mayor Pearson to extend it a year? Yes. Then Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Um, I know we have a big item coming up, so I think now we'll do, uh, we'll be back at nine o'clock, everybody. Thanks for everyone's patience, and uh, we'll see you all in a little bit. And city councilors, turn off your videos and mute, please.
Okay. Okay, one, two. Looks like everybody's back, I think. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, we are on to item 6A, the Big Rock Mesa Landslide Status and Development Review. Um, I know we have a report, and I know we have public speakers. <laughs> yes. Good evening, City Council. On November 9, 2020, the City Council directed staff to bring back a review of the safety factor and development impacts in the Big Rock area. This evening, presentations will be done by the City's geotechnical consultants, Con Shires and Associates, and Geo Geodynamics Inc. They're going to be represented by Michael Phipps and Lauren Doyle. Thank you. Good evening. Let me know when it's time to start. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Lauren, and you are free to go when you're ready. Okay, thank you so much. Good evening, City Council members, uh, citizens of Malibu, uh, city staff, and whomever else has joined us. Uh, my name is Lauren Doyle, and I am uh, a licensed civil and geotechnical engineer. And I am part of the City Geotechnical Consulting Team of Cotton Shires and Associates in Geodynamics. And we provide a peer review for land development uh, in the city of Malibu. Uh, Mike Phipps is going to co-present with me. He's a licensed geologist and engineering geologist. He's the principal of Cotton Shires Associates. And we also have Chris Dean with us tonight who is <clears throat> active in the role of city geologist um, he is also a licensed ge uh, geologist and uh, engineering geologist. Um, we are representing the city's consultants, although uh, our team is much more than just the three of us. And all of us have over 30 years of experience um, within the city of Malibu and in Southern California engineering geology. Um, and all of us have been with the city serving the city and its citizens. Uh, since the 90s or so. Um, our experience is in engineering geology, landslides, forensic analysis, and peer development review. We're duly licensed professionals, and our licensure requires an ethical dedication to public safety as the basis of our profession. Uh, our job is to provide the best technical analysis and review that our experience, education, and profession um, provides us to the city uh, with respect to development review. So uh, how did we come to be presenting tonight? Next slide, please. I'm sorry, next slide after that. Thanks. Uh, the city council directed us to bring back a review of the factor of safety um, what we know about that with respect to Big Rock Mesa landslide and also the development impacts um, on the Big Rock Mesa landslide in that area. Uh, Big Rock Mesa is one of three landslide assessment districts within the city of Malibu. Uh, it's one of over 90 historically active landslides that has development on or around it. Um, the uh, impetus for this presentation for the city council report, uh, the memos that we've written and this presentation is uh, the Yay and Associates uh, presentation of the Big Rock Mesa Assessment District Report and concerns raised by the homeowners, uh, not only in relationship to the report, but also uh, in relationship to a couple of controversial development projects that are proposed. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so we're gonna talk about um, the landslide factor of safety, what we know, how we do development review, and uh, what we can infer from all of that as to the, what the current factor of safety is. And we will also be adding some commentary on um, what we think is um, some prudent actions. Um, it's a historically active landslide. It occasionally creeps. It's got a dewatering system that's meant to lower and control the groundwater level 
and that sole purpose is to increase the factor of safety. Um, in 1992, a landmark study was done um, that modeled the landslide. And based on the information presented there and also in the landslide assessment district reports and current data, that conditions are similar in 2019 as they were in 1992 when Bing Yang completed the study, similar or better. So from that, we infer that the factor of safety on average is similar to that presented in the 1992 BYA study. In that study and the landslide assessment district reports, as well as other professional technical papers, the recommendation in order to increase the factor of safety on Big Rock Mesa is to add additional dewatering as the most effective way to increase the factor of safety and limit episodic creek movement. Next slide, please. Next slide. So one of the questions that came to us from the homeowners is what is factor of safety and how do you determine that? Okay, so in the most basic sense, a factor of safety is the ratio of forces that are resisting movement, holding the hill in place, versus driving forces, forces that want to make the slide or make the slope fall down the hill. When you have a factor of safety of one, that means that those forces are balanced and you are either slightly creeping or the slide has failed. Next slide. So how do we evaluate this uh, factor of safety? We do it using slope stability in which we evaluate a cross section of the hillside and we put all those factors, we model it, we put it into a computer analysis, it divides up the forces, um, uh, calculates the interacting forces in the slide and comes out with a ratio of driving forces versus resisting forces. Next slide. So what are the factors that um, you put into a slope stability analysis? One, you put in the landslide shape, Two, you describe the material of the landslide and its strength characteristics. And three, most importantly, you define the groundwater. Where is it? What affects the groundwater? <clears throat> and these three um, factors go into slope stability analysis. Next slide. So the landslide shape. This is typically well-defined, particularly for a slide like Big Rock Mesa, which is a historic slide. And you define the landslide shape based on geologic mapping and subsurface exploration, which is done by experienced engineering geologists and geotechnical engineers. Next slide. The next thing, while you're out there mapping and exploring the slide, you take samples and you determine what type of material is out there. And through laboratory testing, you can determine the density characteristics of the material out there, how it's distributed based on geologic mapping and drilling. And then you can also do tests to determine the soil shear strength, right? Both within the slide, how strong is the material, and both along the base of the slide as well. The shear strength along the base of the slide can also be determined by modeling factors at known specific times. Um, and determine what the shear strength is. That's fine, next slide. So the next uh, most important factor is groundwater. Groundwater as adding weight to the slide and also groundwater as pressure that not only pushes up on the base of the slide, but also when it's in the slide may try and force the particles of soil apart and reduce friction, right? Friction like sandpaper when you're trying to rub something and uh, move something down a sandpaper slope, friction holds things in place. When you reduce friction via pore pressure, you reduce the stability. It's kind of, to imagine it, it's like a floating boat um, uh, scenario. When you've got your boat on your trailer hitch and it's just sitting on the hitch and you're out of the water, the friction between the boat and the trailer hitch holds the boat in place. But once water starts coming up underneath the boat and pushing on the bottom of the boat, which in this case is analogous to the landslide plane, the boat starts to float, right? And it will move off the trailer hitch down into the water. 
So this is a brief uh, discussion of slope stability. So next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, this is a picture of um, that, that was a picture of, uh, of um, Big Rock Mesa landslide in 1986, shortly after it was reactivated, and then some of the geologic mapping that occurred. This is a picture, um, it's a map of the landslide assessment district. Outlined in blue is the main slide mass, and this shows some historical information. Um, if you click again, thank you. Um, the green dots are the fire rebuilds um, that represent um, the rebuilding of homes after the 1993 Topanga, Old Topanga fire. And the red numbers were presented by Ye and Associates in their uh, assessment district um, report uh, presentation. And this is the groundwater level change between 1983 when the slide was reactivated and currently. So if you look at this, you can see the groundwater levels are between 62 and 150 feet roughly below where they were in 1983. Next slide, please. Uh, this was a graphic that was presented in the uh, city council report. And in this, uh, it presents um, a brief history of the development of the slide, which can be uh, <clears throat> more certainly seen in the city council report. And what this shows is that um, over time, the slide has crept in response to high rainfall years. And uh, since 1983, when the slide was activated in 1986, um, the county hired uh, Dennis Evans Associates to start uh, installing monitoring and dewatering wells and uh, sloping clinometer monitoring to monitor how the slide was moving. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, in ninth, in no, back up, please. Thank you. In 1988, uh, the county improvement district that was formed hired Bing Yen and Associates to do a study of the landslide. And if you remember, the previous slide of the factors that went into slope stability, their job was to map and define the landslide shape, sample it so they could get parameters to model the landslide and determine what the groundwater, where it was and, and how it changed. Um, they took these factors and they put them in and they modeled two-dimensional and three-dimensional uh, stability analysis by region and for the entire landslide using the history of movement. And they came up with a factor of safety summary provided for different regions under different conditions. And that was presented in table 7.6 in the uh, city council report. Next slide. So during the BYA study, they performed some parametric studies and developed some predictive relationships um, that are shown here. Uh, and out of these relationships and out of their model, they came up with stability results that are presented in a series of tables. Um, since 1983, uh, the reactivation, the main mode of movement of this landslide, as they concluded, was creep. Uh, they also concluded that the hydrogeology is complex, the watering is not uniform across the landslide, and the factor of safety can and does change based on water input. Next slide. Here's some of the predictive relationships that are presented in the report, and I presented the groundwater rise fall versus factor of safety in the city council report. Next slide. So since the 1983 slide, the groundwater level has dropped, um, as I said, between 50 to 150 feet. Um, here are the regions that were modeled um, in the slide. And if we look at where the groundwater level is right now, next slide. Next slide. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, this is a geologic backup. 
thank you. This is a geologic model of, um, this is a geologic map of the slide showing the slide limits, and we're going to look at what the groundwater change has been along cross section A outlined in red there um, up through the Eastern Mesa. Next slide. And here's how the groundwater levels have changed over time. This was presented in the Yay and Associates uh, report, but I, uh, presentation, but I thought it was worthwhile showing here. The dashed blue line is where the water levels were in 1983. The solid blue, light blue line is where it was in about 1990 when they were modeling the slide at the time and came up with the factors of safety. And the dashed red line is where groundwater levels are now throughout this, um, throughout uh, the Eastern Mesa. And essentially, overall, Bing Yen and Associates study concluded that the factor of safety was somewhere around 1.2 to 1.25 based on 1990-92 groundwater levels. Based on that, and the fact that the groundwater levels are lower, we can infer that there is a similar factor of safety or slightly better currently. Now Mike is gonna talk about development review process in Malibu. Let's next go to the slide. next slide. And actually we can just keep going through uh, next slide, please. So good evening. Um, the city of Malibu has utilized a geotechnical peer review process uh, ever since the city incorporated. And a um, couple things I wanna touch upon here. The review process is performed by experienced senior personnel. Uh, we have licenses are equivalent to the people that are preparing the reports, uh, typically a, a civil engineer specializing in soils engineering, a geotechnical engineer, um, and a certified engineering geologist. Um, <clears throat> you know, the purpose of this peer review that we do is to ensure that potential geotechnical hazards are identified and mitigated. Um, so we, we do this peer review, you know, by requiring geotechnical reports, we review them. Um, and then we, you know, we will ask appropriate technical questions related to the development project that we're looking at. This is all done within the framework of the city's codes and ordinances and guidelines. Um, the, the primary purpose of this peer review is to assist the city in protecting public safety and reducing public liability as well as private property owner liability and ultimately limiting losses. Um, our review process really occurs in two stages. We look at things in the planning stage initially, and that is uh, reviewing the project for feasibility and making sure that hazards are identified and uh, that the project um, can be done in conformance with the uh, local coastal plan as well as the Malibu Municipal Code. Um, once a project is approved in the planning stage, we will look at it again in the building plan check stage, uh, which is more of an engineering design level review, looking at foundation details and, and things like that. Um, it's important to note that um, our review is, is done uh, along with and in coordination with uh, the Environmental Health Division of ESD, and that's looking at the wastewater treatment systems and the Public Works Department, um, who's looking at, they may be looking at grading or they may be looking at drainage and stormwater, um, you know, because the biggest concerns in places like Big Rock Mesa are water going into the ground from the wastewater treatment systems and from surface drainage. So we coordinate our reviews um, with those departments and making sure that uh, uh, everything has been taken care of as best it can be. Uh, next slide. So the regulations and policies that uh, are in effect that kind of guide the review include the following. Um, the city has had guidelines for geotechnical reports since shortly after incorporating and those have been uh, refined many times over the years. Uh, the latest version is 2013, uh, and those guidelines have been consistently adopted by the city council. Uh, we have the local coastal program uh, from 2002 forward, uh, which establishes planning policies and development standards. Um, and then we have the California Building Code, which uh, current version is 2019, and that establishes building and safety policies. Uh, so 
the California Building Code is adopted and amended by Los Angeles County um, as Title 26 of the LA County Code, and then Malibu uh, adopts and amends the LA County Code as the Malibu uh, in the Malibu Municipal Code. Um, there are some particular code sections that I want to talk about, um, particularly Section 110 and 111 of the Los Angeles County Code. 110 has to do with prohibited uses of building sites, and 111 has to do with uh, when uh, engineering geology and soils engineering reports are required. Um, the applicability of these code sections uh, will depend on project types, the location of the site, and what the findings are uh, in the geotechnical reports. Uh, next slide, please. So the types of projects that uh, we might see, not only in Big Rock Mesa, but all over the city, um, and you know, this may or may not be on, on a site that's uh, been mapped as a landslide. Um, we've seen a couple of new construction applications um, up in Big Rock Mesa, and the issue with those is that they have to comply with uh, uh, LIP or uh, section 9.4 with regard to factor safety. Um, and because the factor safety is below 1.5 in Big Rock Mesa, it's generally not possible to comply with that section. And therefore, those development applications have been pursued uh, under variances under Chapter 13. Um, we also see uh, remodel projects, additions to existing structures, <clears throat> swimming pools and spas, um, repairs to existing structures, um, in some cases, uh, some minor remedial grading. And then we also see uh, requests for repairs and upgrades to on-site wastewater treatment systems. Next slide. So uh, LA County Code Section 111 establishes uh, requirements for geotechnical reports. So this is basically the, the basis for um, uh, what the report should contain. Um, and rather than read this, I just wanted to call out some, some key words here. Um, you know, reports are required for just about any development project in Malibu. Um, other than, you know, there, there, are, there are some exceptions. But uh, when we require a report, um, it's because these reports are essential for the evaluation of the safety of the site. And there are some specific findings that are required to be made in these reports. And this is what we're reviewing for. Um, the consultants have to uh, make findings regarding the safety of the site of the proposed work against hazard from landslide settlement or slippage. Um, and they also have to make a finding regarding the effect that this work will have on the stability of the area outside of the project area. And these reports, uh, as I mentioned before, are required to be prepared by uh, licensed uh, engineering geologists and soils engineers or geotechnical engineers. So I want you to remember those key statements, which are uh, all, all focused on safety. And when we're talking about safety, we're talking about life safety, which is what the code is about. Um, you know, life safety has to do with uh, whether a hazard is going to endanger the health or safety of the occupants of a, of a, of a, a building, the adjoining property or the public. Um, next slide. So a lot of these, well, let me back up. So the, the statements that are required to be made in section 111 of the code um, become a problem when you have a site on a, on a historically active landslide such as Big Rock Mesa. Um, in Big Rock Mesa, as well as on other landslides that have homes on them in Malibu, um, the consultants end up having to um, make a different statement because an unqualified statement is usually not possible uh, because they're on a historically active landslide. It's, consultant can't say um, this site won't be subject to hazard of, of landslide when it's on a landslide. So um, in those situations, uh, we require that the consultants demonstrate um, a few other things and this is also in the code, uh, that the structure is not at risk and that the site is safe for the intended use, which again speaks to life safety. Um, 
LA County Code Section 110 covers uh, the topic of geotechnical hazards and prohibited uses of building sites. And the foundation uh, of this code section is this area that I highlighted in yellow. Uh, no building or grading permit shall be issued under the provisions of this section when the building official finds a property outside the site of the scope of, of the proposed work could be damaged by activation or acceleration of a geotechnically hazardous condition. And such activation or acceleration could be attributed to the proposed work on or change in use of the site for which the permit is requested. Now that's a mouthful, um, but it basically says the proposed project should not, you know, increase the risk or increase the safety issue on a specific site. And when I say risk, it's a risk to the property itself and to the property surrounding it. Um, so with that code foundation, uh, we move on to the next section about what is allowed if we if we have a site that's too technically hazardous um, it, and it is subject to landslide settlement or slippage. The code says, um, you know, work requiring a building or grading permit is not permitted in an area determined to be subject to hazard from landslide settlement or slippage, but there are exceptions and I wanted to walk you through what some of those are. Um, next slide. So um, going back to sort of the, the foundation of the code, which is you can't do something that's going to increase the risk or accelerate a hazardous condition. Um, those are the provisions of 110.2.1. Um, you can do a project if you can eliminate the hazard. So this is possible on some sites that have small landslides um, or landslides that aren't very deep and you can mitigate them with, with some type of grading or structural solution. So hazard can be eliminated, that's one possibility. Um, if the hazard can't be eliminated, um, a project can be approved if the site is demonstrated to be safe for the intended use. So again, that goes to life safety issue. Um, there are other categories of projects that require qualitative or conditional findings that the proposed work complies with uh, that foundation of the code, which is do not accelerate the hazard and do not exacerbate uh, the hazard such that it could affect your neighbors. Um, so there are code sections that cover alterations and repairs with cost uh, less than 25% of the market value of the house. Um, there's a section with cost greater than 25% of market value. Uh, there's a section covering room additions that are, uh, cannot exceed more than 25% of the floor area with no change in use or occupancy of, of the property. Um, there's a section covering uh, replacement of structures that are destroyed by causes other than landslide, settlement, or slippage, such as a fire. Uh, so this, this code section um, is really being applied to some Woolsey fire projects now, and these were also applied to the uh, 1993 Malibu Old Topanga fire um, and there's a 10 year time limit in the code in that section, which is why the fire rebuild guidelines from 1993 were uh, sunsetted by, by the building official about 2003 or so. Um, there's also a code section that allows for one story detached light frame non habitable structures that are less than 400 square feet. So this could be uh, garages, carports, patio covers, decks, storage sheds, those types of projects. Um, so I just, I'm presenting this to you so that it's clear that um, the city's building code allows for uh, these types of projects to be um, submitted and reviewed and potentially approved, provided that um, uh, our group as the reviewers on behalf of the city are, are satisfied with the statements that are made and um, and what they're required to back that up. I mean, these consultants, um, they, you know, they not only have to make 111 statements, um, when they're talking about the project in the reports, they have to indicate the level of, of mitigation that's being provided depending on what the project is. Um, and that could range from deep foundation systems, uh, stiffened structures, um, grading, drainage recommendations. Um, they have to present this in the report to the property owner so that they know 
um, you know, what mitigation has been provided and what risks remain. Um, and, you know, those remaining risks are what could be the potential extent of damage. Um, the consultant has to make the property owner fully aware of what those risks are. Um, and then the property owner, uh, all of these code sections require the property owner to um, sign an assumption of risk, acknowledging what those hazards and risks are um, and assuming the risks. So that, you know, this is also what people call the waiver, but it's not just, uh, it's, not, it's not just waving things away, it's acknowledging and being told what your risks are. Um, the consultants are also required to make a lot of specific recommendations regarding foundations and utility lines and wastewater disposal and surface and subsurface drainage. Those are all of the key things that, uh, that we focus on. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Lauren now. You're muted, Lauren. Did I successfully unmute myself? Yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> um, so what you're looking at here is an aerial oblique photo um, from pre-development time of Big Rock Mesa. And you can notice that the Mesa um, looks like a big bowl, which is, um, at one time was debated in the 60s by the LA County geologists, but later came to be recognized as uh, an ancient landslide. Next slide. So Mike talked about uh, land development review, both generally and also specifically uh, for projects on landslides. I'm not going to go over the types of projects down below, but I will tell you that when we are reviewing projects under the code sections that Mike discussed um, on anywhere, but also on landslides, including Big Rock Mesa, we are focused on no additional water infiltration into the landslide. Why? Because we know that water infiltration into the landslide could cause the groundwater level to rise and may either individually or cumulatively uh, add to destabilization of the landslide. You're not allowed to change the risk in property to the property or surrounding properties. And again, you have to have a finding of safe for intended use. So the types of developments um, are listed here. In addition um, to what Mike discussed, there were about 47 to 50 homes that were rebuilt on Big Rock Mesa uh, under those code sections as a result of the 1993 old Topanga fire. Next slide. But we do have problems because uh, in Malibu, as elsewhere, oftentimes there's unpermitted development and after the fact changes that actually um, contradict the recommendations that are made by their geotechnical engineers. And, and once the permit is signed off, uh, it's very difficult to, to catch these changes. Um, the significance uh, on Big Rock Mesa landslide is, and on other landslides, is some homeowners don't understand the significance of living on a landslide and how their activities could affect it. Uh, the impacts of groundwater, lush landscaping, and uncontrolled surface drainage, bootleg remodels, additions, ADUs. Uh, we have found that some people take their 400 square foot garages and turn them into an accessory dwelling unit people adding unpermitted plumbing fixtures, exceeding what was reviewed and evaluated and approved, uh, illegal connections uh, for these illegal units to existing wastewater treatment systems. And occasionally, although I don't think I've ever seen it on Big Rock myself, in other places I've seen it in Malibu, unpermitted on-site wastewater treatment systems that have been uh, installed. Next slide. So what we were asked to, to look at what were the effects of, of the permitted development that, that has occurred. Um, we address the potential change in water consumption in development review because we know rise in groundwater level could decrease stability. And as Mike discussed, it's also required by the codes. Um, on Big Rock Mesa, 
part of uh, what contributes to the infiltration is a change in water usage um, by existing development. Uh, and this includes uh, an increase in water usage during the 1993 fire rebuild um, period, which extended generally through 2001, although a handful of homes were built after that. And existing development usage patterns, you know, both existing, permitted, and unpermitted. And also the change in uh, response to rainfall um, as a result. Uh, with respect to the cumulative effects of development, uh, in particular since 1992, since cityhood, um, the goal of the geologic review is to not only adhere to city codes and guidelines, um, but also to evaluate what is the effect uh, on stability of the slide. Uh, here are some of the um, effects that people have mentioned to us and that, that also get considered uh, both in the professional reports and technical papers. The structure weight, you're adding a structure to the slide. Well, typically these structures are negligible or if they're involving basements or removal of material, it can remove weight. When you add <clears throat> impermeable land coverage, like pavement and houses and things like that, that actually prevents rainfall infiltration into the landslide. It's a form of passive dewatering. And there's a, a net benefit to the stability because you're reducing water infiltration. Other improvements uh, related to development include uh, rain gutters, drainage improvement, um, uh, landscaping that is on uh, moisture sensors, um, redirecting water to close drain storm systems that take the water off the slide rather than allowing it to infiltrate into it. Um, the biggest effect of, of, of development, um, permitted and unpermitted, uh, can be the on-site wastewater treatment system effluent. And there's various studies in the city of Malibu that uh, talk about um, uh, how many gallons per day each household uses. Um, but m for the most part, uh, the development approved uh, has to have a net neutral or a net positive effect, right? Or else it won't meet the codes. Uh, for on-site wastewater treatment systems, seepage pits infiltrate into the landslide. We don't allow an increase in effluent flow uh, drip dispersal systems where they can be installed, uh, get rid of the effluent via evapotranspiration, and that has a minimal infiltration into the landslide. It's a, it's a net benefit from any seepage pits. Shallow leach lines, uh, probably mixed benefit um, there, but, but these are the types of, of, of effects of existing permitted development uh, on the slide and under our review, we um, try to have a net neutral or net positive effect. And these are the things we evaluate for. Next slide. So one of, one of the questions is always, well, how do we increase the factor of safety, right? And what you're reading is a quote from the Bing Yen study, 1992. The stability of the Big Rock Mesa area needs additional mitigation measures. Uh, every technical paper, every landslide assessment district report, the 1992 BYA report, um, the 1992 Slauson paper <clears throat> quoted in the city um, council report. Um, and, and these improvements really come back to the homeowners and the assessment district, right? Um, what can be done with the assessment district funds, what should be done, and how much more are people willing to do. Um, next slide. So these are some of the actions to improve factor of safety uh, on the Big Rock Mesa landslide, and I've ordered them in, in, in order of a likely effectiveness. Uh, if you can't put in a package treatment plant, to take all the homes off on-site wastewater treatment systems, these are the next best things you can do. Increase dewatering capability, that's an active measure. Reduce water infiltration. You could install sewers. There are things that private uh, 
maybe the homeowners association can do. There's public development control. You can reduce water consumption um, and require low flow fixtures, as an example. Or in the extreme, you can <clears throat> have no construction. Uh, any vacant lots can be purchased. <clears throat> or, as some homeowners have suggested, you can have a moratorium. But each action has an inherent cost versus benefit and has limits to it, right? And some of these actions will have greater effect than others, but none are guaranteed to ever prevent any movement in the future. Next slide. Uh, here were some of the things that Bing Yen and Associates did in their study. They did a rain gutter survey to see how many homes had um, gutters that directed um, the, the surface drainage out to the street and off the slide. Next slide. They also did an evaluation of, of, of vegetation out there, and, and this was an indication of where things were being watered or potentially overwatered, where you had lush landscaping. There's a lot of water going into the ground. Next slide. Those are just two examples. <clears throat> so in conclusion, <clears throat> what do we know about the factor of safety? Well. We can use the BYA 1992 geotechnical evaluation as a useful guide, right? They estimated the factor of safety in 1992 um, on the order of, you see the 1.0, that's really in a small subslide area that doesn't affect the main slide. Mostly it's between 1.2 and 1.25, as summarized on table six, seven dash six. The factors of safety are likely similar in 2020 based on groundwater conditions and water usage. Uh, the Bing Yan report did conclude that regional creep locally, the slide is made up of several different component sub areas. Regional creep can and does occur when factors of safety dip below 1.2. Um, factors of safety are transient. They are groundwater dependent and additional mitigation is needed. Almost every technical report you'll ever read says that. So what's the goal? The goal is to increase the margin of safety against the potential reactivation of the landslide in the area by actively lowering groundwater levels through whatever means possible. But you want to take the most effective measures first. Next slide. So right now, uh, pretty much the landslide as in 1992, Status quo or a little bit better, because if you recall, the groundwater levels are actually lower than they were in 1992 when Bing <laughs> evaluated the factor of safety. Yay and Associates, as the Landslide Assessment District Engineer, has recommended capital improvements. They're sound and consistent with the 1992 study recommendations. The Big Rock Mesa Homeowners Association and Dewatering Committee could consider actions within their purview to improve active and passive dewatering of Big Rock Mesa. And I have to tell you, it, as a former assessment district engineer, it heartens me to see so much interest because homeowners are key. And it's a great improvement over the years in early 2000s when uh, we would have Jovanna and maybe three or four other people attend our presentations um, or ask us questions about the reports we produced. Um, the current development review does consider cumulative groundwater effects and the effect of, of development on the groundwater table. Uh, the city should review development standards and revise them as needed. It's a good time to do that. Groundwater levels are low, rainfall is low, and homeowner interest is high. So we're here to help. We're here to provide our best technical information and, and professional opinions, and Yay and Associates is too. And uh, we look forward to answering any questions um, that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, some great information there. Let's go to the public speakers. And maybe, I think you've answered, I got this actually, much larger list than I realized of questions from there from the community. Um, but I think you've answered a number of them along the way, which is very helpful. 
So, but maybe as, as speakers uh, speak, you can jot down some questions to answer when we get through the speakers, if that's okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, who do we have uh, to speak? You have 22 speakers. I'm gonna read them all in order and then call them one by one to speak. Okay, thank you. They are Don Michael, Mary Lou Hamill, Dee Dee Graves, Rosemary Eyed, Jim Petula, Hak Wong, Michael Paul, Georgia Goldfar, Don, Kla Don Klauski, uh, Christopher Cunningham, Eric Sousa, Joe Drummond, Colin Drummond, Norman Haney, Scott Dietrich, John Congdon, Craig Hill, uh, Reza Nababi, uh, Maryam Akbar, Jared Cohen, Marissa Coughlin, and Nora Cohen. The first speaker is Don Michael. Okay, hang on. Just I just want to preface this with I had a, a conversation with the neighborhood and tried to make an informal deal on letting uh, Don Michael and and uh, Don. I'm forgetting the other Don's last name. I apologize. Yes, thank you. Each have eight minutes um, in exchange for not having as many neighbors speak. But it looks like the neighbors want to speak, so I'm still going to hold my end of the bargain and um, give them each eight the two Don's eight minutes each, and uh, of course, we'll hear the other speakers. So I just wanted to say that before we get going. And Don, you are up. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yes. We'll turn, oh, there it goes, your time's at eight minutes. Uh, I don't know if uh, you can see uh, my, I I don't think we see anything. Did you uh, did you have a presentation? He muted himself, Mike. Oh, he did. Been mute. He's been muted anyway. Uh, without without being able to uh, show anything in the screen, um, appreciate eight minutes to try and respond to a, uh, a very nice presentation by Lauren and uh, uh, Mike Fitz. Uh, that took over a half hour. But anyway, I'll try and do my best. I have submitted a February 23rd dated comments in detail and in uh, four pages, uh, which I hope you will uh, make a part of the record. In any event, I regard the evidence of peripheral cracks at the edges of the Big Rock Mesa, a landslide debris mass, as observed in my report of November 20, 2018, as unequivocally indicative of a low safety factor of the entire mass, because I know of no reasonable mechanism which would cause uh, that kind of peripheral cracking uh, to uh, occur otherwise. Absent some radical change in physical conditions which could provide the basis for calculating a similar resulting change in the safety factor, uh, such, cha such changes occur only very gradually, and none is known to have occurred in the Big Rock Mesa area. To postulate the idea that there has occurred movement at one location at the edge of the debris mass, as indicated by the development of cracks, and hence a low safety factor there, and then somehow locally elsewhere, there occurs a change in acceptable the acceptably high safety factor for the same reason, uh, so that all in all, the uh, acceptable safety factor of the mass is uh, relatively high, um, is just geologically ludicrous. It can't happen that way. There's been no effort to explain um, on the part of Lauren uh, or Mike Pearson, uh, or excuse me, Mike um, Phipps, the uh, existence of the peripheral, peripheral cracks and some expla explanation of what they mean. Uh, no yet professional will say that the peripheral cracks cannot be evidence of a low safety factor of the, of the mass. Rather, yes response is best interpreted as not denying an overall safety factor that might exist, but rather questioning why if offsets along the base of the debris mass are not clearly reflected in the inclinometer records. The problem with that is that all of the inclinometers don't penetrate the base of the slide mass, 
and some do, uh, but um, the, the sensitivity of the instrument isn't such as to, as to actually recognize uh, the uh, movement. After all, the peripheral tracks involve only a fraction of an inch of movement at the most, but it can't be denied that the existence of the peripheral tracks around most of the debris mass is at least can be indicative of a very, very low safety factor. And similarly, uh, staff uh, will have to say that the peripheral tracks cannot uh, be, uh, cannot, they cannot say that the peripheral tracks cannot be evidence of low safety uh, mass, but rather they appeal to um, the uh, Bing Yen's uh, Exhibit, let me see what that number is, 9-2-1, uh, I believe, uh, that there is a, an inverse relationship between the groundwater level and the safety factor. The problem with that is that the conditions that Bing Yin assumed exist and the conditions that uh, now are assumed to exist by the city don't take into account uh, what I've called here the Terzaghi pneumatic theory, which simply means uh, Carl Terzaghi, Terzaghi is the father of soil mechanics, and his original idea of a slope failure was that pore pressure exerted um, force on a, on a wavy surface, to quote him, a wavy surface which caused failure, whereas we know now that the, uh, the Hubbard Ruby uh, analysis is, is appropriate for slopes that have never failed, but that Terzaghi's uh, idea, original idea, comes into play uh, where you're dealing with a slope where on which exists a landslide debris mass already, as is the case at um, uh, Big Rock Mesa. I was astonished to see the first uh, picture that was shown by uh, uh, Lauren Doyle, uh, showing the extremely uh, dense development that's occurred in and above what was originally defined by Dennis Evans' report uh, as the uh, Western extension. It does look to me like now, and frankly, I can't see why no one has ever mentioned Evans' report, which is uh, originally the work that was done in that area and upon which Bing, uh, Bing Yen's report is actually based. But what appears to me to be happening now is that there is, as a result of extensive development in the uh, western extension area, particularly above uh, the uh, Rockcroft Drive, uh, McEnany Way area, where, where Evans, during the Evans report, I mapped a number of fractures but not shown on the Bing Yen uh, geologic map, until there's a, a rational explanation of peripheral cracks, the best way to consider the matter is that there's an excessive amount of groundwater being infiltrated upslope from the Big Rock Mesa landslide debris mass as a result of, of development in that area, massive development, I might say, and that that groundwater is acting pneumatically a la the Terzaghi kind of mechanism. And that is what is causing a low safety factor uh, that the, I believe the peripheral cracks uh, represent uh, that, are, that are observable now. I'm waiting to hear from Lauren or, my, uh, or uh, any of Mike Phipps or anyone else, uh, an explanation of those peripheral cracks that don't indicate a very low safety factor. The, the idea that groundwater levels are low now, I question because as so far as I know, no one has actually measured groundwater levels uh, uh, at equilibrium. What, uh, what they seem to be measuring are groundwater levels at that are at best recovery levels. And as far as I'm concerned, I see no proof that we actually know groundwater equilibrium levels in the Big Rock Mesa uh, landslide debris mass. And thank you very much.
Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Lou Hamill. Hello. Hi, Mary Lou, I can hear you. Good evening, Mayor Pearson and council members. I have been a resident of Big Rock since 1978. We hired an architect in 1982 and then the landslide happened and it took us 12 years to get the permits to accommodate our growing family. And we weren't even in the head scar for the bluff areas, which were very vulnerable. The bluff failed several times, especially during El Nino and we couldn't get either into Malibu or Santa Monica, we were stranded. PCH is our lifeline and it needs to be protected. There was a moratorium on building from 1983 until 1992. There was a reason for that. What I want to emphasize is the fact that we had to do our own geological study on our property and prove what our factory, uh, factor of safety was uh, greater than 1.25, which included a boring we dug 35 feet deep. We heard from Michael what needs to be done to obtain a permit and as Lauren said, the Ben Yin report is a guide. I feel it imperative that any applicant needs to do their own study to determine their factor, uh, uh, factor of safety and not just rely on Ben Yin's 1990 report, which is 30 years old. When we were obtaining our permits, Ben Yin's report was only one year old and we were required to do an extensive study. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dee Dee Graves. Thank you. Um, my concern is the building permits that have been approved by the Planning Commission and the City Council in the Big Rock Mesa landslide area. Building codes were developed and adopted to ensure public safety, property safety, life. Um, my concern is that the Planning Commission gives variances constantly for these codes. They're ignoring the codes that were set to ensure public safety and especially the factor of safety of 1.5, whether this is on the Mesa or on the highway. Um, I'm very concerned that these things are going to continue at one of the Planning Commission meetings I heard one of the commissioners say, oh, well, if we don't approve this, we're going to have to buy the property. And then at a different time, I heard one of the um, city council members saying the same thing. That's ludicrous. Whoever owns property, that's their responsibility. It's up to the city council and the planning commission basically to say, we are here to uphold the codes. We are going to ensure public safety and make sure everything is safe for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rosemary Ide. <laughs> so, hey, Rosemary. Good evening. I have, yeah, hi. I have been in front of the city council many, many times, and I'm amazed I have to still be in front. Uh, what you see is after a big rainstorm, we haven't had any of these monstrous rainstorms in many years, almost decades, but they do come back. And all the many more bluff, homes on the bluff will be, at least part of it will be on the highway. Anyway, I was wondering why do we have to constantly fight to oppose unhealthy and unsafe development? When a realtor sells a house, shouldn't he give the, uh, the, the prospective buyer a mention it, please? This is a slight area, okay? You have to check into it. Or anyone bu buying in, in a slight area, isn't it their responsibility to find out, do I really want to spend the money and take a risk to buy in an unsafe area? Many of us have bought, of course, many, many years ago, and, um, you know, we were sort of, my husband told me when I moved in what happened and we, I knew that we had the pump and we constantly had issues with the underground water level, which will come back again because, you know, if we have more, more uh, rain, 
And also, if you have neighbors who add bedrooms and they're even permitted it. Um, so here you see the water still seeping out of the roadside uh, into the gutter. And that's on Piedra Chica. Um, you know, it's just, and that's, we had rain almost four weeks ago. And that is on inland, yes. So anyway, I don't fully understand how the city council and the planning commission can permit all these properties. And, um, you know, you have to think about the owners who bought years ago. What do we do? Do you just throw us under the bus? Is it good? Yeah. I got so nervous because I'm sorry I'm still on, but I'm done. It's okay. Thank you, Rosemary. Our next speaker is Jimmy Petula. Okay, yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Jimmy. Oh, thank you. Hey, very, a very uh, good presentation, by the way, earlier. And I, I've been a Big Rock resident for over 20 years. And when I bought my home on Inland Lane, I had, when the geologist came from Malibu, he, he said, the, the, you've got to collect your water, you showed me the way to do it. We put drains all in the, in the yard. I made sure all the gutters, we, all of our water, it gets pumped because, because, because I'm on the hill and it, the pipe goes out and the water goes, I had the pipe go literally out the wall in the driveway. It goes down the driveway to the storm drains. And that was the big thing, the water, water, water. And it was great seeing the presentation because it's very clear. And uh, I, I'm certainly against a moratorium on reasonable development. I, I don't know if any problem with people, you know, building on their lots or, 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 or bedrooms. Uh, and I, I'm not planning to do any building, but I think it's fine. I, I think the problem we have is water. Uh, I go on the, I, I go from Inland Lane to the water tower every morning on hikes and people are not collecting their water. <laughs> if everyone's so concerned about, it, in fact, a lot of the people that want to do the moratoriums, they're, they're not collecting their water. And, and you even, you can even see pipes that even when people do have the pipes, they're, they're either plugged or they're, they're half cut off. Uh, you know, and I think that it's it's very important for if everybody's concerned on Big Rock, they should be worried about their water and collecting their water and having it go down the, the storm drain. Uh, and and I think a lot of people are they don't want building because of their views, frankly, uh, here is sort of the word on the on the streets in Big Rock. But I it was really educational to see it makes perfect sense. Collect your water have the water go down properly, and uh, it's not being done. I think if everyone's concerned about the landslides of Big Rock, then everybody needs to collect their water and do the right thing and pump their, have, make sure the water's being pumped, make sure it's going down to the storm drains like we did. We, I spent the money to do it, and if you, if you do that, it, it's certainly going to be preventable. And I certainly don't think that, you know, building a bedroom for a child or, you know, rebuilding a house on a, on a lot that's permitted to build is, is going to cause a landslide. It seems like from the presentation, what's going to cause a landslide is people not doing the right thing with their water. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Our next speaker is Hack Wong. Okay. I can hear you. Hi, my name is Hak Wong. I'm here just because I'm concerned about uh, Big Rock landslide. I'm glad that the uh, Georgia make the presentation. Help me a little bit. I mean, I, I, I'm not a Georgia, I'm MD. So if you're asking about COVID-19, then I can give you more information on that. But still, what I can rely on is their expertise and their survey, the scientific side, we had a base on that. I think this is a bit, good time to draft for the council to draft up uh, a law or, or guideline what to do to avoid overbuilding overdevelopment okay and like for some 1.5 1 1.25 1 well, one which we when we start stop uh, having variants every time we should just stop uh, 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 waivers when, when they get to that law so that's what we need to do we need to set up instead somebody a special public servants using this twist the word around for their agenda. Okay, back in 25 years ago, when I was start looking, I remember my main 
we will say agent. You see that I won't show you any place in say Baguio. It's not safe. You will regret it. My agent, my my company will not flash signs. I think will not show it either. Well, I'm curious. I mean, I want to look, and I remember going to a a lot. I mean, a um, house on a sea a seaboard. Okay, seaboard. Going for dirt cheap. I don't know what happened. And I found out why. The good agent told me the prior owner walked away from the house. The house underwater. Okay, he walked away losing money. But before he walked away, he turned the water on. He turned the hose on and left. I don't know how long it was. It was on, just like that. What it did, it caused a rock slide in the land property, and there was a crack in the foundation, and there was wet tack. That's why gun show so cheap. Oh, I said, oh, I cannot do that. This place, this area is so sensitive. You you never see that in West LA. I mean, they, they, somebody went on vacation, forget the faucet, they won't cause the walk slide. They cause the wet tack. But it did happen here. That's why it made an impression on me, okay? After I got my place here, I have paid big walk assessment for 10 years, every year over $5,000. So that's why it's real. We need to do something about it. But right now, with my limited experience with uh, city council, Jeff Jennings is saying, well, since it's not nobody going to have 1.5 facility factor. Well, they cannot build. They, they, they can only, only a city can buy it. Oh, this is not how it works. And they said, the only way you do it, pass it, let, let it pass through. Well, if you do that, I mean, you know, then the auto variant go through, as you go, yeah, they go through, yeah. What do I care? I mean, I got my, my, my point, it passed it. That's your okay? time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker would be Michael Paul, but we can't find anyone under that name in the meeting right now. So we'll okay. circle back and Thank hear you. from Georgia Goldfarb now. Okay, great. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you, Georgia. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I, I agree with Don Michael. I think the hill is moving. Um, I can say when I first moved here for a number of years, uh, there was no visible cracking uh, on the asphalt. Uh, however, in the last, uh, I don't know, four or five years, um, there has been on Rockcroft, uh, below my house in the common apron area, more or less, uh, there's been cracking and buckling and mounding of the asphalt on Rockcroft. Um, so my question is, was it wise to permit a home at the head scarp, a large home, head scarp of a slide with some 60 feet of multiple, multiple pylons, it is difficult for me to believe that that has not disturbed the, um, the landslide. Um, so my opinion is that, <clears throat> excuse me, more building is not the answer. I think the city is going to be culpable and I have a couple of other questions. So I'd like to know what the accuracy is and the factor of safety in predicting a slide. And how does that apply to individual areas? So is this a kind of global factor of safety? I just don't know that this can, that these factor of safeties are, are accurate enough and predictive enough to know that more building will be safe um so that's really my comments i i would like at some point to get some answers to those questions thank you thank you georgia our next speaker is don kowalski with eight minutes okay this is don kowalski i've been an engineering geologist out in this area for many years and i was the first geologist for the city of malibu and at the time the Big Rock Mesa landslide started moving in 1983, I was the county geologist who observed the cracks that started developing. It was Sam somewhat familiar with this area. The well, Big Rock Association has asked me to address a number of items. And it turns out Lauren Doyle addressed almost all of those items for me. There are a few things that I'd like to clarify. One is we did not discuss seismic safety. In the Northridge earthquake, the landslide did move. 
So we know that during earthquakes, the safety factor drops below one. The area is mapped as an earthquake induced landslide hazard zone by the state of California, which mandates by the city's adoption of the city rules that any new habitable development must have a seismic safety analysis done to it. It doesn't say that that seismic safety analysis has to determine a specific safety factor, but it does say that that analysis must be performed. And there are some properties up here where it was not performed. They're right on the top of the plot. Um, Lauren addressed the various different issues with respect to groundwater. And I agree wholeheartedly that the groundwater has been dropped dramatically over what existed when the landslide was moving. And therefore, the safety factor had to have come up from the 1.0 or less at the time it was actively moving to the time where it's now, where the movement is periodic creep. And someone addressed something I said that I don't understand how you can have some creep movement and not have the safety factor of 1.25. Why is it not one? And I still agree with that number. If the driving forces are enough to cause minor creep movement, that means they are greater than or equal to the resisting forces, and therefore the safety factor should be one. However, Lauren earlier said that creep movement could occur when you have a safety factor of less than 1.2. And I'm going to leave that up to her to address why that can occur. I just think it probably should be closer to one. But I don't agree that that necessary that any safety factor necessarily is exclusive to development. I agree that no development should increase the risk. Therefore, no additional groundwater can go on the ground. There is not a made single family residence that's new that will not have some additional infiltration, especially up here since we have sewer systems. But it is possible to do additions where you take your old seepage pit, abandon it, put in a evapotranspiration system, and now you net increase the um, safety of that property because you're putting less water in the ground. So there are methods that can be used to make things better, not worse. Um, let me do this thing, let's see, <clears throat> number of items. Talked about the Northridge earthquake and the shaking that's going on there. The slope stability analysis done by Bing N, by the way, they very clearly state that it is not entirely accurate because of all of the unknowns. There are not enough drill holes there to say where the slide is everywhere. And that's part of the reason why we have different safety factors for different portions of the landslide is because the data was spread out. We did not have enough to address all of that. <clears throat> um, and by the way, we talked about not putting sewage water in the ground, but there's also, you can improve your drainage on the site. And there's a lot of people up there who are complaining about development, but they're not improving the drainage on their own sites. They should go through and get roof water drainage, take it to the street. Get yard drainage, take it to the street. Improve drainage throughout and use plants that don't require irrigation because they're using native plants over the time frame. Let's see. Um, I think that covers the dominant items that were requested of me. Um, and like I said, Lauren addressed all the different, or maybe Mike did, sorry, addressed the different items of the building code as to when buildings actually can be constructed, which included additions and repairs and things like that. But you need to be careful on repairs. If a house is destroyed by a fire and you're gonna rebuild it like for like, great. But if you're gonna do a bunch of grading, and you're gonna put the house in a different spot and make the house a different shape. All of those things are new development, not rebuild. And in that case, you need a safety factor of 1.5. So structures like that should not be allowed if you don't have a 1.5 safety factor. And in Big Rock, because the landslide is much as a few hundred feet deep, there's no way you're going to permanently stabilize and bring the safety factor up to one. So the city council needs to make some decisions on what is there um, and decide, can we allow some development within the building code? I think you can. Should we allow any new development that's outside of the building code? I think that's inappropriate. Are there methods to decrease the groundwater level? Yes, deeper wells. With the existing wells as they are now, 
the safety factor is not going to come up. We pretty much dewatered as much as we can. Comes up a little bit in the rain, goes back down afterwards. So we really can't change that. So the next item is, can we put sewers in there? If you put sewers in, the groundwater level with the proper pumping will remain about where it is now. However, you won't have to pump as much. It would be prudent to put it in a sewer system so that you don't have to rely on the pumps. If you don't, if you maybe don't recall council members, this big rock was mapped as a landslide when they first developed the track. And so they put in deep watering wells to suck the water down because it was known as a groundwater area where the, Mal the Malibu Mutual Water Company pumped water out to use for servicing the area. So they put deep watering wells to pull the water level down. The homeowners, the deep watering system was turned over to the homeowners. The homeowners decided that it was too expensive to keep operating the water wells, so they turned them off. Then the water well so much that the landslide moved. What happened? They sued the county. Why? Because the state law says when you have a sewer system, you must make sure that it always functions. And the judge decided that by putting water in the ground with a seepage pit and pumping it out with a well was equivalent to a sewer system. And by turning it over to the homeowners association, you allowed it to be turned off. They lost the lawsuit and the county was out something like 97 million bucks. So keep that all in mind. If we keep the water level down, we're pretty much okay, even though it creeps a little bit and then it'll move a little bit in the earthquakes. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Our next speaker is Christopher Cunningham. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Christopher. Hi, good evening, city council members. After Attending the January 4th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting, I question why the commission approved a project at 2272 Inland Lane. Apparently, while knowing such a project violated state law, city building codes, and LCP LIP requirements, as stated in Don Koleski's 2018 memo. The city memo states that the reasons why the allegations of violations are incorrect are because the proposed project is not new development and is technically a redevelopment of a site destroyed by the 1993 Malibu Old Topanga Fire. As Koleski correctly points out, the Inland Lane project cannot be classified as rebuild or redevelopment. According to City Building Code Section 2102.3.6, in order to receive a permit for a replacement structure in a geohazard zone, it must meet these criteria. Number one, the applicant must be the owner of the property at the time of the loss their immediate heirs or their authorized representative, which the permit applicant is not. Number two, the application is filed no later than 10 years from the date of loss. Applicant's permit was not filed within 10 years from the date of loss in a fire 20 years ago. Number three, the replacement structure shall not exceed the area number of stories, load, or number of fixtures and bedrooms of the structure that was destroyed. The prior structure was a single story, 2,184 square foot house with three bathrooms, and the proposed structure is for a two-story, 4,394 square foot house with four and a half bathrooms. The proposed project violates these criteria. For these reasons, the Inland Lane project is not a redevelopment project, but a new development project, and therefore subject to all applicable state laws, city building codes, and requirements, including those in the city's LIP section 9.4D, which requires that for new development, a seismic pseudostatic slope stability analysis must be performed. And section 9.4E, which states that maximum feasible mitigation measures must be incorporated into the design of slope stabilization projects. None of these requirements were met by the applicant or his geologist. The city acknowledges in its memo that the consultant did not perform the pseudostatic stability analysis as requested. The fact is that to receive a permit, the city's LIP section 9.4D requires that the applicant must perform a seismic slope stability analysis on this property, and one was not performed. The commissioners discussed this at length with the applicant's geologist before they voted. Even knowing this fact, they voted to approve the project, as you will see in the next video. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, sir. Our next speaker is Eric Sosa.
Yes, I'm giving my time to the video we're going to show. Okay. We need to determine what our variance is. And our, I, to me, our variance cannot be, you can build a house on a property up to a, a, a slope, uh, whatever it is, a factor of 1.0. That means you're a hair's inch from sliding down a hill on Coast Island. So you need to determine what is safe and what the actual situation on the lot is. That hasn't been determined. And so the city is saying, if we give this variance, we don't care whether it's safe or not. We're going they to also, give variance. Um, I'm uncomfortable with finding two. Um, specifically, um, I try to, my best to, you know, take as much input as I can and respect that input from everyone coming in. And when I have really conflicting views from two geologists on observations in the same area, it just, it makes me feel like, okay, we probably should know a little bit more about what's happening in this local spot to make sure that we don't have a problem which could be detrimental to the public interest. Specifically, if we see cracks appearing observed by one geologist, and another geologist saying he did borings, couldn't find evidence of the, the crack which is appearing. It just seems like we need some more I'm information. Not, so I'm, all I'm saying is do a real slope stability study and tell us what it is, okay? Don't drill a hole 50 feet in the ground and say, I can't find anything. Do a real one. The, Let me ask you this. The, 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 the real study that you want to have, uh, the, the LIP describes in great detail under this section, exactly what the study has to be. It, it, it goes on for the project engineer, whether his study complied with the requirements of the LIP. What's the, the section, after, Richard? What's the section, Richard, the LIP that I'm talking about? Nine four. All of these nine factors you took into account? Let me just uh, finish looking at what this is. Because I thought you mentioned in your testimony that you did not do an earthquake study. We did not do seismic. Okay, it's seismic's required. Not for uh, the variance. <clears throat> the study is. Number three says the effects of earthquakes on slope stability may be addressed. Through sonostatic slope analysis. Right. Not, not, isn't, it yeah. wasn't addressed. What would a effective earthquake study tell us? It would be less. It would, I would. I would assume that it'd be less because if you can't meet the 1.5, you're not going to meet the one point, the 1.1 1 .1 for for seismic. So we're below 1.1, 1 .1 and we're trying to give a variance on seismic. We haven't done what this section says you have to do. Boy, they sought a variance. That was three minutes, Mayor Pearson. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond. Hi there. Hi, Joe. Honorable Mayor Mike Key and City Council, thank you for providing the additional allocated time to the independent geologists. They were very informative. I am here to express my concern on the cracking at the periphery of the BRM landslide, indicating the landslide masses moving and mitigation necessary for this that has not been properly addressed by the city geologist or yet. One first urgent step in the right direction would be to reduce water infiltration into the ground for new development. Given projects in Big Rock are taking more than a few years to approve due to much opposition because of the landslide issues, this should immediately include a more careful study of every application that adds water to our delicate hill. BRMPO recently received legal advice that CEQA exemptions can be challenged projects in Big Rock based upon the unusual circumstances and historical data of the Big Rock missile landslide, as well as the cumulative effect of ongoing construction and development since 94. I hope you can all agree after hearing all our questions and concerns that CEQA exemptions should, have, should not apply to homes in Big Rock for every project that adds water. This would be an alternative to a full-blown moratorium on building here in Big Rock, although that might be necessary given the most recent findings. Whether we are a factor of safety of 1.0, 1.2, we are still nowhere near 1.5, the standard required to build in Malibu. If the factor of safety is an indicator of actual risks and safety of property and adjacent properties of proposed builds, then how can the city keep issuing waivers and variances to the factor of safety requirement? 
And if it continues, then we need some restriction or a lower of a lower factor of safety to be applied, such as Mary Lou described. Big Rock's average water usage, according to LA County in 2020, was 154,475 gallons per day, so higher than in both 1983 and 91. Whether water consumption has remained the same or has gone up, we do know that community irrigation has gone down, so this means septic usage has increased. According to Cotton Shires and Bing Yen, septic recharge into the ground is 51 and 60 percent. Staff report also states that septic effluent infiltrates the landslide mass. I hope all the geologists can agree on this. The geologists currently cannot state that there is no cumulative effect on the factor of safety based on this added development with increased septic effluent into the landslide, but we hope you will ask them regardless. Under cumulative effects of development since 92, the staff report states an increase of volume of effluent discharge will infiltrate into the landslide mass down to the groundwater is not allowed. So on the screen, there was a spreadsheet of all the builds that have occurred in Big Rock since 93. There are 125 new builds in addition, including over 50 fire rebuilds of 25% increase, according to the staff report, bringing the total to an increase of 124,000 square feet. This includes five new constructions plus one approval on PCH and one on Big Rock Mesa, although two others have recently been approved. These don't include build approvals that are currently being appealed. Most of these builds add water to the ground. How can all these approvals not have a cumulative effect on the landslide stability if they all add water? that infiltrates the landslide mass, which apparently is not allowed. Thank our, you, next, our next speaker is Colin Drummond. I can hear me. I can hear you, Colin. Okay. Um, I'm gonna um, continue on uh, with Joe's statement for her. Um, there was a building moratorium in Big Rock after the landslide in 1983, which did not get removed until residents petitioned the city in 1994 to allow additions after the fire. Residents have now petitioned for development to cease until our stability can be assured. Can you assure our stability currently, um, or can you stop development or place strict CEQA standards on every build so that an environmental review is completed to ensure it will not adversely affect the landslide and other properties in the assessment district. There are perched conditions and fracturing of the rock beneath the surface in certain areas of Mesa, even with homes that have a drip dispersal system that cause puddling of water. We'd like to know if this causes saturation to the ground that in turn causes further instability of the landslide and lowers the factor of safety. And should this be measured or mitigated in some way? Bin Yang states, quote, there are very limited cost-effective options to mitigate the instability of certain areas because of steep slopes, existing slide debris, or potential fast building of perched groundwater levels. Sewer system is most beneficial in this regard, and to minimize artificial groundwater recharge is recommended in these areas, unquote. We don't have a sewer system, and development has only increased the artificial groundwater recharge. The staff report also states that the wettest year on record was 1998, when Big Rock required movement to be mitigated by 8098-1. However, when you look at the charts attached, um, that slide one should be put up uh, of the groundwater levels over the years from Fugro, it shows that 21 of 29 functioning piezometers in 2019-20 measured higher groundwater levels than that rainy year and it wasn't an El Nino year. These levels need to be mitigated as they were after 1998. Is this why a new assessment district needs to be pursued? Given the county and Caltrans were forced to pay $97 million to the landslide victims from 83, the city should consider the liability it would incur should another landslide occur due to the lack of mitigation and cumulative development that has occurred here. Who is really protected by the signing of assumption of risk and releases? The city is exposing itself to liability from third parties with the exception of only the applicant. Also, there are three rehabs in Big Rock, Big Rock that have at least 120 people per day in only three homes using the water every day. How can all, these, uh, all this additional water not affect our stability? We appreciate your consideration um, and all that is at stake for Big Rock in the city and keeping us safe. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. 
Our next speaker is Norman Haney. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, Norm. That's great. So um, I read the 23-page the, uh, report at least three times, and uh, <clears throat> I have nothing but praise for the city's geologists, um, for Lauren Doyle, Mike Phipps, um, Christine. I think they did a great job. Most of tonight's discussions have been um, centered around fairness. Uh, everyone should be treated equally. And, and I, I'm, I'm looking at these statistics, and I see that 47 of the people, or, or perhaps more, um, that lost their homes were allowed to rebuild their homes, um, even though uh, they were putting more water into the landmass. Um, so I think, I think that the, the issue is, if someone owns a lot or a house had burned down, should he have the right um, to replace the house? Now, the particular house um, that I'm referring to only has two bath, uh, two bedrooms. So it has very, very low um, wastewater treatment uh, system, 450 gallons, actually. Um and I think when you come to the, the water level in the area, under that particular lot, the water level is 35 feet below sea level. It can't get any lower than that. You could put in pumps in that area and it wouldn't, wouldn't do anything because you can't get the water level any lower than that. It's much higher in other areas. Um, I do believe, however, that it's important that the Homeowners Association vote for more money to put in more dewatering wells throughout the entire mass. They've been unwilling to do that. The amount of, of money that they're providing for capital improvements is extremely low. And, you know, I would, I would say we need to have more dewatering wells and put the money where our mouth is. Um, of course, I'm also an advocate for a step system in a, a new sewage treatment uh, package plant. I think I know where it can go. Problem is the people in the area don't want to pay for it. And I, I tell them that the value of their homes are going to go up if they are willing to put out the money to pay for these things. And... Norm, your time is up. Oh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Norm. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich. Hello. Hey, Hi, Scott. Council, Mayor. I don't live in Big Rock, but I see a real dangerous trend happening here is we are granting waivers well, and there's a huge potential legal liability. And I don't think we have all the knowledge. Lauren, in that excellent report, mentioned that they're inferring the factor of safety is someplace between 1 and 1 1.25. When we built our road, the private road to rebuild Rambla Pacifico, Christine, city geologist, insisted we meet a 1.5 factor of safety, even though there had been no land movement in 20 years. Well, Big Rock obviously has land movement. You seem to be seeing how far you can rush to the bottom. Maybe you can get the factor of safety down to 0.9 and still approve things. That doesn't make sense to me. And the liability, the gain to the residents of the city of Malibu is very, very small. And yet the liability is huge. I remember 
on November 9th of 2018, a six hour traffic jam. I think you do too. And if that, we've done nothing, there is nothing that's been done. The California Highway Patrol won't seemingly agree with us to open a third lane. So that's stalled. And what if there's a slide? I can remember a slide or it was a potential slide, a big rock that might come down and we closed PCH for months. And if you had a slide from big rock, how would that impact things? How many people would sue? And then the safety of the residents is a concern we should address. If there's a fire in Eastern Malibu and people are trying to get down that one two lane winding road, there's gonna be cars lined up to the top. So you've got problems there exacerbated by a potential landslide. If there's an earthquake that could cause it. So you really need to, I believe, put a moratorium in until you can find out what is the factor of safety. We don't want something from 1992. We need that determined again. And then you can decide, the council can make a rational decision. Is whatever that factor of safety is come out, is it okay? So please put a moratorium on until then. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is John Congdon. Hello, this is, uh, this is John. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, John. Thank you very much. It took me a minute to unmute there. Um, I'd first like to state that I, I am against any moratorium on building in the Big Rock area for reasonable developments. Uh, I've seen a lot of evidence and I've been studying this for a long time. My house is one of the houses in question. Uh, so I will let you know that uh, I am biased in this, but in looking at what my house does and other house, houses that have been proposed uh, are contributing, I am actually reducing, as stated in Lauren's very fine report, reducing the water being absorbed into the hill, reducing land mass on the hill, and therefore reducing downward slope or downward pressure on the landslide, and therefore reducing the risk that I'm contributing anything to the landslide. This meeting is not about that, but I did want to state that, that reasonable development can actually improve the safety of the Big Rock Mesa area. What I'm not hearing from the many people who are against this, many of whom also are biased but aren't stating it because they don't want a home that might impede their views that is in, built within the CCRs in their nearby, in their, in their view lane, um, is any willingness to step up and contribute to dewatering the hillside, contributing to a well and making sure that drainage is happening properly from their property into the street. No one's proposing a collective, which I would be very much in favor of, a collective move by everybody in the Big Rock area to greatly reduce the groundwater that's drifting into the hillside, to contribute to additional wells if we have to, if the city won't contribute to that, we should all contribute to that. That is a much, much more constructive response to the fear that people have. And by the way, I, I do believe the fear is a bit unfounded right now and being escalated by certain people with ulterior motives because the water levels are lower than they have been in a long time, far lower than they've ever been. And in some cases, as Norm Haney pointed out, below sea level. I do believe that we should work together to constructively address any issues about more water seeping into the hillside. And I would be completely willing to work with all of my neighbors to do whatever it takes to do that, including putting in a sewer system or contributing to a, a plan to have water mitigation systems on all the private land, uh, properties. So I will state again, I'm completely against a moratorium, which is singling out people who have a right to build, and I'm for cooperation where everybody takes responsibility for their neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Our next speaker is Craig Hill. Good 
Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll be quick. So I'll, I'll try to be quick. City departments all assume that less groundwater equals more stability, yet Yay concedes that the reported groundwater levels are, quote, a gross generalization, end quote. A handful of monitoring devices can't model the hillside's complex array of different rock formations, stresses, coefficients of friction, and so forth. It's not a boat in a pretty PowerPoint show. So staff is expecting linear behavior from a nonlinear system based on one analysis from 30 years ago. And since then, we've been running an uncontrolled experiment. Once you tinker with the system, the idea that it will stabilize itself is wishful thinking. I mean, dewatering is probably a good thing, but how much, how fast, from how many different wells, no one knows. As for variances, the LIP allows one only if it won't cause detriment or injury to the public or to property in the vicinity. It doesn't qualify the amount of detriment or energy injury. Any amount is impermissible. Now, the Yen report found that stability of all the regions within the landslide are interdependent and failure or movement of one of the regions will affect the other regions. That is, the groundwater from one house affects the whole slide, thereby being detrimental or injurious to the property or improvements in the same vicinity. So under the LIP, variances are disallowed. Meanwhile, the Municipal code requires that an OWTS must be set back at least 100 feet from an unstable landmass, which is what Big Rock is, so you can't have a new OWTS within 100 feet of the Big Rock slide area. So instead, the city uses the ARNR waiver, which is what it is. The problem is you can't sign to the logical impossibility that a home can be both safe for its intended use and subject to landslide or slippage. A contract that's impossible to perform is legally void, which means that the city still has liability, not least from foreseeably affected neighbors who've signed away none of their rights. And that liability could prove to be far greater than the price of a few takings case, cases, which rarely happen anyway. So factor of safety analysis must be done. It won't cost a million dollars. 30 years ago, I was a resource consultant helping mining companies implement geological modeling software to exploit ore bodies surgically without destroying habitat. The software was about 2000 bucks. These days it probably runs on an iPad. Uh, and indeed Cotton Shires states that the FOS can be evaluated using quote, standard accepted software, end quote. So a clerk could enter the data and it might take a geotech pro a few days to work up some numbers. So here's what to do. The city should issue an RFP and ask at least three geologists to break out the respective costs for several levels of analysis, ranging from back of the envelope to building a real-time digital model of the mountain to the nth degree of precision. And somewhere along that spectrum will be a sweet spot balancing cost versus precision. Spend up to half of just one year's district budget on it, saving the remainder for critical repairs. And whatever you do, apply the precautionary principle. Uh, the land is moving, so the model needs revision. Craig, Let's get a new factor time. of safety. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker is Reza Nabavi. Okay. Hi, uh, my name Hi, is Reza Nabavi, and I'm a resident of Big Rock Mesa. I've been part of the Malibu community since 2007, where I worked between 2007 and 2013, fell in love, moved my family to Malibu soon thereafter. I love Big Rock, um, where I live here with my wife and kids. We're extremely grateful to have the opportunity to live in such a beautiful neighborhood. Please believe me when I tell you that there's nothing more important to me than the safety of my family. I've read reports on both sides the Mesa is stable. Dewatering efforts have worked. As mentioned earlier in tonight's presentation, water levels are, what did you say, between 50 and 150 feet below what they were during the slide of 1983. So the factor of safety is most likely improved, not gone worse. The idea of a moratorium is totally and completely unjustified. Yes, dewatering wells, etc., everything needs to be maintained but the Yay and Associates report shows that everything's looking good. In fact, it looks better than ever before. We are safe. We've looked at all the information and walked away feeling pretty confident. We have faith in the experts. We have faith in the city staff, city geologists, Chris Dean, other respected geologists like Don Kowaleski, who've, who have decades of experience with expertise in the city of Malibu specifically. We think you're doing an incredible job. 
Um, it was actually very inspirational to hear in the engineer from Yale and Associates, and I believe they did an exceptional job as well. Very positive report that they presented a few months ago of where we're at here in Big Rock. So we're against a moratorium on reasonable, reasonable development. Not only would that result in a decrease in property values, which a lot of people are concerned about in talking to my fellow residents and neighbors, but, but more importantly, it's just simply, there's no justification for it. If some residents are concerned about dewatering or slope stability, then they need to focus on updating their septic systems to more advanced ones, like the one that I have here at my house and other more efficient systems in modern renovated homes that were designed to be safer for the Mesa than the ones that have you know, been here with seepage pits and you know, other, other things that aren't as efficient. For my, for my neighbors who are concerned about all of this, you know, follow the recommendations that were mentioned earlier by Lauren and Michael. You can install low flow plumbing fixtures, water efficient drip irrigation, install piping to direct roof downspouts and area drains to the street, have your septic system inspected and repaired to eliminate leaks. Um, don't build without permits. Um, have things reviewed by the city. Um, even better would be to upgrade to a more modern septic system that evaporates most of the water like the one we have rather than into the ground. I appreciate the city council and city staff for all the hard work and time that you put in day in, day out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Miriam Akbar. Hi, good evening, and thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, I'm a resident of Big Rock community, and my family and I live love, uh, living in Big Rock and consider our home to be our forever home here. I have followed all the discussions and reports about our assessment district and the dewatering. It is my understanding that the water levels are lower than they have ever been, and there is no reason to feel that we are unsafe. I also believe that every property owner is entitled to build on their land as long as they are following all the codes and the rules set forth by the city. Some of the homeowners who are advocating for a moratorium have themselves recently added to their property illegally and without a permit. I'm in favor of reasonable development following the codes and against the moratorium on all development as I have watched all the presentations and read all the reports and do not feel that there is a safety issue. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jared Cohen. Hi, thank you. I appreciated all the presentations today, found many of the points very interesting. I was very encouraged by the fact that groundwater levels are lower today than they have been in past decades. Additionally, it was interesting to see in Lauren's findings that curtailing development is the absolute least effective of potential solutions and that there are other actions that could be taken and created by a more collaborative approach. It's very encouraging to see that there is even the potential for a net improvement in water infiltration with new development which would add impermeable land coverage and new OWTS systems. Therefore, I see minimal risk to new development, especially new development that is taking multiple mitigating actions and potentially making the hill even safer. And furthermore, I balance this minimal risk against the very real negative impact that any moratorium would have on the collective Big Rock property values. Therefore, I'm against any moratorium on reasonable development. And I echo John's comments about collaborative approaches and more effective approaches such as additional wells or other actions that would be much more effective in reducing water levels. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Our next speaker is Marissa Coughlin. Good evening, council members. Um, I have to thank uh, Mike Phipps and Lauren Doyle on a fabulous presentation. In Prior to the city's incorporation, actually in the 70s, and, and Lauren may know where this is because she's worked in this area a really long time, the Mormon Church had a massive subdivision proposed 
uh, you would they were going to fill in the canyon at the very first curve, the left hand curve going up Big Rock, and they did tons of studies, uh, groundwater uh, uh, drain. I mean, it's just massive. I've been trying to look for all, all my hard copy stuff, but it's been in storage so long, it's been difficult. But there was a lot done uh, relative to the Big Rock Mesa in general, and also the former school district um, property off of Seaboard at the very top. Uh, the uh, When the highway did slide a Big Rock and it landed, for those of you who lived here in front of Bob Radnitz's house, and we used to walk from one side past his front door to the other side of the slide, and then we were able to run boat shuttles and we'd get on uh, at the Malibu Pier or, or a couple of other spots. We had boats going back and forth until the slide was removed off of PCH and the uh, massive boulder, which was carved into the replication of John Wayne was removed. Uh, uh, there, there's so much additional documentation, but the expertise that both Mike and Lauren displayed and their history of working in this area is priceless to our city. And I think we're, we're very fortunate to have them uh, uh, on our team. I do want to recommend to all of those people that, that are friends of mine that live up there that the infiltration of the groundwater, the drainage, Don Kowaleski made some excellent points and I'm stunned that he agreed with, with Lauren so much because Don's a tough competitor uh, professionally. He knows his stuff. Uh, that the roof drainage and the landscaping really be uh, considered by the homeowners. It really impacts what's going on uh, subsurface, and I really think it would be helpful if they, another gentleman said self-help, and maybe that's not being done, I'm not sure, but the landscaping, the roof drainage, the groundwater infiltration, obviously bootlegging doesn't work anywhere. Um, so I, I hope that this information can be found. I'll continue to look at my archival records and storage and see if I can come up with anything. There was the development that was proposed right up the canyon at the first turn. And I, while the council has been meeting, I've been looking for it online with the county, but I haven't been successful. So uh, I think it's very important to the people up there to maintain their ownership and their development rights. But they, you know, have problems they have to deal with as well. But thanks again to our city staff. You did a great job. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Our next speaker is Nora Cohen. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Nora. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pearson, city council members, Mrs. Doyle, Mr. Phillips, and fellow Big Rock neighbors. Um, I'm a resident and have lived on the Big Rock Bluff for almost 10 years with our family of five. We have three young children at Webster Elementary School. We're excited to, uh, to you know, this is our forever home. And Marissa, I look forward to, to being here and being able to share cool stories like that. I mean, not tragic ones, obviously, but, um, you know, for years and years to come here in Malibu. Uh, We've reviewed many geological reports and have come back to the same conclusion over and over again, that our home and our Big Rock neighborhood is perfectly safe for our family and others. I'm very trusting of the science and have faith in Mrs. Doyle's and Mr. Fitt's report. If the FOS is the same as in 1992, possibly even better due to the documented decreased groundwater levels, <clears throat> it would absolutely not make sense to all of a sudden unjustly impose a moratorium on reasonable development for our longstanding and by all accounts safe neighborhood. I'd also like to point out that per their report, all new development in Big Rock Mesa has to abide by specific guidelines. And it sounds like new, more eco-sustainable development could even further mitigate slide risks by adding more concrete and buildings, which as Ms. Doyle said, could in fact help um, with the dewatering and prevent more water from seeping into the ground. There are a host of more reasonable solutions like adding additional wells versus all of a sudden imposing an unreasonable and unfounded development restriction on property owners, especially property owners who abide by all city codes and mandates. I think we as, as neighbors can absolutely work together to maintain and improve 
brown dewatering versus single out property owners who want to update and improve their older, dated, and in some instances, unsafe and unsustainable homes. Thank you everyone so much for your time and thank you everyone for staying with us so late into the evening. Thank you, Nora. Our final speaker will be Michael Paul. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Michael. Oh, uh, good. I live uh, at uh, on on Pacific Coast Highway, right below the slide uh, where it was. Um, there were significant problems that the homes on the beach had, and I just thought I'd give you a little bit of um, history. Um, one of the things that was remarkable was that the value of the homes, uh, including ours, went to zero. Uh, we had to continue uh, to pay the mortgages, uh, and several homes on the beach were not only seriously damaged, but one was completely destroyed, Two of them were completely destroyed, and our home had serious um, damages, like you uh, be lying in bed at night, and all of a sudden uh, you notice you couldn't open the windows, and the doors wouldn't open because the whole house had moved, and so on and so forth. Um, with, with the dewatering process that actually, well, first of all, there had been five times the density built that should have been built. Um, that was one of the reasons why the lawsuit which was filed not only against Big Rock, but against the people on the beach because water runs uphill, right? I mean, that was the, the logic of they, they countersued everybody. And even though uh, we, uh, we, we got the value of our house back, that was, we went through several years of the most excruciating fear, pain, meetings, heart attacks, divorces, uh, desperation. Um, and so, one of the things I don't, I haven't heard anybody talk about this particular time has been the, the fact that, that, that the original Bing Yen study actually showed that the, um, that the slide started down uh, three quarters of a mile back on Big Rock um, and that uh, it, it was down 400 feet um, more than more than 400 feet, uh, and and it started to march toward the ocean. Now the the toe of the slide actually came out um, a, a little more than 100 yards uh, into the into the into the water into the ocean. Uh, so that this was a very big situation that affected not only the big rock but 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 the beach people as well. Um, and what was so significant about the change was that the dewatering did work. Um, there were 100 wells that were dug at that time, and the dewatering was effective. Um, and, and it just uh, it just seems that that um, there hasn't been a clear mention of what the reason was and what they did say. Uh, I remember Don Michael and other people actually talked about it who were geologists. Um, first of all, there were five times the density built in Big Rock that should have been built that were... Michael, that's yeah. your time. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Michael. That concludes public comment on this item. Okay, thank you. Okay, we are back at council here. Um, lots of information there. Um, I think maybe if it's okay with the council, I'll start by maybe having... Lauren and Michael respond to any outstanding issues they heard that they're, if they're not numb from the late <laughs> evening. Uh, no, um, I've been busy taking notes. Okay. Okay. I'd love, I'd love to give you guys a chance to respond. You've heard a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard all sorts of things. So. Okay. Um, Mike, can you, unmute, are you unmuted, Mike? I'm unmuted. Okay. Yes. Okay. You're with me. Okay, good. And um, so, yes, I was feverishly taking notes, um, both on, uh, particularly on Don Michael, um, Don Michael's comments, and um, also uh, on all the homeowners' comments, on the concerns, um, 
on the questions um, on some information that I think um, uh, was either not accurate or, or incorrect um, or, or not known. Um, so I think I'm not sure how, where to exactly start. I, I will say this, um, I, I think we have Lori Berry with us of Yay and Associates um, tonight. Uh, I think uh, Lori, hey Lori, uh, we chat a little bit because um, based, uh, there is a report from Don Michael, I will say this, <clears throat> uh, there is a report from Don Michael uh, in, dated, I think November, 2018. Uh, it's, a, it's a long report, it has, um, a lot of information in it. Um, some is correct, some is incorrect, and it has um, some postulations. Um, I don't know that that report has been formally reviewed um, ever um, to, for example, the same standards that we review all the other reports um, that are submitted either for or I don't know if we've ever reviewed, Mike, any reports that are against development. I think we have sometimes where where we've gone through and given the report the same scrutiny that we would uh, report supported in development. But there are a couple of highlights that I would like to hit, and I, I'm just not going to do them in any particular order. Um, it may be, um, uh, Mayor Pearson, that uh, what we want to do is go back and, and re-review the video and provide a written response to any questions that we haven't answered um, to make sure, because what we really want to do is we want to be as transparent as possible. And we want people to have the best information that they can possibly have uh, because there are some difficult decisions. People, Big Rock Mesa is a landslide. It's a historically active landslide. It's moved in the past. Uh, the Bing Yen report says you may never reach a factor of safety of 1.5. In fact, it's unlikely, even if you take all the water down below the slide plane. Okay. So I guess the first comment that I'd like to make is on the Bing Yen report. Uh, Don Koleski said that Bing Yen, the, the report was the best information at the time. And I think I would like to make sure that a copy of that report, we have it in PDF, a copy of that report is available for everybody so they can read all of the disclaimers. It is a large geologically and hydrogeologically complex slide. It's gotten various parts to it. Um, you wouldn't, I mean, I, I've drilled a hydrogger on PCH. I punched through the fault zone that runs along the top of the bluff. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed to say we flooded <laughs> the right-hand northbound lane because 40,000 gallons per day was pumping out of that hydrogger, right? That was water built up behind the fault. Very shortly after, that hydrogger trickled down to 1,000 gallons per day. And that's where it sat, you know, un until rain comes up. So... It's a geologically complex area. There is a lot of uncertainty. When you put holes in any kind of hillside, what I tell people, and I've talked to plenty of applicants, uh, maybe even some of the people here, you have to think pinprick. You're, you're only getting a little bit of information of what you've got, and then the expertise and the mapping helps you interpolate and put together the whole picture. But we still never no, 100%. And Bing himself said in the report that there is still uncertainty. There, they may have in, interpreted some of this incorrectly or, or in a way that was either adverse or, or better. Um, and that when there's new information and new data, that the model that they put together, and I don't necessarily mean the slope stability model, but that's part of it, but the model of predictive rainfall, influence of rainfall on groundwater rise, and movement, associated movement, that should all be brought back into the predictive models and the study should be refined. So you won't find any argument from an engineer that when you have more data, you shouldn't go back and review what you did. And, and that's exactly what Bing Yen says um, in the report. 
I will address a couple specific things that were said. Um, I think the last speaker um, said that there were over a hundred water wells drilled up on Big Rock Mesa. Uh, I don't think, maybe he means a hundred holes, um, but there were not a hundred dewatering wells. Uh, in the landslide assessment district reports, I think they track every single well that's up there, including the ones that are no longer functioning or the ones, the, the slope inclinometers that have been sheared off by the base of the slide and you can no longer get down to the bottom of the hole because the slide sheared it off. Um, I also would like to say that Bing Yen specifically said in their report, if I recall correctly, that they did a geophysical survey offshore. And in fact, the slide didn't tow out offshore. Um, it, it towed out uh, uh, along PCH where it's drawn and shown on the maps, roughly. Um, the factor of safety, somebody asked, what's the accuracy of the factor of safety? Well, when you're modeling slope stability, uh, it's only as good as your model. And it's only as certain as your model, you know, garbage in, garbage out. It's true of anything. But Bing Yen, Dr. Bing Yen, was one of the landslide experts uh, of Southern California and hired by many jurisdictions to evaluate um, landslides, including ones that had weird poor pressure um, groundwater regimes, right? Abalone Cove, Portuguese Bend. Um, but I, I believe and I, I was looking frantically for it in, the, in this 450 page behemoth report, I think he said that his factor of safeties as he modeled them was plus or minus 0 0.05. Um, and I will say it wasn't just one slope stability model, they ran and refined probably hundreds and thousands of times these sections not just the one section, but all the multiple sections across the slide. And then they even did some 3D modeling um, at the time as well as, as, well as they could. Um, I do think that the hydrogeology is complex. We've drilled wells up there that we thought would be good producers. And they turned out not to be as great as we thought. Uh, in part, because if you install the well and you smear the sides of the hole, uh, you're not going to get, um, uh, you're not going to, you're going to block, you know, whatever water comes into that well. Um, so there's certainly refinements to the study. Um, I'm not holding it out as the end all be all, and neither did Bing at the time. Um, but I am saying it's the best indicator of, of what we know now, knowing that groundwater is the primary driving factor. The one other thing I would like to address, and I wish Melinda Talent were with us here tonight. She is the head of the Environmental Health Department. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Mike and Lori for some comments, um, is that I, I think I wrote in the city council report, and I forget exactly what phrase I use, is that the assumption is that with permitted development, there's a one-to-one -one correlation with water going into the ground. I hope that we emphasized that the goal of our review, although maybe not perfect every single time, but the goal of the development review, particularly on landslides, not just on Big Rock Mesa, but everywhere, is to evaluate what happens when you put water in the ground. Any slope stability that, um, that uh, contemplates a new on-site wastewater treatment system, and you can ask some of the fire rebuild uh, people, we've driven them nuts with this question when they've been putting in new seepage pits. We always make them model what's the effect of the seepage pit influ effluent into the ground and how is that gonna affect groundwater in your slope stability model and if you're putting in a new OWTS near a slope, you have to run slope stability because we know that water affects slope stability. But what I would like to say is the assumption is everybody's saying that you can add new bedrooms up on Big Rock Mesa. Um, well, bedrooms actually increase effluent flow. And for, you know, 
when the homeowners, for example, in Woolsey Fire want to rebuild their houses and it's like for like plus 10 percent, if they're not putting in a new on-site wastewater treatment system, they are limited to both the number of plumbing fixtures that they had as well as the number of bedrooms because the calculation of effluent into an on-site wastewater treatment system is actually based on both bedrooms and plumbing fixture counts. So now I'd like to pass it over to Mike if he has any additional questions. I, I'm sure there are other things that I, I didn't, I did not touch upon. I, I apologize. I don't want to bore you to death. And, and I do think that maybe some written responses would be useful. Um, but um, Mike, commentary. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was going to say the same thing. I think um, the best thing we could do would be to provide some uh, responses to some of the questions that were asked. Uh, the one thing I, the only thing I want to touch upon is uh, there's been a lot of criticism that uh, uh, nobody has addressed the cracks at the periphery of the landslide. Um, and I, I want to ask Lori uh, Barry, because I think that's something that they have been tasked with doing as part of their um, scope of work with the assessment district is whether they have looked at the cracks and um, formulated any any uh, conclusions as to what sure yeah I can answer that and I can everyone hear me yeah um, I, I just also want to say that I, I yay never and I never said that the cracks were meaningless or didn't have any um, weren't a clue or part of the, the big picture of, of what the stability of the landslide assessment district is. Um, there are, I admitted, there are there are existing cracks right now that that are in very similar locations around the periphery that were originally mapped in the crack map in Vinyan. Um, we've looked at a lot of those locations. I don't know when, what years that those cracks have have started to redevelop. Um, we have walked, so when we look at a crack like that, you know, and, and actually it's, a, it's, a, it's one tool of, of all of these tools, and I'll, I'll emphasize that again, but, um, you know, we look at persistency of a crack. So when I went over to, we went over, it was a senior engineering geologist who's worked on landslides all over the country. We had a, a whole little crew looking around. Um, we um, we looked to see if the cracks, where they go beyond, beyond the road. So, where we could, where it was legal, where we could kind of see if it's in landscape, you can't really tell, but there's lots of places where these cracks end and they don't, uh, there's walls or there's fences or there's utility pipes and, and we're not seeing cracks go through those. So there's one clue that maybe the crack isn't persistent. Um, there, we're not hearing complaints and, and our eye have not been informed of any complaints of people um, not being able to shut their windows or having their doors stuck, things that are, would be also indicative of things moving. I, we have, the cracks appear visually to be very similar in size to the, the photos that E.D. Michael had presented in his 2018 report. Um, they don't appear to be getting bigger in the tip of, if, if the cracks were moving and, and the, the whole unit was continuing to move, would probably be seeing the cracks getting bigger and bigger and bigger and we're, we're not but as part of our monitoring we're not ignoring the cracks we're visually looking at these crack areas and then um you know it, it's worth mentioning that there's also a whole host of reasons why um cracks can be in in asphalt that, that not you know most of these roads have just been overlaid with with very thin slurry seals so for a, a crack that was um, went all the way down to a slide plane and formed 30 years ago for that to reflect through very thin uh, and, and perhaps not the best craftsmanship of pavement is, is not unreasonable. So I guess in conclusion, we are not seeing evidence where the cracks are, that there's anything um, more going on than, than what's been discussed, minor creep. Um, and, and not to mention, we have instruments all around these areas. We're, we have inclinometers on all sides. We have dewatering wells throughout the area. We're actively pumping all of the water out. We're not seeing any discernible shear movement in the inclinometers that are right next to or in between and around all of these areas. Um, but we'll continue to watch it. Our, some of our capital improvements include more surface monitoring 
and um, yeah, I guess I'll end there. I can answer more pointed questions. With that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, all all the experts, all the speakers. Um, let's come back to the council now, and uh, I I'll, I'll start, and then I'll I'll just pass it off to the rest of you guys. Um, I think a few things occur to me that seem a little obvious from what I've heard tonight. Uh, the assessment district needs to be looked at. And it seems very likely that that needs to be redone, added to, whatever the right term is in an assessment district. Um, to hear the order of, of suggested things to fix, um, Increasing dewatering, reducing water infiltration, reducing consumption, no construction. It shows that there's a lot of options and a lot of a lot of work that probably needs to be considered or done. And all, I'm also hearing very strongly that the study done previously should be revised, which sounds like a big project, um, not a small project from what I'm hearing. So um, it does look like to me. There's definitely things that need to be done. There's obviously opinions both ways on 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 safety. I um I can only form an opinion from what I've heard, but if it's an active landslide, it can't be a 1.5. So that's probably not a realistic goal, as I can as I understand it. And for anyone who thinks that a house has to be at 1.5 to be approved, obviously that can't happen. But it makes me wonder then if we've approved all these other houses that aren't a 1.5. We have, do we have to look at that? Do we have to condemn the neighborhood? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, if all things need to be, should be fair, how do we get there? How do we get there? And I think the answer on being fair is obviously that there's more work that needs to be done in this area. And it's, it's it going to be a serious discussion. So that's enough comments for me. And uh, I'll look to the council for uh, Bruce, your hands up. Yeah, actually, I, I, I'm not going to do comments yet, but I just have a question. Um, we rec we all received 80 i'm say 50 questions from residents that they said had been cold down from 80 I, I wonder would it be i know it's it's late and we've gone long but would it be appropriate to ask uh, mr cunningham if he could identify maybe two or three of the questions that are the most important that he doesn't believe have yet been answered and have them answered so that we could satisfy that um, the residents who took the time to put these questions together? Mikey, you're, you're muted. Uh, um, I was looking for, I see him here. Um, yes, there are a lot of questions here and I appreciated the offer to, um, respond to questions in, in written form. I don't know if there's, I think a, quite a few questions were answered. So I don't know if Christopher has a couple of questions that are standing out because obviously I think trying to go through all 50 right now makes zero sense. To right, I wasn't suggesting that. Just maybe no, the I top think two or three. I didn't think. Um, Christopher, do you, can we, uh, can we unmute Christopher please? Or ask him to, oh, wait, there we go. No, I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Christopher. So, uh, Mr. Sivacine and um, Pearson, I think probably the best thing would be to, um, because it's, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for or curate questions that came from multiple folks. Um, I think probably the best step forward would be to just respond to those questions in writing. Okay. Um, with now, the downside was that um, the questions were to be asked across all geologists because the, the the focus here was that we were we were getting conflicting information from a number of different geologists. So even if you folks respond, then we don't have other geologists responding. Do you see what I'm saying? So I think that you know, but hey, we can we can start by getting you know at least the the city to respond to those questions. Um, and then that way we can circulate that among the, the homeowners so they get their, their questions answered. I don't want to, I don't think it's right for me to be able to, 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 to essentially curate the questions because I think we should give them all equal weight. Right. And I don't know that we were, 
this forum isn't really that. I mean, it's a tough forum to answer 50 questions. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, well, so. I, can we do it in writing? Can we, are we able to just have the, your, your team, Lauren and, and Mike and, and folks respond in writing to those questions? At least we have your, you know, the city's um, answers or responses to those. We're, we're, we may not have, you know, Koleski and the others that are, we're here today, um, but at least it will get, we'll get some of the information out to the, to the homeowners. Well, and, and my take on reading through them is that it's, there's not, there's 50 questions, but there's several answers that will encompass the major focus of most of those. Um, not one or two, but so I, I don't know, Lauren and Michael, what you think of, of these well, questions if, or if you've seen it already or. Well, I think some of the questions we have seen because they started coming out that the, the questions really started for us, we heard the first of the questions uh, after the yay uh, presentation uh, in October. Um, and so there were numerous questions forwarded to Yolanda or sent to, to Yolanda Bundy. Hello, Yolanda. Um, and she forwarded them to us and, and questions from city council and questions from homeowners. And we wrote a series of memorandums. The first one, to the general question of how do you do development review um, up there and both EH and GEO responded to that. Um, we tried to keep it to the point and brief. And then as further questions came in, I think from Chris Cunningham and a follow up, follow up questions from Chris Cunningham, which seemed to encompass some of the broader concerns people had, we went in more depth and wrote a couple more memos in response to that, and then, you know, became very overwhelming to to try and do our review work, which is our primary work, keep the business of the city going forward, going. Yolanda? Yes, so we can take a look at all those 50 questions and try to answer to the best of the time frames. I think what Lauren is trying to uh, tell you guys is that uh, we are very busy with number of sub projects that are coming in, not only fire rebuild, but we have other things. And we know that this getting um, the information back to the big uh, rock area is very important. So I just need to, I need direction from council, which what which do you think is our priority and we will get it done. But this type of uh, questions, they're technical and they're complex. So there's, it's gonna take time for us to respond and collaborate not only with Con Shires and Lori Berry, but it's possibly that it's gonna to come to other city staff members. So would adequately answering the majority of these questions be something that would fall under an additional study? Or is it information that's known? I haven't seen Hard it. Hard to tell. I okay. don't know. No, I, we haven't seen, I, and, and it might be that the questions that they're asking, we have already responded. So we really need to go through everything that has been submitted, uh, compile all that information and maybe um, attach the memos that are, have been written and not the new, add the new information that is requested. Okay, so maybe we can have a, a chat offline in a little bit, not, you know, and just sort of think how we can tackle this. Yes. Okay. All right, Bruce, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I want to start by saying Lauren, Michael, the two Dons, Laurie, that was a lot of great, helpful information to me. Um, I, I, I found everyone's analysis to, also to be very nuanced and um, and detailed, and it, it sounds like you have a lot, have a lot of experience. I've done a lot of valuation litigation where ridiculously qualified experts come in and, and talk about what the value of a company is. And one expert will come in who represents the party who's advocating for a high price and they'll say this company's worth $10 billion. And they'll have an amazingly convincing written analysis that is very persuasive. And then you'll have the defendant's analysis who they're trying to avoid paying a high price in, in the matter. And they'll, they'll say the company's worth $1 billion. And they'll have an amazingly 
complex and convincing and persuasive analysis. And the only way that we're able to get to who's right is to have them bat it back and forth among each other, which is I think what Mr. Cunningham was, was talking about before, hopefully having each of the respective experts here uh, responding to the same issues and, and debating them, which I know we can't do in a city council meeting, but it's, it's really the only way I can understand who, who's right to the extent that there's such a thing as right. I mean, I know there's, this is all probabilities, it's not certainty, but as I sit here, having listened to everybody, you're all right. You're, you're all, you're, you all make sense. And, and that's a problem because you can't all be right. You can't even all be close to right. One of you has to be much closer to being right than the other. Um, or, or perhaps it's somewhere in the middle. Who knows? But in any event, I, I, I did appreciate what was said by everybody. I think it's unfortunate that we couldn't see, um, Mr. Michaels and Mr. Koaleski because it, that's also part of the analysis and, and hearing hear, when you see people, it's a lot easier to understand what they're saying. Um, you know, where I, I, I don't favor, by the way, oh, we're, we're, all we're doing, as I understand, is like we did earlier with the audit. We're just agreeing to receive and file a report. So we're not, we're not agreeing that the report has conclusions that make sense to us. And to that extent, I certainly agree we ought to accept the report, when, which I assume we'll vote on later. Um, I've wondered whether um, insurance I mean, a lot of people have talked about the fact that the fact that the person who wants to build new or remodel um, has to sign a release. Um, that's all good for the city in terms of potential liability to the party that's building, but that really doesn't do anything for the neighbors who are concerned that the new construction and all of its um, intricacies will cause problems for the neighbors. I, I wonder whether we could be looking at requiring insurance because then an insurance company, very skilled an analysis is going to be brought to bear on all of the issues and they're going to set a market, a market price for whether there's a risk or not a risk. So it's something to be thinking about for down the line. Um, the other thing I'll say is that I, I was glad we heard from Laurie at the end about the cracks because the cracks at the periphery were of a concern to me when I was hearing about that because it just seemed to me like we can look at all of these scientific assertions and probabilities, but the proof is in the pudding. And if those cracks do evidence movement, then, okay, so the scientific analysis shows that there shouldn't be movement, that the force should be greater, the force that's repelling movement should be greater than the force causing movement. But if there is movement, that seems to me to be the proof. But I'm, I'm hearing that even the cracks are not dispositive of anything. They, you know, so that seems to me actually that might be a fruitful thing to be looking at much more carefully and scientifically because if those cracks are attributable to movement, not to poor paving or, hey, cracks just happen, but if they are attributable to the slide moving, that would tell me that all of the analysis aside, we got a problem. If the cracks, though, are completely non-dispositive, then I go back to needing to understand what the science says. Anyway, I could have I could say a lot more things, but um, since we're only agreeing to accept the report, I guess I can end at that. But I, I really do appreciate the comments by everybody and, and by all of the residents. It's, it's also fascinating that half the residents, you know, see the slide coming back next week, and the other half of the residents see the land being stable for the next century. So, who knows? Paul, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to start by thanking all the geologists and uh, with special recognition to Don Kovalevsky, who's responsible for every bit of geologic information I've ever got after college. Uh, I met him when he was working for the county in the first place, and it was hard to get him to invest the time in explaining stuff to me at, at first until he learned I was a sponge. So I really thank him for spending the time. And, uh, and my opinion was that basically uh, Don and Michael and, and Lauren were all pretty much in the same ballpark. Uh, the, as far as Mr. Michaels goes, I'm, I'm not familiar with 
the Terzaghi effect, pneumatic effect. And as I understood his explanation in the letter, it seems like he's saying that we may have taken too much water out and that's causing more instability, which is an idea I've never been exposed to before. So I'd love to learn more about that. And both Don's talked about wanting to, you know, drill some extra holes and figure out what's going on. And I know Don Michaels had earlier talked about the possibility of their existing perched water in the area. And I would love for them to weigh in with a location, if they could drill one hole and one well to see what's going on, where would they put it? And what would that cost? And the other thing that I was struck by is this, the landslide assessment district was created, the current one was created in 98, which is several years ago. And as far as I know, the budget, the annual budget for work hasn't really increased during that time. And there has, you're shaking your head, am I wrong? No, I'm saying it has not. Okay. Sorry. And in every other field I'm aware of, inflation has happened since 98. So I think it's, we're probably overdue for a new assessment district and for the homeowners to get together and decide how much, what additional projects they want to take on and then continually monitor for the next 25 years and kind of figure out what it's going to take, how big an assessment district that's going to take. And it's not unusual for neighborhoods with private facilities to have assessments go up. In Malibu West, for example, that we've been notified that our sewer assessment is going up starting next year. And it's, inflation goes on and on and on. So those are the things I was thinking about. And thank you for the time. Thank you, Paul. Steve? Steve, you're muted. Thank you. I'm sorry. Ed Michaels made a comment about the groundwater that he didn't think the groundwater measurement you were using was accurate. Do you recall that comment? He, yes, I do. I do. I'll go back to my notes. I don't remember exactly how he said it. I think what he said was he doesn't think that there's enough wells in the ground to know. Something about the way we were measuring it. I don't, I don't recall specifically. I will say it's hydrogeologically complex out there and you, there are geologic features that may change groundwater from one location to another. In fact, I'm looking at a map right now where I see groundwater has dropped minus 12 feet in one location and in an adjacent piezometer, it's dropped minus 60 feet. Okay. I'm just, he had, he made some comment regarding the way we were measuring it. I was just trying to get some perspective on that. And then I want to go back and the opening presentation you did talked about a lot of creeping going on up there in the hill, right? I mean, it's creeping, a little creeping. And I'm trying to understand, you know, your, your, your factor of safety said, if it's, you know, 1.5 says the, the piece holding the force coming out is one and 1.5 is, is on the other side, preventing it from moving. So if I've got creep going on, doesn't, what does that tell you? Right. It does. It says there's something moving in it. And 1.2 says the force moving that creep is greater than the 0.12 factor safety. No. So what I will tell you is what I presented was really of, it's a 455 page report. And I had to go back and reread it, having read it once. There are multiple regions. And if you, and I would be happy to make sure that everybody has a PDF of the report. I know public works department has it. I know we have it. There are different regions 
with different factors of safety based on the cross sections that they modeled. Not every region has the same factor of safety and the headscarf region is actually the one with the lowest factor of safety and operates kind of independently. But to come back to your base question, if you have creep moving going on, right. the presumption is that you are at or very close to a factor of safety of one. That's the physics. There's nothing you can right. argue that with about That was what I was trying to figure out. I mean, I, I, right, right. There's nothing you can, you, you can't argue. But what I can tell you is that you can evaluate a section and show that it has a factor of safety of 1.2. But if you've got some variable section that's just short ways away, that's got different geologic structure and, and different groundwater regime, um, you could have creep over there, maybe 30 feet, you know, I don't know how far away. I, I was trying to summarize the, the conclusions in the Bing Yen report. And, and you can imagine, I was a little bit surprised when Bing himself, and this is why I wanted to put it in the city council report and quote him directly and not, you know, quote Bing Yen and associates directly when they said, well, creep can and does occur at a factor of safety of 1.2 or less. I, what, I, I was not there when, when they did all this analysis, I was trying to summarize things. So I do remember in your, you mentioned the word creep a bunch of times in your earlier presentation PowerPoints. And right. I just, when it, it yeah, when the slide I, moves, I, it but I, creep. I just, I, yeah, I'm not going to argue with you. I mean, I just remember that, that word, that word showing up. And I'm just, as I, as I listened to it, I couldn't figure out if the creep was occurring, how I could have a factor of safety of 1.2 with that going on, that just didn't make any sense to me, but you know, I'm not a geologist. Because uh, factors of safety are transient and they're dependent on groundwater. So the creep is not constant. The creep occurs over discrete periods of time when you have very high groundwater level, which lowers the factor of safety. That's when the creep occurs. So what the, the, the overall general factor of safety is was presented at a time in 92 with the groundwater levels known in 92, 90, 91, 92. That's when he presented his stability analysis and the factors of safety I presented were specific to that time. Now, what I inferred is since the groundwater consumption is yes, a little bit higher than when he evaluated it. When he evaluated it, it was 132,000 gallons per day. Uh, Joe Drummond just mentioned that in 2020, she said it was, I, I forget what it was, but but I know for a fact, because I looked at the report, it's 144,000 gallons right, per day, right. the latest year. Um, and I can't remember if that's the number she said, but, but I have that number here. So based on a similar, although slightly higher water water consumption and assuming that some of that goes into the ground and then based on lower similar or lower groundwater levels as in 1992 the inference was that the analyses and the resulting factors of safety could still be similar that's really what I, I was looking if 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 the water consumption was much higher, if the groundwater levels were much higher, um, I would not have been able to draw that in conclusion. It just turns out that the groundwater levels are the same or lower as 92 and the water consumption is probably close enough um, to maybe balance out the fact that the that the water is a little bit lower now. So it's just an inference that most everything, it looks fairly similar. So you could probably infer that the factors of safety are probably similar. Okay. Mike, you got a question. Uh, we've just spent two and a half hours or whatever it is going through this report. Yeah, it's a long time. What are we going to do with it? What is the city's, after the city has heard that, has the city got a position of what so, they think we should do? Okay. What I, what I offered the, um, I believe it's the HOA. What I offered the people that were contacting me is that we would hear what happens here and then after this meeting, get together and decide on next steps. 
And an option I raised for next step was to take, uh, not have the whole city council necessarily at that meeting, have a couple of staff, maybe a couple of counselors. So not, not, and just, we've done this before with Big Rock. I've done it before. Have a small group get together and chat about what next steps are. And then we can agendize something to come back and, and figure out how we're going to make, make some headway here. I'm just wondering what you got your and Rob DeBow here. What did they think of this report? What, what conclusion did they reach after reading, after hearing this two and a half hours? Is it safe? You'd have to ask them. Yolanda, you there? <laughs> what, Rob, what do you guys think? I mean, is it safe to build up there? Would you, based upon what you heard today, I mean, do we change what we're doing? Do we can Faith. stick with 1.5? Somebody, just tell you guys are smarter than me on this stuff. I'm just trying to get some, the city to, to put some, you know, money in the game and say, here's what we think we should do. So based on my position as your building official for the city, um, my job is to safeguard the life, the health, and the property of the community. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. Um, reading and being part of the Malibu team, uh, you have in Lauren Doyle and Mike Phipps, Geodynamics, Conshires, uh, the experts um, applying the code, like yes, it needs to be done. This evening, we brought to you um, information on the factor of safety and information on how the city has done review on development. And it didn't start it a year and a half ago when I started working for the city. It has happened since uh, before the city was incorporated, uh, was its own city. Uh, we are, have been following the code, not only the state, we are following the county and we are following the minimal requires of the, of the state of California on the structural design, grading and geotechnical. When you ask me, what is that you my recommendations? Yes, we need to go uh, continue uh, educating and communicating with the Big Rock community. There is a lot of questions going back and forth, like you uh, heard this evening. There is not consensus on one thing or the other. Well, the consensus is about a point one one point two factor of safety and maybe a little bit lower. Do we continue to build up there with that factor of safety? That's I'm looking for the city's position. I mean, do you think it's okay, an okay thing to do? And then I we rely on that on the geotechnical engineers for that, right? Uh, we have been doing that since prior to the incorporation of the city. Uh, my recommendation is we have we have been doing the job. We do the same. We do the same thing unless you direct us to do other another study. But it seems like another study might give you the same conclusion that the factor of safety is not going to change. It's not going to get bigger than 1.25, or, or, or that's, that's not going to get to 1.5. Right. Okay, we'll bring this up later. I'm. I'm I'm just looking for the city to take a position, right? I mean, do you, well, I think we have the neighborhood has to be involved in here because it's there's there's an assessment district that plays into this very heavily. So I think I think it's not just our decision. Our, our shouldn't be. We should the neighborhood should be involved. And I know they don't all agree, but at some point, you know, they do they do need to have a say here. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Paul, your hand was up first. Is it Rob? Oh, yeah. I, oh, sorry, Rob. Go ahead. And I, I know uh, Steve wanted yes. some some answers for me. And okay, I, sorry. I yeah. Speak on a little bit of the assessment district and kind of what we're doing. Um, back in October, we've got authorization to kind of go forward with actually modifying the assessment district and adding more funds to the district to to put some more wells in to go deeper to do some more analysis. We, well, one of the things that we're moving forward that we can, we're thinking about moving forward with was a, was a, a GIS 
um, aerial that is done that is flown over the area where we can track the, the cracks and look at those things and do a bunch of those things, um, increase the, the um, reserve amount for the assessment district, just in case things happen, we have that amount in there. So um, I think those are the things that, that we're doing with the assessment district to probably, uh, probably improve or make the factor safety just as good as it is now. Um, but you know, there's there is some other things we can do. We can probably you know um, do some improvements to the drainage, or or maybe some um, maybe some some notifications or some outreach, or some education to the homeowners of what they can do to kind of help um, get that drainage from their property out into the street. And so where we in the city and my staff can, we can control it. We can get that water and get it out of, of the neighborhood and out of the ground. And so those are, those are my thoughts. Um, I'll, I'll let Yolanda kind of talk about the factor safety and building. I, I'll get in trouble if I kind of get more into that, but. Okay. okay Mayor, Mayor, if I might jump in for a minute, um, I, sense that you're all looking to try and find out how to move this along other than just a receive and file. What we did bring back was what the council had asked us to come back with, with which was a report to, re to re receive by the council. Um, but it might be useful um, if you want to ask us to meet with the community, uh, with you know yourself, mayor, or another council member, and see if there's consensus on uh, looking into some additional assessment uh, assessments for a different assessment district and then come back to council again in a, a few months. Um, I just don't want you to be feeling like you don't have any way to move this forward tonight. So I don't know. And, if that's and that's what I was trying to suggest too. I think we, we need a next, we need a next step. And I think it's that meeting where we can chat more with a smaller group and, and try and really make progress to bring something back to council. Paul. You're muted. When we were talking about creep and the movement, uh, I, I remembered something that Don had written on page four of his letter of February the 22nd, 2021. It says, the relatively minor movements, less than two tenths of an inch, recorded over multiple years in multiple slope inclinometers, <laughs> cannot be summed to get a total movement. In fact, the method of measurement and the instruments used in the measurements have tolerances which can result in apparent small movements each time a measurement is taken, but the cumulative over time is still a net zero or an amount within the acknowledged instrumental error. I've, I've been looking at those reports for the last 16 years. And a two tenths of an inch was a big movement. Most of them were zero or one tenth of an inch on those various things. And it's never been, I, I don't know if, I mean, basically what Don's uh, record uh, paragraph here seems to be saying is this is all within the, it's all within the range of instrument error. Oh, more stuff to talk about. Yeah. Um, you're muted, Steve. I saw you trying to talk. Um, I'm just going to throw out a motion, then we can move forward. But my motion is just to receive and file on this and then and then head towards a community meeting to uh, to see what we want to bring back to council. Um, Bruce? I'll second that motion. But I do have a question, but quick. OK. Um, I didn't know if Karen had any comments before I asked my question, because I know she hasn't spoken. And I don't want to usurp her time. I appreciate that. I think every question I have has been raised by somebody else already. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So um, I just want to try to understand. I'm, I'm going to explain what I think I understand, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, and I know this is going to be much more simplistic than what you've explained. It, it sounds to me like it's kind of like a scale. I mean, it, we, what we want is a much, we want heavier, one and a half times if we can. Um, on the resistance to movement than on the other side of the scale, which is the forces that cause movement. So we want to have at least one and a half times 
non-movement to movement forces. Um, but we, now the, the part that, does, that, that causes me confusion is people keep saying, if there is movement, that means it's a force, um, a resistance of one. I would think that if there is movement, it means that there's actually more weight, more force, more causing movement than there is resisting. So it would actually be below one, not one. You also said though that there's there can be movement when it's 1.2 or less. And I guess my brain doesn't, that doesn't compute. I don't understand how if you've got 1.2 resistance to one force causing movement, you would have the movement. That's, that's one thing. Now I wanna combine that with this. I, I think I understand there's both a um, semi-permanent assessment of the resistance as well as it's transient. So it can change from time to time, but there's also a, a number that kind of represents what it is in general. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I'd like you to, to explain that after I'm finished saying this. But the, and the, the way the code is written is we want the force to be in general 1.5 in general, because there's gonna be times when transiently that comes down as well as times when it goes up. And overall, because it continues to change from time to time based on an earthquake occurring or too much or a rainstorm or what have you, which lowers the resistance, we want 1.5 so that when those other forces occur that reduce it, we're not gonna go down below one, we're gonna only slip down to maybe 1.4, 1.3 or 1.2 and still be stable. Am I misstating this as a general matter or or is that essentially cap capture what you've been explaining? Okay, well, I'm gonna do my best because that was a compound question with multiple compound assumptions. Um, but generally speaking, on your last part, you're correct. What Bing Yen, the study said is, and, and this is a generalization, they assumed that at the time in 92, for those groundwater conditions and based on groundwater consumption of around 132,000 gallons per day, right? Because you have different inputs. You've got the septic influent and the rainfall. Generally speaking, when he analyzed it, there was a whole bunch of factors of safety for each individual section and for each individual region and when he added them all together and averaged it grossly, the factor of safety was 1.2 to 1.25. Grossly for the whole, but that's a gross oversimplification, okay? You are correct in when he said, and you said it the same way, you want to bank factor of safety. So you want to do what you can to increase the factor of safety, the margin, and improve the situation because there will be times when you're going to have groundwater pulses that come through that you may not be able to control or may be higher, right? These intense storms. So, so you're correct there. The thing that was a summary that I cannot explain either um, because I didn't write the report. I was trying to summarize and accurately provide a summary of the report to you as the best piece of information we had. Um, I cannot explain. I think when he said sometimes creep cannon does occur when the factor of safety drops below 1.2, I think he's talking about the gross generalization 1.2 and not anything local or region specific. The local or region specific would actually have to be below one. Right. Well, it would be at one or below one because you, you can have some movement. I mean, factor of safety plus or minus 0. 0.05. So you're 0. 0.95 to 1.05. Okay. So, so coming back then to what I think I did, I think we agreed I stated it correctly. If you want a generalized 1.5, that's the, the code, in order to protect against the transient situations where you drop to 1.2 or below. If we have a generalized 1.2, aren't we now in a situation where any transient changes are gonna be very dangerous because we've lost our safety net? Well, I don't think the 1.5 is, is, is something that, I mean, that's the general accepted practice is, is 1.5. 
for long-term stability. And in fact, when you do short-term seismic stability, the factor of safety that you're aiming for is not 1.1. Actually, the way it gets done now is at the yield acceleration, in other words, the acceleration, the earthquake movement at which your factor of safety drops to 1.0, it's that acceleration, then you do a displacement analysis to see, okay, so given that it's gonna move, how much does it move? If it moves over a certain threshold, it's not, it's not uh, allowed under certain jurisdictions and it, and it all depends on how much it moves. Um, hey, guys, I'm gonna ask us to yeah. move forward because uh, now we're into a sort of a science lesson, which is fascinating, but um, it, it's late and we can find all this off. Uh, we can have these discussions offline, I think. I think it's uh, time that we move forward. So I, uh, I called for a vote. I, I don't know if I got a second on receiving. Second it. Okay. I had a second. It. Oh, okay, I'm I'll sorry. Thank it. you. Yeah, you did. Um, so, and I really appreciate everyone's input and, but I'd like to ask for roll call on the vote, please. Mayor Pearson. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, we've got three items. I'm hoping we can get through them quick and actually finish this meeting. Um, we have 7A. Voting delegate and alternate for the SCAG Annual General Assembly. Um, I don't know if we have a report on that. Um, That's Mayor, obvious. I don't have a whole lot to add other than yeah. what's in the staff report. Uh, we're looking to get a, an appointee uh, to the SCAG General Assembly for their May uh, meeting, and it would be a voting delegate um, at the discretion of the council. So that's what we're looking for. Okay, do we have any public speakers on this item? You don't have any speakers on this item. Okay, didn't think so. Um, okay, um, do we have a, we don't have a SCAG representative now? At this time, um, the SCAG representative is appointed by the COG board uh, and currently it's a member from the city of Calabasas. Um, oh, but right. the way the uh, general assembly voting works is each city gets a representative. Okay. Um, Okay, do we have any nominations for our SCAG representative and the alternative, Bruce? Yeah, well, since this has relationship to the COG, if Karen would want to serve, I would I would nominate her. I'll second that. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. Okay. Uh, Although I, I wondered if our mayor pro tem might be a more suitable candidate. Well, how about you have so much more knowledge about COG that I think it probably is uh, would be silly to not have you or n not have you do it. I would be happy to. Do it. Okay. Do we want to nominate an alter alternate? It says delegate and alternate representative. Is that one person or are those two people? I think that's two. I think it's two. two. Make Paul the alternate. I'll make, I'll vote, I'll nominate Paul as the alternate. Okay, I'll second it. Um, all right, we have- Peter, uh, Pearson, were those intended to be separate motions? You wanna vote on separately? Can we put them all into one snazzy little motion like that or not? If council member Silverstein will make the motion to also appoint Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti as the alternate. I move to appoint um, Karen as the primary and Paul as the secondary. Okay, so uh, we now have a motion and a second, right? The second was from Council Member Yuri. Yeah, okay. I'm in. Okay, roll call, please. Council Member Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Yuri? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, Ooh. thank you, everyone. Item 7B Young Actors Project Grant Request. That's uh, from Council Member. Karen, um, do you wish to uh, take us through this item? Uh, yes, I think we have a public speaker. Oh, we do. I apologize. Um, do we have? Yes. A, okay. Uh, you had two speakers signed up. They are Shoshana <laughs> Kuttner and Nicole McGinley. Nicole McGinley let us know that she would not be at the meeting this late, um, that she is in favor <laughs> of the recommended action. 
Okay. So we'll hear from Shoshana. Okay, great. Hi, Shoshana. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you to everyone at the city for adding this item to tonight's agenda. Young Actors Project is requesting a grant of $4,000 from the General Grant Fund Reserves to help us meet an immediate relocation need. We are currently looking for a new home and we need financial support during this pandemic. Young Actors Project provides four days a week of after school programs and seven weeks a year of summer camps in Malibu. And we've been offering programs for local youth and teens since 2005. We are generational. Children grow up in our programs and then receive vocational training and jobs within the organization, working to provide opportunities for other children to grow. It's the cycle of service and the thread of our community life. Our recent playwright and producing stage manager, Madeline Jacobus, has been involved in the program for 13 years, since she was 10 years old. Each year we work with over 150 families and employ 10 part-time local teens to assist with our productions. And our performances are a cultural benefit to the community. Just ask anyone who has been to a YAP show. An audience member who attended YAP's most recent performance remarked, those shows brought people of all ages together. I saw all these people from different walks of life connecting and you can feel the community there. YAP was instrumental in fire recovery efforts for families and provided drama therapy for children who lost their homes. Our community pulled together to put on a production that was halted by Woolsey and we met in a yurt until we could put on our shows for which we were proudly awarded first responder pins in honor of our service by the city council. And we will be instrumental again in our recovery efforts from this pandemic. Children will need YAP to be there for them when they are on the other side of this and to help them process all the changes they experienced during the last year, many in isolation. We are actively looking for a local place to resume our productions of Peter Pan and Little Women with the 55 participating families that were enrolled when we had to close on March 11th, 2020. I heard from many of those families today. One mom said, you have a lot of very eager and excited little actors awaiting the day they get to step foot on stage again and resume Peter Pan. We need help in finding our new home in Malibu. And for the immediate future, we need the financial support we requested so we can store our production materials until we can safely open up again. We are a strong organization built by local families and known in the community for the past 16 years for our enduring commitment to include every single child who wants to participate, regardless of their level of ability and economic circumstances. Thank you dearly for your consideration of our request. Love, Children's Theater. <laughs> that was great. Um, yes, Bruce. Yeah. So, um... Thank you for that, that presentation. That was actually wonderful. Um, you know, I get a lot of criticism for things I do on social media, but I did create a poll on multiple social media sites where there are many Malibu residents, and um, I think about 150 people were in favor of this, which for so which is which is a lot when it comes to asking a question like that on social media. So, and that confirms what I expected to be the case. So I, I strongly support this. I hope that we're able to do something to help find a location for not just the stuff, but to actually have this program begin again, because it sounds like it's going to be a major void if that doesn't happen. That's true. I don't, I don't know the answer, but I do know that when the college is done, they did offer some space potentially for performance. Um, and uh, so maybe that's something for the future to look at. I don't know. Um, so uh, I think, yes, Karen. Um, I just want to thank Shoshana and, and just reiterate what a vibrant community center she has provided for so many years. And actually, uh, none of my kids ever did a Young Actors Project production. Oh, I take that back. One of my kids might have done a summer show, um, but not a regular one. But I've gone to many of their shows. Uh, I think for those of us who have kids, we, we've enjoyed what Shoshana has provided, not only knowing the kids in the shows, but seeing what she's done for the community, like she said, employing people. And this one to me is a no brainer and it's exactly what the general fund grant uh, is designed for community programs like this. And these were extraordinary circumstances. Uh, they did not expect to have to move. 
that request came quickly from their landlord and I'm very happy to uh, help them uh, relocate, uh, move their inventory and store it and hopefully not for too long. So I would like to make a motion to, uh, to uh, request their, their uh, amount of $4,000 and just also make note that this is from the, um, the previous year's uh, general fund grant. It's not for the one that uh, just opened up. It's just to, to be clear, it's for the current fiscal year general fund right. grant program. And the council did leave some funds available there in case any grants came up. So that's, a, it's not going to need any new appropriation. It's funding we have in the budget. I think there was 6,000 left. That, um, yeah, and the, the amount in question here is 4,000. Correct. So I will make second that motion. It. Okay, thank you. I second it. Roll call please on this excellent item. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Yearing? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, great. The uh, last item of, to, of the next day. Oh, it's because it is the next day. Um, 7C, Farmer's Market Parking. Um, Steve, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, the, the Farmer's Market has really become a a huge benefit to the city. Uh, and they've been struggling recently with the construction that's going on, uh, with some of the car shows that have been taking place. Uh, and they need some additional parking because as a result of not having the parking spaces available, uh, some of their, their, their customers who typically show up have not been showing up. So they've been working on this for a long time. They submitted the paperwork to the city. The city is looking for a a fee of, I think it was $4,000. It could have been 3,800. I can't remember what the exact number was, but let's say it's four. Uh, and I'd like to get that fee waived so they can move forward get the paperwork filled up, uh, finished and start using the chili cook-off as a parking space for their, their customers on Sundays. That's it. 3,480. Let's do that. That's a good number. A bargain at twice the price, right? Right. So I'll make um, a motion to move it. Second. I will, okay. I will call for roll call. That's what I'll do. Oh, Bruce has I have a, a comment. question. I yes. just want to just clear, understand this. We're, this is just an approval of waiving the fee. We're not approving the grant with the permit. That still has to be resolved by the city. Is that accurate? Yeah, the city still is going through the paperwork. Correct. And is, is it going to be limited to until the college is built, or is this going to be some indefinite um, authorization? I don't have their application in front of me, but it's my understanding that it's temporary parking um, until the college construction project is done. Okay, I just have one more, I don't want to prolong this, but I have one more question, because I had I recall in connection with some other project that there's a legal limit on how many times we can allow a temporary use for a particular property. I, I hope I'm mistaken about that, but I, I thought there was some kind of limit on the number of days a year that this could be done or the number of times it could be done. Am I wrong in recalling that? You're correct that there is a limited number of um, permits that can be issued on a commercial property for a temporary use permit, but they're actually not applying for a temporary use permit. They're applying for a conditional use permit, which has different rules. So. Okay. And that's permissible? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Roll call, please. Before that, I did just want to state there was a speaker signed up oh, for this item, Deborah Bianca, but she she's no longer in the meeting, so okay. there's no Thank, one present to speak. Thank you. I keep leaving out the speakers. I apologize. And for the roll call vote, Councilmember Yurin? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Motion to adjourn. Okay, motion to adjourn in a moment of silence and recognition of uh, the lives yeah. and the related lives that have been impacted, lives lost and lives impacted from COVID at 12.09 a.m. on February 25th, 2021. If that was a motion to adjourn for someone other than the mayor, we do need to do a roll call vote. Okay, let's do roll call. 
Council Member Yearing? Yes. Council Member Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow at five. Yes. That's Mayor today. At five. Today. Not, today uh, at five. Yes. Motion carries. You're Thank adjourned. you to everyone. Thank you to the staff. Okay. Good night, everyone. Okay.